and welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I'm using a makeshift tripod that doesn't have the right uh, top for my camera, so I'm like doing a bunch of makeshift <laughs> stuff over here, and I only have a small cord that can only go to my tower, so I have to do it on this side. And I have a, my microphones aren't here because why? Well, my luggage that had all that equipment in it is still following me from Egypt. So I'm doing what I'm making do with what I got. And so the quality won't be as good, but, you know, it's doable. And I got Dr. Aaron Adair here. And uh, what's going on? Uh, not too much going on here. The good stuff here, of course. Uh, um, my sleep schedule is slightly disturbed by having to get up early to see the lunar eclipse this morning. But beyond that, everything's fine. Yeah, I'm just coming off of a, an illness that I caught on the flight back three days ago. It was pretty bad for three days, and now I'm starting to feel better. So if I look a little sweaty, that's because I'm still coming off of it and drinking lots of fluids. But I feel good enough to uh, to do this, so we're good to go. But um, All right. So the lesson is, everyone to the audience, always stay indoors. Never go out with other people. Just sit there and just watch YouTube videos indefinitely. In, yeah, just wear your mask all day inside your house. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, planes are pretty risky, though. They really are. I took the risk. You know, I'm alive, so... What are you going to do? But uh, yeah, let's. The topic at hand is this recent video I did about mythicism, Richard Carrier. And um, I just felt like I wanted to do a, a video about it because, you know, I used to be a mythicist. I still think mythicism is, is a fine position to have. I, it's, it's not the consensus, but I, I have a lot of positions that I hold that are not consensus, and I hold to them. But I also say, oh, this is not the consensus. And I also try to understand why the consensus thinks what the consensus thinks. I don't then go out of my way and say, oh, they're just a bunch of idiots. I'm right. I'm the big brain smart guy here. Anyways, uh, getting a little, getting a little ahead of myself because, you know, I noticed that some people, you know, Dr. Carey, for example, he, he, he just doesn't play, play nice. Like he, he attacks people who disagrees with him, who don't, who aren't, who don't like mythicism, for example, like uh, Litwa, and you know, attacks their credentials, says that they're they're secret believers, they're theists, and they're they're liars, and they shouldn't have PhDs. And so, you know, I've been learning about mythicism for a long time now, for good a good two years now, like really learning the like why they think why why this mainstream consensus is that there's a god. I've been really like digging into this because I want I used like I said I used to be a mythicist, so I know why. Like I I I know that this I know the answer to these things. I know what this what the what the data says and what's the likely likelihood of certain things. I'm not saying all of it is guaranteed to be right, but I just know like I get why people say what they say. So I felt like doing a video and just going over the certain things that I think mythicists say that are just ridiculous like the jesus and philo thing i think it's ridiculous it's the first thing i talked about you know stuff like jesus ben damnius is really the guy that is, that was the brother of james everyone just missed that except for mythicist a and mythicist b but everyone else just doesn't know they're just they just forgot or something stuff like that and so you know there's a lot that we could talk about but yeah where do you want to start well, I think we should probably start at maybe um, a high airplane level and then kind of zero in on the stuff that was related to the video and also why you made the video in the first place. Um, and I've also um, did a blog post as well, trying to summarize what has been happening for the last couple of weeks with things. Um, but first high level, I think everyone in this audience knows about mythicism. Uh, and I think everyone knows also that it is considered definitely a minority view, if not a straight up fringe view within biblical studies. Can you right. find people that say it's at least plausible, worth looking into? Yes. But yeah, you're going to find at least nine out of 10 biblical scholars say, of course, there was a dude. And if you ask why there is, well, yeah, there is lots of prima facie evidence that you can point to that would say plenty reasonable because saying there was a dude is not an extraordinary claim. So when somebody says, hey, there's these four gospels, there's these letters by Paul, there's this mention in Josephus, there's this mention in Tacitus. And you're like, okay, that's a lot of mentions for just a random dude. Um, obviously a dude that becomes important, but it doesn't seem like that should be extraordinary. So if someone said, all right, definitely was a dude, that seems totally reasonable. Of course, once you dive into all the evidence and all the nuances, then you find out all the little problems. So like, yeah, there are four gospels, 
but they're all basically kind of riffing off each other. So instead of there being four sources, you start with one, and then you see how everyone is changing that for their own theological purposes. And like, okay, this isn't so clear anymore. The Josephus stuff, it's like, well, there's been arguments about that for centuries, how legit it is or not. That obviously complicates things. What is Tacitus talking about? What's his source? Is he just um, copying what Christians are saying? And so all he's doing is repeating the Gospels, and so it's not another source. Again, all these little details, and that you can imagine it would take years to learn all this stuff, to debate all this stuff, to ultimately move the needle to, eh? <laughs> all this arguing, all yeah. this hot air is ultimately to come to a conclusion that's just basically more than less one way or the other. It's not so fantastically strong one way or the other. And that's really maybe why there's so much heat, because if it's so, the needle is so close to 50-50, everyone's going to try as hard as they can to move it just slightly in their direction. Yeah, I guess I'm irrationally emotional over a random response video. A random response video, a two-hour video about just attacking someone's credentials over their opinion on the Isaiah, Isaiah ascension. To me, the person who's emotionally, you know, attached to something, like what 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 idea am I emotionally attached to? Historicism? Is that an idea that someone can actually be emotionally attached to? I don't give a shit about Christianity. I'm not fighting for Christianity. All I care about is truth. And when I see people bending the evidence and like ignoring facts and twisting logics and doing all this crazy shit and then, and then saying there's a big conspiracy against me, against my position, because, and it's funny because think about this for a second, Caitlin, think about this. Both Christians, fundamentalist Christians and mythicists both say that academia is corrupt. Why, why is that? You ever thought about that? Only mythicists and, and fundamentalist Christians say that academia is corrupt. How can that be? How can it be that only both those opposing viewpoints think the same thing about academia? Doesn't make sense. Only it makes sense because they both have positions that are fringe and that are not accepted. And so they get mad about it. So who's the one who's actually emotional? irrationally emotional about something might want to look into that i would note though that i think you are definitely feeling angry because of how you felt uh carrier responded to litwick because it seems like Absolutely. you and litwick are pretty close so because, i could see well, why lit, those lit was a real scholar lit was a real scholar lit was not just some guy with a blog who charges 150 dollars for 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 uh for you to come on a show lit was actually writing books and translating text and teaching and doing all sorts of stuff adding to the canon of scholarship he's not just writing conspiracy theory books like the reason why people uh, the reason why people criticize on the historicity of jesus so much for its so-called peer review is because in that book like a peer review for example if i have an idea and i want to argue an idea an idea based off evidence that's already established. I can get a peer reviewed book. Here's the evidence that's already established. Here's what I'm arguing based off that evidence. Boom, boom, boom. Here's my, here, th this is my case. But in this book, he has like 20 different things that are not there. Like the Jesus Ben Damnius thing is not there. That alone should have its own peer review, but it doesn't. Well, the, the Philo on. Angel thing. I think we want to pause for a moment though there. That is something that Carrier did actually get published in an academic journal, his argument about, uh, you know, you're specifically talking about the James character in Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews, book 20, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, um, Carrier did actually write an article and get that published in, I forget which journal, but he did publish that in a peer-reviewed journal, and then he cites that in on Historicity. So Jesus Ben Damnius is the, is the Jesus that was called Christ, the brother of James. The um, brother, the part about him being called the Christ, that is yeah. uh, Carrie's argument that that was a um, basically a marginal note that was then added into the regular text, which is something that frequently happens in people writing marginal notes and people accidentally copying those marginal notes into the main text. That's Carrie's argument. And like I said, he did get that published in a peer reviewed journal. So that actually has when, gone uh, through that process. Okay. So. I, I, I want to see that, first of all, but I was just throwing up examples of shit that I, you know, that in this book that people just look at and just don't come away with. Like Paul, like, um, like Paul's ambiguous 
it's so strange that Paul uses this language. No one says that. Like no, nobody's actually arguing that. Where is he getting that from? Well, you know what which I mean? example are you referring to? Okay, uh, cor- uh, bor- bor- born according to the flesh. Mm-hmm. Where, where is he? Where is this? This is so strange. No one would ever say that. When you have examples in the first century in Hebrew all over Israel of people using that exact same language for human births only, nothing else. Um, I think that's not what Kieran's who, argument wait, wait, wait. is. Who, more... who did I time? Who did I time out? I didn't time. I haven't even touched. I haven't even touched this, bro. What are you talking about? So you already, we already got conspiracy theories thrown around in the chat. No one timed anybody out, unless unless one of my uh, whatever you call it, one, one of my people, whoever I I don't know. I, I I didn't time anybody out. I don't give a shit what you say here. Say whatever you want. But um, I'm just all I'm like, This is all I'm saying. Carrier Carrier's book is taking the, he, it's a, it's a, it's not using the likely it's not using the data for what the data says it's twisting things it's making an argument saying this really means this that really means this oh this right here it's really this and then when you put it all together then it all make oh look it all makes sense now if one of those things falls off the whole thing falls off cuz what look think about it Paul, what, if Paul's talking about a human birth, then what do we have? What else? What else is left? It's over. It's 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 case closed for mythicism. Now you're just left with the conspiracy theory that the, that the people before Paul made it up. All it takes is one thing to fall, and the whole thing falls. Well, let's just uh, to note, I guess, how strong this evidence is, one way or the other. So, one of the things that Carrier does do in his book, um, in fact. This might be a little bit beside all the other stuff that was discussed, but just very quickly to note, when Carrier does actually try to assess the evidence and he's using his numerical methods to say how strong the evidence is one way or the other, in the case where he's actually trying to argue against mythicism as much as he thinks is allowed, he actually takes the letters of Paul and says it slightly favors historicity. Yeah. So when he takes that, though, and he still applies it to everything else, he's still saying it adds up to about a one in three chance that Jesus was historically real. So he actually says, best case scenario. I just, think that, I just gotta stop. I, I just think it's funny how the church is here today, ready to ready to go. Like they're they're ready. Like they're. It's so it's funny because there's people who were like trying to, trying to like talk to people who I associate with, about me. Not not just people on the chat mm-hmm. right now, but like you know people like uh, like um. Harmonic atheist, who's like jumping around, and people are people are sending me screenshots of harmonic atheists telling people, Neil's Neil's uh, he's 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 having a mental breakdown. You should block him. You should block him. Like th- there's people who are going out of their way trying to like get people to not talk to me anymore because they're angry about a video I made. When you make videos about other people all day long about ideas that you disagree with. Like, if you're going to be in the marketplace of ideas that you disagree with, just be okay with other people not disagreeing with you and dishing the shit back to you. That's all I'm saying. Like, if we're going to have arguments and debates, let's do it. Let's not get, like, you know, let's not get, like, crazy about it. Like, I, did, did I do anything to, to try to hinder your success ever? No. That's all I'm saying. Do you want to read the Super Chat? Do you want to finish your thought? Uh. I basically already have said my thought other than that Carrier already considering in the best case scenario for historicity, Paul favors historicity. So it seems like he's already taken into account what he thinks is the most likely case. He believes how much he thinks that evidence can still favor opposing him and still say overall um, he thinks the better case is for um, mythicism. So it is worth noting that when he talks about these lines of evidence. He does try just saying not just what he thinks, but also what he thinks is the most you could stretch it in one direction or the other. Basically to give the error bars on his estimates. I'm, and I'm fine with that. I'm, I wish he would bring that up more because it, it seems like more often than not, he wants to act like Paul is just talking about a celestial events. Now, we're, that, if you want to argue that, fine. Like, if that's what you think, I'm not saying that's not the case. Like, it's not impossible that could be the case. But at least, at least, like, at least do what I do when I say, when I say things that aren't backed up by the consensus. I do this all the time. 
this is what I think. It's not the consent. This is what the consensus says, and this is why they think it, which is, is they have their reasons for it. But this is what I think. But you don't well, get that. Inst- instead, you hear. But he wrote an everyone... entire book to do just that, though. Yeah, but that's but but, but with Carrier in particular, there's a big there's a big conspiracy against him that they won't let him. They don't want to read his book. They don't want you to deal with his material. They won't even read my book. He says. Well, while he'll say the same thing about other people, I want I, I already know what's in your book, so I'm not going to read it. But he said it, Charlesworth, I think. So it's like you know, double standard there. But he wants everyone to read his book and like have a re- ready ready to go uh, interpretation of what he thinks, but doesn't want to like you know doesn't want to like do the same thing for other people. Um. So in the particular example you mentioned with Charlesworth, because I remember watching that debate. Uh, The thing was that Charlesworth's scholarship on this, and it was related to the Josephus, uh, Tacitus, uh, the the testimony of Flavianum stuff. What Charlesworth wrote was back in the 80s, and Kerry was saying, I'm relying on the stuff that's been published in the last 20 years, the more recent stuff that's outgrown since Charlesworth wrote. So the fact that that Kerry is going to the most recent scholarship. Let's talk about that, because in your article, you you talk about Litwahead. had it so wrong about, uh, you talked about uh, Norelli. Yeah. So now just I the, looked. I looked. I looked at this myself, and I th- I saw the exact opposite. So did, I wanna, you the Norelli, co- did you get the Norelli? Did you get the? Did you get Norelli's book? No, no, no. What I was looking at was the, the, um, the what what Lit, what Lit was saying, and compared to what he was saying. Well, take me through. Take me through, because I obviously I can't go through the whole book. So I yeah. You could very well could have something I don't know. Take me through this. All right. Um, so first off, let's just back up for the audience because we say Norelli and everyone in the chat should be going, what are you talking about? What's a Norelli? Can I buy that for a dollar? <laughs> All right. So yeah. what we are talking about is uh, one of the important texts for looking for any evidence or any um, uh, conceptualization of a cosmic Christ figure. And the text is called The Ascension of Isaiah. It has a really long, weird textual history. Um we don't have um, it in its like original Greek form for everything, so we have it in a lot of translations, a lot of really weird textual traditions. Uh, some of the most complete forms are in Ethiopic, for example. And part of the text would seem to suggest that Jesus is some sort of pre-existent being who lives in the higher heavens and who descends through the heavens to comes down to the firmament to be killed by Satan in the sky and then be resurrected up there. That's at least the claim that Kara is trying to make, that this is like what's there in the original version of the story. But there's also been a lot of material that has been added to or changed to the Ascension of Isaiah. And so there's all the question of, well, what's the original form? And does that look anything like what um, Carrier's thesis of a cosmic Christ um, instead of a historical Christ is going on? So that's the basic background. Now, Carrier, um, in uh, his book, uh, tries basically saying the basic outline that we see in the text is this sort of cosmic creature that lives In the seventh heaven, the heavens are layered. So he's basically living among the stars. He then goes through all the heavenly levels that correspond to like all the planetary levels until he finally comes to the firmament where he's in human form. And while in that human form, he's supposed to be then uh, basically grabbed by the demons, those controlled by Satan, or I think it's um, Samael is the name of the head of the demons in the Ascension of Isaiah. And that he's supposed to be killed, so that way then he can be resurrected, rise up in glory, and basically have defeated death and uh, bring on, you know, the next messianic age. Now, if you were to read The Ascension of Isaiah, if you were to go on, like, say, um, earlychristianwriting.com uh, or things like that, you would actually see there's also this other additional information um, that would also suggest that, G- that Jesus did have a sojourn on earth. And the passages that matter the most are... In the first part of the Ascension of Isaiah, in the first five chapters, which is usually also called the martyrdom, and then in chapter 11, there is this very quick um, gospel story. Basically, everything from the birth of Jesus to him getting himself, you know, you know, kicked around to finally, of course, you know, showing up in the sky again and rising through the heavenly layers. So, we see that Carrier argues, um, based on a number of different arguments, that these things about Jesus on earth were actually later additions. The earlier version of the Ascension didn't have that, and all it had was the much more um, cosmic goings and comings of Jesus, never on earth. That's the argument. Okay. Now, and, and uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Now, what was Lit was saying that was going against this? 
Okay, so the main things were this, was Lit was pointing to, well, if you read um, in particular in chapter 11, that pocket gospel, it clearly says Jesus is born of Mary um, and doing stuff on earth. Yeah, it's absolutely clear in the pocket gospel, Jesus is a guy on earth. Um, it will still yeah. be saying that he came from um, the higher heavens, but nonetheless, he did stuff in a historical setting. So um, Litwick points to that. And uh, he also points to, I think it's in chapter three of the Ascension of Isaiah, um, something that also seems to recall the same sort of basic story. And so Lit was like, well, case closed is saying right there. And then Lit went from there saying, um, so the mythicists have to argue that these are just ad hoc um, interpolations. There's no reason to think that. There's no scholarship to back that up. And in particular, Litwa then cites a book by um, Enrico Norelli, who um, was basically one of the lead people in uh, the projects of going through all the extant manuscripts of the Ascension Isaiah, um, produce um, that in a volume, and then have a commentary on all those different textual traditions to make some best guesses of what was the history of these transmissions, what texts relate to each other, what might the original form have looked like. And Litwa then argues that Norelli says that the text is actually um, holistic. It doesn't have like a bazillion um, interpolations, the pocket gospel isn't interpolated and so on. And also then note, because if you flip to uh, Carrier's book, and as you can see, it has at least a few pages in it. If you were to jump into the bibliography of On the History of Jesus and you were looking for Norelli, it doesn't show up. It has, it has Norelli's book though, right? Now, that's one of the details. So, but, but like I say, I'm just trying to like say, here's what Litwa was saying at first and what you could easily do and say, hey, um, uh, Litwa basically claims Carrier hasn't even read Norelli, hasn't dealt with the okay. arguments of him. And so we should be then going against Carrier. He's not even engaging the arguments from the best scholars out there. And that would be a legitimate thing. It's like, hey, here's someone taking a fringe position. They don't even touch the best arguments out there. And then Car it. Okay, so then Carrier says, but I but I actually have his book in there, which yes. I think is true. Okay. Yes. And then, so, okay, why is this a big deal then? Okay, so first off, when Litwa tries citing the first chapters of the Ascension of Isaiah against Carrier, he is acting like, Everyone agrees that this was not an add-on. This wasn't a later edition. But Norelli himself says this is a later edition to the Ascension of Isaiah. The first five chapters were not composed by the same person who did chapters 6 through 11. And he says that in black and white, in Italian, but in black and white. So on my blog, I actually reproduced one of the texts, uh, the lines of text in Italian, and I give a machine translation of that because, um, well, I'm no Italian expert, so I'm just relying on... Uh, what I can check with Google Translator just with dictionaries. Can you share it, that or no? Do you not have that on you to share? I just want to share. Oh, I can share, yeah. Okay. Do you want me to share the actual text or my quote from it? Uh, sh let's, if you could share whatever you got on the blog, or, don't you have the blog or no? Yeah, yeah, I got the blog open. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Do, 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 do. Present screen. That's a screen. All right. All right. So. All right. Uh, here, this is from page 46 of volume 8 of uh, uh, Corpus Christianum. This is the um, series that does this. Okay, but but, I, yeah. but I'm pretty sure Litwa was saying that this was done in three parts. He might not have said it in that video. No, he said, I... you know, he cited chapter 3 to argue why chapter 11 pocket gospel was original. And also proof that the text is about that. He's saying that there wasn't any interpolations and that's just arbitrary to say so. And here's okay, the thing though, if the original and if the original text is just six through eleven and nothing that happened in chapter one and five was part of what the original author said, you can't use what was later editions to say what the first author said. That would be like using John to interpret Mark. I don't think he says that though. No, it's exactly what he says. Are you sure? I don't think he Yeah, says that's uh that's uh, I, I wouldn't be making this big of a deal about it uh, unless that's what he said and why he cited oh, why? chapter three. But, but here's the thing at the end of the day, because no one knows, we're, it's all, we're all guessing on which. I, this isn't a matter of I guessing. Think, this is the fact that. No, no, I think. was said I, I, something I think it's that clear. wasn't. I think it's pretty clear. The pocket gospel is added on later. I think it's pretty clear. Well, no, that's exactly think, what Lickwell argues against. He says that that was part of the original as well as chapters one through five. But I don't. I think he's talking about the Christian edition all at one time. 
There's a Christian edition, there's a Jewish edition in the beginning. This was a Jewish text at first, and then it became a Christian text. I think that's what he's saying. No, Which not he, that at all. Well, that's what I, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. I'll, I'll get it. I'll hear what I got. It's also hear the same says. in his book where he cites uh, three pages of the Norelli volume against Carrier. Um, against now, the let me ask you vessel. this. Let me ask you this. If you've heard Litwa say, that's what exactly what he said, what he meant by that was by saying that he thinks that there was a second century, first century BCE version of this thing before Christianity and then a later Christian version. That's not what Litwa says and that's not what Carrier says. No one's been saying that. But that's what that's what some people are saying. Well, we're not talking I about mean, some people. We're talking that, about Litwa and Carrier. No, but we're, this but, is this is what Litwa Lit was actually referring to this book right here. I'm that's aware. what it says in here. That's what it says in here. It doesn't say it's it second said, century BC. Yes, it does. I'll show you. I'll show you. Look. Martyrdom and Ascension of Isaiah. Look. Second um, century BC. Wait, I can't read AD. that very well. Uh could you point because I'm having a hard time reading it with the camera on the top of the screen. Second century BC to first to fourth century AD. Well, that's actually got to be a typo because everyone thinks it's it's not between the. Se- it's not. People think there's a there's an earlier version of this that's not Christian at all, just completely Jewish. Well, I'll put this much. That's not what Norelli says. Well, that's what I'm saying. You're taking Norelli as like he's like the only guy who wrote on this. Well, that's this, who there's Lit a lot was of... cited. That's the only no, no, Lit, source. Lit was cites, Lit, no, Litwa cites this in the video. He cites this exact same book. He cites, he cites it to read book. the text. But if you go to, now, in particular, when I wanted to do my citations, what I also went to was Litwa's book, um, How the Gospels Create History. And the only text on the Ascension of Isaiah that he cites relevant to this is the Norelli volume. Right. See, but that, but if Litwood knew that his words were going to be so critiqued like this, I, I think he would have been a little more careful. I think he was just speaking freely well, because he wrote, he was talking about this text right here, what the scholarship says in this text. Well, this, then which then is that's not the same bigger, as Norelli. But, but here's the thing. He directly cited Norelli to defend himself. He cited and said everyone should learn Italian so they can read this text because it's so important. Yeah, no, I, I, like I said, I, I, don't, I haven't read the entire text of Norelli. I don't know right. all, all of what it and, says. And also, but, but, it's worth noting but, that if what you, you actually just showed me, from what you just showed me, I think Norelli is even saying that this, this two or three stages done here. Yeah. And the oldest so stage I, I mean, is related to, or the oldest part is what's called the actual ascension. So one of the other reasons we actually can say reasonably confidently that there is multiple stages to this document is that there are manuscripts of the Ascension of Isaiah that's completely missing the first five chapters. It starts right at chapter six. Right, yeah. And I'm not going to sit here and say I and know you, all that information. Yeah, um, and also if you read the text, like if you read chapter one, it has an introduction, then you go to chapter six, it like has an introduction again. A book that introduces itself twice looks like something spliced together. <laughs> yeah, it looks, it, you can see, you can, te- you can definitely tell, which is like, yeah. to me, I honestly think the Christian edition was way later. It's not mentioned by anybody for a, like third. What is it? The third century. Someone talks about it as a Christian text. I'm not even. I can't that, remember. Like, and I'm pre, like, don't quote me on that. Like, I don't like I might be wrong, obviously, but I'm I'm pretty confident that this text is not mentioned by any Christians for a long time. Like, it's not used. It's not used by the early Christian church fathers for sure. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure. I could be wrong, though. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm uh, open. If I'm wrong about that, if I'm wrong about that, yeah. then sure, let's yeah. talk about it. Yeah, I, I don't know, and uh, it's largely immaterial for this discussion anyways. The key thing is that well, is I, this. Yeah. Oh. Um, and, and like I say, also one of the reasons it's usually said to be 2nd century or maybe 1st century AD is that in the um, in chapter, I can't remember 6 or 7, but there's basically still the myth of the return of Nero. It's still like um, hiding there in the text, which already kind of indicates this must be post Second Temple sort of story going on. Yeah. Now, now I have to admit that is the first time I've seen anything say that part of the text might go to the second century BC. Well, that, that's the first time I've ex- seen that. That explains why you think Lit was so, such a lie. Like, no, no, no. Because here's the thing. No, this is that's actually irrelevant. Because what Lit was he said does mention is, this book though. He does mention sh- this. But here's the thing. He might have mentioned the book, but guess what he said? He said there weren't these interpolations to the text. He denies it. Right. But I think 
I, I'm not not Litwa, but it, it makes sense from from how I know Litwa that he's talking about the Christian version of this thing. Once the Christian version of this thing was penned in, that's the Christian version of this. There might be one well, more. Well, here's the thing, though. That. In that talk in particular, what we're talking about is the video that Litwa did on um, History Valley with Jacob Berman. Uh, subscribe to that channel if you haven't already. Come on, we gotta share the love in this uh, YouTube system. Uh, in that video, he says that basically, now some scholars will not like what this says and then deny then say it's an interpolation. So Litwa tries arguing that it's only basically bad scholars and he's basically talking about mythicists saying that this is an interpolation. Yeah. And the thing is, so, if, I don't know. I'll if, Litwa, if, if Litwa had actually read the three pages of Norelli that he actually cited in his book, he would have seen that that's not true because in the Norelli volume, he is basically trying to argue that the pocket gospel is original to the text, not in a later edition. And the person he's arguing with to make this case is R.H. Charles, who is writing about the ascension of Isaiah and the manuscripts traditions as he knew it in the year 1900. And R.H. Charles is not Litwa, a mythicist. I'm going to have Litwa back on to, to go over all this and to clear it all up. Because... Well, I mind you, though, in my blog I think post, that's the, we I, can go back and forth on what Litwa meant or what he got wrong. It doesn't what matter what wrong. he meant. It's what he said. Well, that, that, okay, that, that's the thing. And, the, that, and so if we're going to take people by what they say and, like, misleading people, Carrier is the one who should be under the hot seat here because he's the guy who goes wait, around. Wait, 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 wait. We don't get to say somebody did a bad thing, therefore we can ignore someone else doing a bad thing. No, no, that doesn't apply. No, no, that's, I'm saying the opposite of that. Well, then let's hold his feet to the fire, because here's the thing. He also makes these sorts of claims in his peer-reviewed book about how the Gospels became history. He cites Norelli, he cites the same three pages, and he cites them against Carrier. And then he brings up the same thing when he's on the um, YouTube uh, video with Jacob Berman. And it's a presentation that he had already prepared in advance. These weren't off-the-cuff remarks. Well, have you read the entire Norelli book? I have read the sections that Lit was cited, and I look to see if the uh, volume of Norelli agrees with his greater claims about the history of the text, and if it's coherent in the way that Lit was claims. And Norelli does not if agree, right, and it goes against it. If you're right, that, then, that, then yes, this is a big deal. And, and I'll be that's more why than I happy. directly cited I'll be and more like, than happy. I'll be more than happy on my own channel to break through this and say, look, are you, how are you not seeing that you're wrong here? You can mark my words on that. Yeah. I've well, done it before. Um, I, I'll do I will it again. note in my blog post to make it so everyone can see what we're talking about. Not only do I, you know, literally write out what Norelli said, but I also have links to the timestamps of the video with Litwa. So you can go and hear exactly what Litwa said, and then you can compare to what I'm claiming. Okay. Well, I'm telling you right now, we're going to get to the bottom of that. Okay. I'm pretty, I'm pretty uh, confident that. Litwin knows what he's doing, but you could be right. Well, here's the thing. The other thing, though, that shows Litwin did not do his homework because he claimed over and over again that Carrier doesn't even know the Norelli volume, let alone cited it. And that is factually false, too. Now, didn't you mention in your article that Carrier was wrong on some stuff about Norelli, though? What I said there was two things. One, that Norelli should have actually been mentioned as bibliography because I think that accounts for why right. um, uh, Litwin made the mistake. So, right, right. so Carrier's going to argue that Litwa was lying about these things, but I'm going to argue that it's basically Litwa did not really bring his A game to check things, okay. which is, you know, is, you know, you know, criticizing him as a scholar, not criticizing them as a person in that case. But here's the key thing. When um, Litwa cites Norelli against Carrier, this is related only to the pocket gospel. Um, and if you go to Litwa's book, all there is is just saying, and, and Norelli says um, this, or says that it's um, original. He doesn't tell us what the arguments are from Norelli. He doesn't say what Carrier's arguments are. We don't know why we should accept one over the other. And we also don't know if Norelli's arguments actually counter anything Carrier says. There's just no critiquing one way or the other. It's just lit we're saying, Norelli said this, therefore Carrier's wrong. And if you then go to the Norelli volume to look at what sorts of arguments they make, or he makes, and compare that to the arguments Carrier makes, you'll see that nothing that Norelli argues actually counters what Carrier's arguments are. So you, to use Norelli against Carrier when they're not even talking, like making the same sorts of uh, judgments, 
is just to prefer one over the other rather than to argue one right. over the other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's as much as I really want to spend on this ascension of Isaiah anyway, because it's just, there's just so many questions about it anyway. We don't really know, yeah. we don't really know much about it. So yeah, the other it's... thing I want to get into, uh, I'm going to save the super chats for the end. I'm just going to keep going. I don't want to, I want to keep this going. The other thing that you and I disagreed on was what was the next big one that we disagreed on? Oh, and let me, let me ask you this. What was the, what was this academic peer review paper that he, got this Jesus Ben Damies thing through uh, peer reviewed on. What was the name of this? You know the name of the paper? Let me see if it happens to be in his bibliography because I can't remember the journal off the top of my head. It just sounds, just doesn't sound right, but I'm not an expert. I could be wrong. Well, I mean, this is something you could right check. We can this, Google this that is one as well. Of the, but to... this, because the reason why I brought that up as an example, just off the top of my head, this is one of the things that like people like cringe at. Like when I talk to scholars about some of the stuff, some of the stuff mythicists uh, push is the Jesus Ben Damies thing. It's just they, pe most people cringe at that. Like, it's like, that's the, like the worst. That, like, the text says what it says. We don't have, there's no reason to like change what the text says. And like, and then you have to ask if Jesus Ben Damies. Ah, here we go, here we go. Uh, go ahead. So this is uh, from the Journal of History, I'm oh, sorry, the Journal of Early Christian Studies, volume 20, number four. This is from winter 2012. Uh, the t the uh, title of the article is Origin Eusebius and the Accidental Interpolation in Josephus, Antiquities Jews 20.200. Okay. I'll yeah, and so that. this was, yeah, this was published almost exactly 10 years ago. So it's, it's, yeah. it's gone through, it's, it's in the, it's in the peer review world, and but whether it, you um, agree with it or not is a different question that did Carrier actually make it go through the peer review process, and he absolutely did. Sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of, a lot of stuff gets through peer review. I mean, you got Gary Habermas writing about how he can prove the uh, resurrection happened, passing peer review with that stuff. But why is it that so, so many of Carrier's points are just so heavily, like, like, do you actually think that some of this stuff is just because they don't like mythicism? Or do you actually, like, we, we take a look at some of this stuff. It does kind of sound, kind of sound crazy. Like to say that the text actually means something else than what it actually says. We're just adding we're adding steps to the to to, to doing history. We're well, bent. it's more it's not it's not the data anymore. It's it's about interpretation. Well, isn't that kind of the history of religion? Everyone interpreting and reinterpreting text. That's uh that's kind of well, the that's game. theology. <laughs> that's that's theology, yeah. That, well, that, and that, that's, that's actually the argument then, because we're trying to make an historical argument of what was the earlier theology. Yeah. Now, I just don't understand how you can get the reason why I'm hung up on this one is because James, who's called the brother of the who is called the Christ, or the, James, the brother of Jesus, who is called the Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, this text is referring to something because we don't know who's called the Christ unless we go back to book 18, who's where is this, this interpolated is, is, is hell passage. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it's a it's chapter about Pontius Pilate and all the woes and calamities that happened in, in Jerusalem. And then. You know, according to people like Steve Mason, people who are, you know, study this text, say there probably was some sort of text there. This so-called Christ, you know, someone, you know, whatever, some guy. And so we have another text that's, re re that's re referring back to this. And for James who gets killed, there's no, like, James, like the, uh, the high priesthood, right? When mm -hmm. it goes to Jesus Ben Damius in the next passage. Where where do we where are we getting signified that James is of this family of Sadducees? Because only it's only the Sadducees that attain the high priesthoods. It's Sadducees and Levites, basically. Mm -hmm. So where like we're just now we're now we're assuming that James is part of this priestly family. Well, when you say James, uh, don't confuse that with James, the brother of Jesus. We're talking about who is this James being referred to in Josephus? Is this the brother of Jesus? from Christian tradition, or could this just be James, the brother of Jesus Ben Damnius? And so the whole reason this James is even mentioned is because all this political machination going on leads to Jesus Ben Damnius becoming the next priest or high priest. Right. But when you leave the text the way it is, it's, it makes sense. It's coherent. When you take it apart and, and say, oh, it really means 
Jesus Ben Damnius is the one who was the brother of Jesus. Now we have all these different. Now it's like incoherent. Now, now we don't. We don't even know what everything. We don't know who James is. We don't know. None of it makes well, sense. Well, actually, we, we do, because, again, if we just remove this the part, or we're, like I say, the argument is him called the Christ, the, that little bit in the original Greek, that that was a marginal note or an accidental insertion. If that was not their original, then in Josephus, it talks about James, the brother of Jesus. And then who is this Jesus? It's this Jesus Ben Damnius. It sounds great. If you're like, if you want that, to, if it, like, to, this is how... A lot of mythicism, a lot of mythicism points go this way, where if you want it to sound that way, you can make it sound that way. Like he pulls off in his peer review academic paper. But it, geez, is it necessary? And is that like, is that what? Like, can we use Occam's razor and just say the text says what it says? Do we have to go with there's really a mistake here or an interpolation? And they're really like, do you we're adding layers to something that's so simple. Well, that's the thing, though. That, um, it is worth noting that there were reasons to actually look at this and wonder what's going on. First off, in terms of vocabulary, um, outside of all this Jesus stuff, where else is the word Christ used in the entirety of Josephus? It's not there. Wait, say that again? I'm so, thinking about... So other than the interpolated passage, at least whatever degree interpolated about Jesus in Book 18, and then this little bit, bit in Book 20, the word Christos doesn't show up in Josephus. It's a term that doesn't show up there and he never explains to his audience. So if it suddenly just popped up here in book 20, I think Josephus would need to explain himself. I think he does use it in, to talk about certain high priests and kings that were anointed, but it doesn't use it as like a title. That's You're yeah. right. He's the, only time, the only time it's used as a title for someone who's called the Messiah, that's, yeah, that's the only time. Yeah, so but that he does one use thing that is word. already a bit weird. Uh, the it, second it, it, weird it, it, thing it, it, is... There's also another weird thing as yeah, the but, phrase. But, but, oh. but wait a minute, though. The, this text is in the 90s. The Gospels are already out by then. Or not yeah. all of them, but there's Gospels already out. This Christianity, we, are, we know, we have Christian documents from the Pompeii, Pompeii uh, volcano from Mount Vesuvius. There was Christians in, in Rome, in Italy, in the 70s, in the late 70s. Probably. So why yeah. is it so crazy? Look, why does it have to be that Josephus can't know about Jesus? Oh, uh, like, no one makes that thought, argument. I certainly don't. And, and but that's doesn't. that's my whole point is like that I, you can just Occam's razor the whole idea that all this stuff is really some sort of can it all mean something else than it really does. Josephus probably heard about it from all from everyone else. Well, here's the thing. The though. guy who's called the Christ. Well, there, there is an argument, though, that I think we need to be a bit careful about. You're arguing for the plausibility that Josephus would have said this, and I grant that totally. Uh, there's no reason why that's Josephus all, couldn't have known about that. Yeah. But it's that it's plausible that Josephus could have written about Jesus, therefore he did. That is not um, something that you can argue based on that kind of evidence. Now, like I say, if we want to talk about other things that are a bit peculiar. So first off, using this title where Josephus never explains it anywhere else, that already is kind of weird. Second, the little Greek phrase that we're talking about is just three words no, in no. Greek. Yeah, but if he, if there is, if there is a skeleton version of the testimony in Flavianum, which most, most experts in Josephus, I'm not talking about most scholars, most Bible scholars, I'm talking about experts of Josephus mm -hmm. who are, like Steve Mason, for a prime example, and mm -hmm. a couple others, they think there probably was something there. Not this, not a close, not even close to what it says today. Probably something like mocking, probably probably mocking the guy. You know, so this guy is so called Christ, who is working wonders. Well, and, actually, we got to like, stop on that so called Christ business because that particular phrase is exactly what you see in the Gospel of Matthew used by the narrator to talk about Jesus, him called the Christ. Now, Matthew is not calling Jesus so-called, but yet that exact right. phrase you're finding in Josephus. So when you see a gospel phrase in Josephus, you should at least pause and wonder why. But what I'm saying is, it's already, he's already giving you an introduction to this character. And now in book 20, he's referring back to that. They connect. The two connect. That's what it well, seems like. But again, that assumes that one, everything we see in, or that there is something there in book 18. 
And yes, Steve Mason thinks there was something there originally. And of course, I would also point, well, what about, like, say, Ken Olson, who has also done a deep dive study into the language of that passage and says it looks way more like the language of Eusebius rather than Josephus. Well, yeah, because it's so heavily interpolated that it's not the same thing anymore. So, yeah, I get what he's saying. Well, like, um, in particular, in the articles that uh, Ken Olson has written, he also says, like, um, like, here's a phrase that people thought was neutral, something that Josephus could have written, or this was Josephus style, and then shows, actually, this phrase is not only Christian, but uniquely Eusebian. So, like, for yeah. example, like the tribe of Christians, that was like a uniquely Eusebian message. But you would first think, well, that doesn't sound like a pro-Christian it, statement, but it's, I, it's such I'm Eusebian not... language that it's weird. There's no, no part of me is denying that Eusebius was all over that shit. Yeah. All over that shit. And you know, we know for a fact that he lied about other stuff too. Eusebius mm -hmm. is the church historian. He's the one with the books. He's the one with the, with the, he's the one doing the history. He's the one, he, he's in control of all that stuff. He's solely in charge of all that. Right. And at a, at a turning point in Roman history, he's going to do that. I, yes. I, that makes perfect sense to me. Right. All I'm which, saying, with, with, uh, which I'm not, I'm, as someone who's not an expert, I'm going with what the experts tell me, and it does make sense. It's not crazy. They're not, they're not, they're not getting paid by a church. They're not, they don't have an agenda. They're, these are legitimate, claim, like, there's a legitimate reasons for, to think there was something there. You know, which is why, which is why the Jesus Ben Damius thing sounds so cringe to a lot of people, because... Yeah. Well, there's, there's no one other thing to note, though, that actually also, um, like I say, one of the things that also Kerry brought up in his article, which is a bit weird, is people will point to there being something about Jesus in Josephus by citing um, Origen, because Origen seems to suggest that Josephus says something about Jesus, which would then say, hey, there's something here before Eusebius mucks things up. And that would be a reasonably uh, ar a reasonable argument. But the thing is, when... Josephus is talking about this, and he's particularly he's talking about James, the brother of Jesus, and the description he gives of this doesn't match actually what we see in Josephus. He talks about this person basically um, being killed in a very different way, um, and that this like brought on like the uh, onslaught of the Romans right after this. Things that we don't find in Josephus, but we find in a different source uh, well after Josephus. It looks like uh, from uh, Hegesippus. So Carrier's argument that there's uh, I heard a mistake this, this, on Origen's part. It, it, but that 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 makes no sense because Origen is actually talking about James too, which what does Josephus talk about when he talks about Jesus? James. It that's looks the assumption. Like... Well, that's the assumption. The thing is, though, when uh, Origen is discussing this James character. Why doesn't he and... say that, though? Why what doesn't do he say? Why doesn't he say he's talking about Hegesippus? Because he probably made a mistake. So that, that's this, this is the point that I've been making. That we're, I'm going to keep making tonight. Well, actually, we're here's the thing, though. Thing, we're, listen, you're a data scientist. This is why it's surprising to me that you're the one arguing for these cases. Because the data is not saying this. We're interpreting things differently. We're changing things around. But like, there's two oh, things Jesus to note. Ben two things I... is really different. Oh, it's really Hegesippus. It's not, or it's not uh, Josephus. Well, there's two things to note. There's two things to note, though. One, the description that Origen provides for this James passage doesn't match what we see in Josephus, but it does match what we see in Hegesippus. But it kind of does. It kind of does, though. But it, no, it, it doesn't. Does. Because, like, for example, it talks about James being pushed off the temple and things like that. That's not what you find in Josephus. But you expected to copy it word for word? I don't know what but you're trying to say. I'm saying he's saying things that aren't in Josephus at all. Like what? That, like, for example, the way James was killed was by being, like, thrown off the temple. You don't find that in Josephus, but you do find it in Hegesippus. What, now, what, but what does Origen say? And or, Well, that's what Origen is saying. That He's saying that that's what Josephus said. Yeah, but or, he's, well, he's talking about, or, like, he says it's about Josephus. Like, you just, we don't, we're not going to take his own word for it? Well, if he made a mistake... We're, and here's the thing. One of the other things that, that, that Carrier mistake, notes. That mistake is so perfect. Well, here's the thing, the though. Again, view. but again. Again, we have another thing. Like, it's another. Well, hold on. Another Let's look Jesus at the evidence. Bendamius thing. Well, look at the evidence, though. If Origen is saying Josephus says this and, or, and Josephus doesn't, then there no, must no, no, have been a mistake. Still, no, it still fits, though. It still fits for Josephus. If he says something Josephus said and Josephus didn't say it, that's wrong. That's just fact. Yeah, but, he, yeah, but he's talking. 
hundreds of years after the fact when Josephus. But if he's saying this is what Josephus said and Josephus didn't say it, origin is wrong. Yeah, and this isn't actually that. No, but he sort of. Oh, let's pull it up then. Let's, instead of arguing about it, let's pull up what it says. Let's pull it All up. right. Well, uh, if, if you want to go ahead and pull it up because. Um, All right. Uh, All right. Yeah, if you could do that. Let's, let, what so, does origin say on. Origin on Josephus? Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure it matches pretty good. There's no, there's no reason to think that he's talking about somebody else. Let's well, here's see. the thing, though, and other thing there's worth noting is that actually Carrier notes another place where actually um, Origen does confuse Hegesippus and Josephus. Really? Where is this? Um, I'd have to bring up the article to find that other example, but it's mentioned in his peer-reviewed paper as well. So, okay. I want to see that. And too. it's also worth noting, sometimes in the Gospels, like Mark will say, and said and said by such and such prophet, but he quotes the wrong prophet. These mistakes happen. Yeah, but why would no? This they don't happen like you don't just get somebody wrong though. You don't no, just it say happens I'm all the time. <laughs> That's normal. People make these mistakes. Really? Oh yeah. People say I'm I'm writing about Josephus, but I but really I whoops, brain fart. I really was talking about somebody else. Yeah. It that happens all sort the of time. Thing happen well, again, let's remember, like I said, in the Gospels, like in Mark, he'll say, I'm uh, voting, or I'm uh, quoting Isaiah, but he's actually doing Zechariah. I don't know, I don't know where like I'm going to find a good source on the internet. If anyone has a good source on the internet to find this, I'm looking through like crappy sources right now. Yeah, uh, uh, know... if need be, I'll try to find Carrier's original paper later. All right. Um, but think about this, though. Josephus talks about, when he's talking about Jesus in the second, uh, in book 20, it's talking about James. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when the origin's talking about Josephus and Jesus, is also talking about James. We had the same source. We had the same topics. We had the same, it's the same source material, whether he says it the same way or not. But like, there's no, no reason. Though, if he says, if he says, I got this from Josephus and Josephus didn't say it, then origin has to be wrong. There's no other quoting. way around it. He's not quoting from Josephus. He's just, if he he's says just Josephus said this and he doesn't say that, it doesn't matter if it's a quote. If I say you kick puppies and you've never done that, it doesn't matter if I say, well, I'm not exactly quoting you. I've said something that's, that's, that's why. Right. That's why I really <laughs> want to pull this up because if I'm, yeah. if I'm not mistaken that this is it. Okay, origin, origin. Let's see. On Matthew, on Josephus. Here we go. I'm not sure what this source is, but... uh. So here's, okay, I think this is, I think this is what he's talking about. Okay, I think this is it. If you can share your screen. Let me, let me share my screen. I don't know what source this is, so make sure, make sure if you can see, if you can, see, if, if you can um, help me out with this. I just pulled this up. This is uh, textexcavation.com. Okay. I, I don't know. Let's read it, though. Let's read it. Okay, so it says... But James is the one whom Paul says he saw in the epistle of the Galatians, saying, I, I do not see any of the apostles except James, brother of the Lord. And in such a way among the people did this James shine for his justice that Flavius Josephus, who wrote Judaic, he's even talking about what book in 20 books, wishing mm -hmm. to demonstrate the cause why the people suffered such great things that even the temple was raised down, said that these things come to pass them in accordance with the ire of God on account of the things which were dared by them against James, brother of the James, brother of Jesus, who was called Christ. That's exactly what Josephus says right there. Well, where does it say in Josephus that the temple was destroyed because of what happened to James? Wishing to demonstrate that the cause Josephus wrote, wishing to demonstrate to the cause of why the people suffered such great calamity, such great things that even the temple was raised down. See, I don't know if that's what he's trying to say. Well, that's what that's what Origen, though, is claiming Josephus says. But that's the thing. Josephus is leading up to the fall of the temple in his book. He is, but that is still far away from the time that this is going on. And what he describes is not no, about not. the destruction of the temple. It's about the order of priesthoods. And nowhere does Josephus say the temple was destroyed or the Romans attacked because of what happened to James. That doesn't appear wait, in wait, Josephus wait, wait, wait. at all. But we have an exact, exact match. James, the brother of Jesus, who is called Christ, in the text. But what about the other stuff that doesn't match at all? We have to account for both of these things. 
But he's he's telling you where he's getting it from. Blame but that's Josephus. not in Josephus. If he's telling us it's in Josephus, but it's not, there has to be a mistake, and we need to find a better solution. Well, that's not that's the thing. Josephus' whole entire book is about everything leading up to the fall of the temple. But where does it say in Josephus? Where does I'm sorry. Where does Josephus say the temple was destroyed because of what happened to James? In the end, in, in 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 the Jewish war, he talks not because of just James. Because of the things that... No, no, no. It's not just... Here's the thing, though. Josephus never brings up what happened to James as the reason for the war or the destruction of the temple. That never is said by Josephus. Yeah, but that's... It's in the story. It's part of the story. But again, what does Josephus say was the cause of the temple being destroyed? Does he say James was the reason? No, he does not. All that it says is James was killed illegally, and because of that... Uh, the old high priest was kicked out and the new high priest came in. Right. Okay. But, so nothing but, about but, but, why the temple was raised. No, that I'm just not, I'm just not following you, dude. Like you, you don't, you don't then say because he has extra information because he has extra information. in the No, text. no. Here's the thing. You though. don't, you don't then said, say no, he, he's wrong. And he's actually means this text, which is way later. Well, here's the thing. The reason I'm saying that is these sorts of things about James being killed and then the destruction of the temple happening, that is in Hegesippus. Right. And the fact that this James is being called the just, you don't find that as well anywhere in Josephus, but you do find it in Hegesippus. Yeah, but Hegesippus, Hegesippus is using the same information that's already, already out in his time period. In the late second century, yeah. Yeah. But that's not Josephus. Right, but Origen has access to both. But here's the thing. Origen is telling us this is what he got from Josephus, and it's wrong. It's demonstrably wrong. But he's telling... You're missing the point, though. No, you're missing the point here, because here's what he's saying, and it's wrong. Tell me where... Tell me where this is in Josephus. He's telling you that James, the brother of Jesus, was called Christ is written about in J- Flavius Josephus. It doesn't matter and what else And everything he says. else there too. Everything else That's there as well. That's all He's... extra information. That he all says he got from Josephus. That's where he says he and got it... from Josephus. That's, not, that's, how, that's just how he's writing it. And then he wrote something wrong. So This is I... demonstrably wrong. <laughs> but he's not, say, he's not saying all this is from Flavius Josephus. No, no. He literally says these things were done to, uh, because of uh, what happened to James. He is saying this is what Josephus is telling us. Wishing to demonstrate the cause of why the people suffered and the reason the temple was destroyed was because of what happened to James, because they dared to uh, by against James, the brother of Jesus, who is called Christ. This is what he but, is sa- This is what Origen is saying. Josephus is saying Josephus doesn't say that. So Origen is wrong. Want, and because Origen, who's a Christian, is focused on this part of the book. And, and Josephus, who is a Jew, who's focused on the calamities leading up to the fall and the destruction of the temple, one of those reasons being James. But here's the thing. Josephus never says that. Ever. Jose- Josephus talks about this throughout the entire book. And does, after where the does, temple falls... Here, this, is a factual, this is a factual claim that Origen is saying. Josephus says that what happened to James was the reason for the destruction of the temple. No, no. Josephus constantly is giving you reasons of what's happening. There's in the actual Josephus, but here's what Origen is saying. This is the key thing. Origen is saying Josephus said X. Josephus so did just, not say so X. So we just we just cross off we just cross off Josephus because he has information extra information. Here's the thing. That's no. That's Does, that's, that's that's ridiculous. No, no, no. Uh, this is actually more ridiculous. That Origen says something know. wrong, and therefore we're going to accept what he says. It's anyways. not wrong. It's just he's it adding. Is. It's he's factual. adding. He's adding extra Christian shit to the text. Then he's lying. <laughs> if he's saying he's this is what lying. Josephus said, he, here's the thing. No, this is this would be a lie if, if Josephus is saying this is what Josephus says. Josephus doesn't say it, and Origen really believes this is what Josephus said. Uh, if this, I'm oh, sorry. If Josephus says X. Origin claims Josephus said Y instead of X. That's not, that's that's not what it is, though. No, but no, no. Here's no. the thing. It's, it's where, where, more, where? No, no, no. Let me correct that. Let me correct that. Josephus There's nothing to correct says, here because I have Josephus, been absolutely hold clear. On. Let, me fi- let me finish this. Jos- he says Josephus says X, and Joseph- but, but I'm saying X and Y 
therefore we throw out X. He's saying X and X are still there. He's adding shit to the to the text. Doesn't mean what no, he's saying no, is not and Josephus. No, because here's what he said. He says explicitly, Josephus says, wishing to demonstrate the cause by which the people suffered. And the reason they suffered is because of what they dared That's to do to James. That's the whole point of what I was just telling you. The entire book is about why the temple fell. And here's the so thing. James Josephus the story. says... And Josephus said absolutely nothing about James having anything to do with why the temple fell. Then why would he tell it in the story then? Because he is telling why us about Why is it even the... in the story? Well, let's take a look at the original text of Josephus. He's saying, here is this Jesus, or sorry, here is this James. He was killed by an illegal assembly. This caused the next priest to then take place of the previous one. And that's why Jesus Ben Damnius is the high priest. He is going through and explaining how the next priest got his position. That's why it's brought right. up. Right. And so Origen is reading this text and he thinks he's interpreting it as in saying part of the reason why the temple fell, according to Josephus, is because of how horrible these people were and how they couldn't they couldn't keep it together. And, you know, they killed a just man named James, who is the brother of our Christ. Well, here's the thing, though. Nowhere. He's referring to that text. But here's the thing. If you go to go to Josephus, go to antiquities, it says nothing about James being just or or righteous or innocent. None of those things are said. But does it but Origen is writing 200 years later he's adding his own shit to the story. But he's claiming this is what Josephus says. It doesn't matter when he writes it. I'm writing about Josephus now. I better not, say what Josephus says. I don't think you're I don't think you I don't uh, to me it makes perfect sense. I don't No, not at least. Not, you are claiming okay. you are basically not even reading the what only Origen way, is saying. The only way or the only way you could tell me convince me that Origen's talking about someone else is if I wanted it to not be about Josephus. Well, here's the thing. But it, why it, it does he mentions? What's more likely that we we go what the text tells us, or we interpret it the way we want? Well, here's what's more likely that Origen made a mistake, or somehow there's missing text from Josephus that happens to be this giant Christian statement about how James was actually killed by the Jews, and this brought down the destruction of the temple, which Josephus doesn't currently say, but said in some other mystery version that we've lost. No. Here's the thing, that Josephus, that um, Origen made a mistake about what he's citing is actually plausible because he makes this same mistake Confusing Josephus and Hegesippus but, in but, other but places. The, but the, the Gospels make happens, this sort of mistake too. The mistake happens to have two characters that happen to be in the text that he's claiming to call from. And look, let's say let's say he says, I got this from Tacitus. Tacitus doesn't mention James. Then you'd be right, because Tacitus never mentions James. But Josephus actually mentions Jesus, brother of, Je of the Christ. So now we have a text and it lines up. There's no reason not to believe it. But here's the That's thing. All I'm saying. Again, but here's the thing. First off, Origen is telling us things that Josephus doesn't say. And secondly, the whole yeah, thing he's is, adding is shit. This... I already, I already acknowledge that he adds shit to the story. It's not adding. He is claiming this is what no, Josephus but we says. Still, you still have James, the brother of Jesus, who is called Christ. You are you now also ignoring that. everything before that. It says Origen is telling us that this is what he claims. Josephus says he is saying. Origen is saying, Josephus is saying, the reason the temple was destroyed was because of what happened to James. That is not in Josephus. Therefore, Origen is wrong. He is citing someone else. And the thing is, Hegesippus does say these sorts of things. He does talk about James being the just, being the brother of Jesus, dying a terrible death. And because of that terrible death, then suddenly the Romans attacked the um, temple. That's all in Hegesippus. It's not in Josephus. That's why it looks more plausible. What Origen is talking about is a different text because what he says matches a different text than what he cites. In the same sort of way, in the Gospels, sometimes Mark will cite a uh, prophet, but he gives the name wrong. These mistakes happen. Right, but the mistake that you claim, if, it, if it's not a mistake, it still works. It's not a, like, if it, like, I, like I said, if he was, let's say he's quoting from Celsus, or uh, he's quoting from Diodorus Sicily, so, and it just doesn't make sense because Diodorus never said that, then you'd be right. But he's, he's actually making a claim about a book, and it fits. without Whether it's a mistake or not, Like, can you at least admit that it's possible that there's no mistake here? It is a mistake. It's obviously clearly a mistake. 
You can't so, deny what it says. So it says here's the. So everybody's wrong about this, except for you and a couple other people. Well, let's look at the facts. Does Origen say Josephus says the temple was destroyed because of what happened to James? Does, does, does it matter? He's, he's yes or no. Shaddai. Yes or no. Yes or no. Kind, yes, he, he kind of does because this is a yes. It's in it's in the story. Yes. Does it's, Josephus it's one, it's actually the, say? Does Josephus actually say the temple was destroyed because of what happened to James? No, but he does say that all of these events are what led up to the fall of the, of the temple. And James is part of this story. So yes. No, again, what does it actually say in Josephus? Does it actually say James was a just man, killed um, unjustly, and that was the cause of the war? No. No, but he's gonna say, he, but he, it's, it's part of the story though. There's but it's not what Josephus says. Like, but here's no, the but thing. that's how Origen's interpreting it. That's, it's, uh, that, what that's do you mean interpreting? Like. He is telling us this is what Josephus said. This is said Josephus who wrote 20, this. Look, 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 look. 20 books in 20 books wishing to demonstrate the cause of why the 20 fucking books, not one book, not one passage in 20 books it says it right there. Wishing to demonstrate the cause of why the people suffered such great things. That's what he's saying. And that's what Josephus says too. Josephus tells you and then the all next part, of these things. And then the next part, right after there's that big E there, and then it said, these things came to pass against them in accordance with the ire of God on account of the things that were dared by them against James. Or in other words, he is because saying... Because he's a Christian. He thinks it's all about this. But he, No, here's the thing. Here's the thing. It is claiming in this statement that the person who is saying this is Josephus. It says right there, it's Josephus said that these things came to pass. Yeah. Josephus and those things did not come to pass because of what happened to James. Josephus never said that. You're, no, that's not what that's that's not what Origen's saying here. Origen's it is exactly about, what it's saying. Origen says it right here. In 20 books, he demonstrates why the temple fell, right? Does he not? Does Josephus do that? Yes or no? Yes. There you go. That's what he says. The next sentence, next part. But uh, said but these he, things came to pass spoke, against them right. in accordance with the ire of God on account of the things they dared against James. Because that's origin, the reason given. Because Origen's a Christian and he's talking about this from a Christian perspective, he's going to emphasize. Hold, stop, stop. Notice the word said. Who is doing the saying? Josephus. So, Origen is saying Josephus said this. Origen is wrong. Josephus did not say this. Yeah, but he talks about he talks about what happened to James. Does that's it all say he's saying. No, no, that's more than what it says. It said these things came to pass in accordance with the ire of God because of what they did to James. Does Josephus say that? No. Yeah, but and that is a demonstrable just, fact. I this is totally binary. You. I just showed you you are ignoring everything I just said. So let's take a breather for a moment. Let's stop. Hold on. He's talking about all is, 20 books. He's talking about the whole entire collection of the books of why the, the temple fell. And at the end, and in he's, this last and clause. He's emphasizing, and he's emphasizing James because he's a Christian. He's origin. But here's the key thing. Again, where it begins with the word said. Think, now, do who's think doing the gives a do you think Origen really cares about all these other examples that Josephus gives? He's focusing on the one that's relevant to him. But here's the thing. What Origen is focusing on does not exist in Josephus. That's the fact. Yes, it does. Yes, it Where does. Where does it say in Joseph? This is a fact. This is a you get, binary statement. You get, you get a passage about a guy named James who's a brother of who was called Christ. Brother of Jesus who was called Christ. That's Where all does you it get. Say, Where does it say, though, in anywhere that that was the reason the temple was destroyed? But he says it's in 20 books. He says that. But here's He's the thing. He's not just Again, saying it's one thing alone. Well, no, that's exactly what's being said right here, uh, starting with that capital letter E. So that Josephus said that these things came to pass against them in accordance with the ire of God on account of the things that were dared by them against James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, I that see is what it. he is. That is what, that is what Origen is claiming Josephus said. Josephus did it. not say that, but I, I see you can find you. that in Hegesippus, and that's what Carrier quotes and shows that these sorts of things are found exactly in Hegesippus. They're not found in Josephus. So all that is required to make sense of what Joseph, of Origen's no. saying here is he made no. a reference mistake. 
that that just doesn't make sense because he's talking clearly about Josephus talking about the entire works. But he's not also a, that's just wrong. such a big mistake to have. It's actually pretty easy. And again, he, our origin has made this mistake before. Wait, but but he's talking about Josephus works in general. He's talking about the entire 20 books, which is actually also he, an interesting thing that you notice, because actually this uh, gets to something else a bit interesting. Um, Josephus also talks about John the Baptist, right? Yeah. Now, when Origen cites Josephus on John the Baptist, he says it, um, Origen talks about John the Baptist in book 18. Yeah, right here. John, is this the one Josephus says to John having been a Baptist? Promise cleansing to those who are baptized. Oh, yeah. And right there at the beginning, it says in his 18th volume of Antiquities of the Jews, he talks about uh, John the Baptist. Yep. That's a reasonable, good citation. Now, notice, though, he actually cites the exact book of Antiquities of the Jews. Josephus or Origen doesn't actually cite where in Antiquities of the Jews there's this whole James passage. For some reason, Origen doesn't know where it is in um, this book. Why is it that he could find it for John the Baptist, but now he can't find it for James? That's actually weird. I don't know. Whatever. If that's how you see it. I, I'm going. I'm going with what the uh, what, uh, what experts are telling me, and it makes sense. I don't, there's no need to. Uh, I'm fine. I'm fine with your interpretation of it. I just don't think it's the more likely. Well, here's scenario. the thing, though. I'll, let's just absolutely stick with the facts. And the facts I am are, sticking with the facts. But here's the here's one of the key the facts. facts. Here's one of the key facts. Origen said, Josephus says, the temple was destroyed because of what happens to James. That is a fact that's of what not is being all, stated. That's not what he says, though. He's, it is literally he said, what he says. No, no, it's not. He literally, literally says. Literally is what he, he said. Literally, no, he, he literally actually says, Judaic antiquities in 20 books, wishing to demonstrate the cause of why people such great things. He literally tells you that's all about the entire book. And then he and, focuses on, and then he hones in on the James thing because he's a Christian. But here's it. what, it, but here's exact, but here's the key thing. Josephus said, and I'm going to repeat exactly what's being written here. Josephus said that these things, the destruction of the temple, came to pass against them, the Jews, in accordance with the ire of God on account of the things which were dared by them against James. It yeah, is if you literally wanted to, saying if you wanted Josephus to sound wrote that, that way. If you want it to sound that way, it it's will not, sound that way. I'm literally reading it. I'm I am not it making is. it sound away. I am literally reading it. Right. And he, do you, do you, you remember him saying 20 books or did he say, did he say one book? He says Does there's he 20 say books. Does he say one passage? Does he say it happened in one passage? I'm um, just James? No. What are you talking about? Here is he the said, key he tells thing. You, he tells you he's demonstrating the cause of why people such great things throughout 20 books. Mm -hmm. He tells you that. That's all you need to know. That's what he's, he's leading with that. With that being said, it doesn't matter what he says after that. He can add as much shit as he wants. But here's the thing. The thing he He's adds... He's not quoting from anything in particular. No, no, he is. He says literally right there, Josephus said this. And what does Josephus say? Again, right from the word said, where your mouse is. He said, these things came to pass because of what happened to James. The word said right there is telling us he is getting this from Josephus. And it's not there, therefore he's mistaken. Right. I said this three times. We're gonna keep, if we're gonna keep going back and forth, I'm just gonna stop because James is part of this story, and he's focusing on James more because he's a Christian. But how much does actually Josephus talk about James? All he says is he was Barely. killed, and that's it. Yeah, that's it. And then why is then Joseph? Then why is Origen saying Josephus says that actually he's part of this much grander event? That the, because what Origen happened was because of what happened to James. Because Origen's a Christian, and that's what he thinks. But here's the thing. Origen is saying this is what Josephus said, and that's the problem. Right, but he opens it up by saying throughout 20 books, he's demonstrating the cause of why people suffered these things. Mm -hmm. and, he's basically he also, saying, and he's basically saying one of them is James. He's basically and that's saying, the thing. One of those things isn't actually what Josephus says. Josephus never says what happened to James was a cause. It, it would be nice if he would have said it that way, but he doesn't. Looks like but for you, it would be nice if he would have said Hegesippus, but he doesn't. But here's the thing. What we can do is look What's at what more we likely? have. Well, What's we'll look at the evidence. Does it make more sense that Origen is saying something Josephus didn't actually say, or 
origin is mistaken about no, what the source was. No, because the way the way I'm interpreting it, you don't have to change anything. There's no you can just leave it the way it is, and it still makes sense. But here's the thing: it says right there, origin is claiming. For right, you to be right, you have to change shit. For you to be right, you have to change shit. For me well, to be right, I just leave it the way it is. Where in Josephus does it say James I told the you reason this already. the temple fell? I told you this already. I the answer is it doesn't. I told That's the actual he, fact. 20 books. 20 where books. does it... Okay, this is a very straightforward question. Where does Josephus say James' death caused the destruction? When Josephus explains that this story is about what led up to the temple falling and why the temple fell. That's the whole point of the story. Actually, it's not. Yes, it is. The story is about the succession of priests. No, but the whole 20 books is about what happened to, for the Jews, why they lost their temple, why God promised the temple forever, and they lost it. That's what and he's trying to thing. tell you. Now, here's the thing, though. In Josephus, he doesn't actually say that what happened to James was the reason the temple fell. It's not the only reason, but it's part of the book. It's part but of the it's reason. not something Josephus says at all. All you will not find Josephus saying. Yeah, but if you that, take the whole book in context, then you you understand why he's telling the story this way. Where again, this is just totally binary. Does Josephus say the death of James caused the destruction? No. Origen says Josephus said that because that's what Origen thinks. Because Origen's a Christian. Well, then he's Josephus quoting, is well, not. He, then he's either lying or he's mistaken. If it, if it said, if, if you would have a better point, if it said that in this one passage in Judaic antiquities, th this is what uh, Josephus... Well, that's actually the other is, interesting thing. Why can't um, Origen cite the passage? He doesn't know where it is. Because he he's talking John about... The the, because he's talking about the entire book. But here's he the says, thing. In, why cite an entire says, book... But why cite in the entire book if you're talking about one three-word clause? <laughs> it's a bad. It's a bad passage. I get it. But here's the thing. That's also totally different from how Joseph or how Origen uses Josephus exactly for John the Baptist. He says John the Baptist is described. It's described in Book 18, nice and clear. Here, yeah. we don't know where in the book James is supposed to be cited, and he's now being said to be part of the reason the temple fell, and that's not what Josephus says. So for some reason, he's trying to cite Josephus, but he doesn't know where it says that in Josephus, just somewhere in 20 books, which is, you know, if I told you, which oh, is, Carrier said it somewhere in here, he would tell me to go which, away. He'd need a better reference than yeah, that. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's how he says it, though. And that's, 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 what do you want me to do? There's nothing I can do But, about but the that. thing is, though, notice how that's different than when he cites John the Baptist. But you don't then just change what, you don't just change it then. Like, sure it says do. what it says. You, you change it if it doesn't make sense in context or you realize there's something else that's wrong and you have a better hypothesis to explain it. And the hypothesis no, but no, no, that no. he's citing the, the wrong text source. Makes, the text still makes sense the way it is. Because we, that's what we've been around this 30 times now. I know. I at know no we did. point at once, ever, 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 and this is a fact, a straight up fact. Josephus never said the death of James caused the destruction. Origen is claiming that and it's wrong. Right, but Josephus, like I said this 20 times already, Josephus tells you. No, no, no. All instead of, of saying these... that again, acknowledge what I just said. I already did. You're right. He doesn't say that's the only reason. But Origen's talking about. I'm this. saying Josephus to never gives that as a reason at all. Not even a little bit. Not one among many. He never gives it as a reason. Not even a little bit. Yeah, but that's the whole point of his book. The whole point of the book is to explain what happened. Right. The whole book is about what happened to the temple, and the, what happened to James is not given as a reason. It's in the but it's in the story though. It's in the story, Origen but it's not it. the story, but it's not telling us this is why the temple fell. Yeah, but why wouldn't Origen see it that way? He's a Christian. He thinks it's all about Jesus. Why wouldn't he see it that way? Here's the thing, though. No? Origen is telling us this is what Josephus said. Again, that key word, said, right after all the right, big well, E one there. He is saying this is what Josephus says, and Josephus does is, not say that. We're just going to keep going in circles about this shit. But the, this, me, the, the problem sense. with reason going in circles is because you are denying a fact. No, I'm not. I'm, Does, I'm, going, with, I'm going with the data, what the data tells us. Well, here's, says. here's the data. Origen says, Josephus says, the reason the temple was destroyed is because of what happened to James. That is what 
origin says that's, Josephus said. But that's not exactly how he says it, though. He says it It's very... exactly what it says. It says right there, said no, that does. these things came to pass. But he says, what happened. who wrote the Judaic antiquities in 20 books? You are that's ignoring what, what I am saying to say that, hey, there's this whole big book he wrote. Yeah. And he's saying in that big book, he said this. And nowhere in that big book did he say X. It's, you're just, you're, whatever. That's, that's how you see it, I guess. It's not how I see it. It's a fact. It, no, it Josephus is how you see it. never said so where, that X. So why, so why does every other expert in this field not see it this way? Well, have they, they looked all, at the evidence like we have? They've all they've heard this shit a million times. Me and Derek. Well, here's the thing. Stuff. Well, first off, we need to point out that you even denied Kiru even wrote an article about this under peer review. I didn't know he did, and honestly, but I, here's I the thing: him. you were denying it right at the beginning. I, you were I claiming hear, that Kiru should should have gotten this peer reviewed, and he did. Because I hear that Carrier had. I don't know. Never mind. My wait, wait. You hear? You hear? So we're going by hearsay. That is not good scholarship. Come on, we know better than that. I'm not a scholar. You are doing some actually really good stuff on this channel, and I think you should be proud of the stuff you're doing. You are interacting with this at a way higher level than some random layman. Right. I just think it's I think it's bunk to say. I think it's some of the shit that he gets peer reviewed is bunk. There you go. And I and I hear other people say the same thing, and I, I'm not alone in that. I think it's bunk. But here's the thing: some people I don't say think Carrier, it's not an argument. I don't think. Listen, listen. I don't think Kerry gives a shit if there's a Jesus or not. I think he just wants mm -hmm. to argue that there isn't. I think he's just on that side. I don't think he cares what the truth is. He just wants to argue for mythicism. He, he's wow. made it okay. his, just like a lot of these other, a lot of these people who write books for mythicism or who have channels built on mythicism, they become apologists for this thing because they've built their entire identities off of it. So they need it to be true now. They don't care if it's true or not. They don't care if the, what the data says or what experts are saying. They just want whatever out they can get, like if they can switch up some things here and there, they're going to do it. Do you think that's now, true I've for heard, me? I've heard, no, I, I, I'm surprised that you, out of all people, are so adamant on, like, this, the, uh, on switching with, interpreting what the data actually says. It's surprising to me. I've heard, I, I, I've, I've heard from some people that one of the people who are, you know, peer-reviewing carriers, Dr. Robert M. Price. You know, Why are we going by that. hearsay instead of data? That's why I took it on my video, because I can't prove it. I mean, why even but, bring it up, though? But if that's the case, though, because some of this shit is ridiculous. But if that's the case, though, this is the same guy who's giving out honorary PhDs to Ralph Ellis, who thinks that, well, you know, and he's another, wait, 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 he's, wait. he's the other, wait, he's the wait, other Wait, well, you're now going by, a, suppose some hearsay is correct, so let's find other reasons to attack Carrier. Come on, let, this is now just being a silly personal attack. We can do better than this. I, let's just stick with well, the facts. Well, well why don't, if, I, if, I, if I say it, like I'm saying now, maybe someone can prove me wrong. And wait, 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 wait. Why do you have to be proven wrong? That's the thing, though. We should be trying to actually show what we say is right, not make a claim and then have someone else do the hard work of showing it's wrong. Well, then why, Let's do, actually why do, do the, the real work? Then why are so many people so confident that's the case? What do you mean? Like people who bring this information to me are like sure that it's true. Uh, here's the thing. I've talked to a lot of Christians sure about lots of things. That doesn't make them right. What are the facts? That's what really matters. I guess that's true. I guess that's true. That's why I took it out of my video. Yeah. And, and like I say, I, I at the, at the end of the day, I want to see. Any, yeah. Uh, at the very but least, if, I no, don't even the, bring up all, The only reason why I brought it up, because if that's true, then to me, this is all just a bunch of bullshit. Because now, well, now we're just playing games. Now we're just playing games. Well, here's the thing. If we just go by, if rumors are true, then this we're going to play all sorts of terrible games. Then we could just say, well, if it's true that there is a giant conspiracy within biblical studies, then we can't trust anything. Well, what's, now, what's you, wouldn't, you wouldn't accept that at all. <laughs> yeah, but what's so, more likely? Is there a giant conspiracy against mythicism? Or, like, because think, uh, I brought this up earlier. Can it be true at the same time that academia is, you know, has there's a conspiracy in academia to keep the truth about Jesus and his, uh, all the truth, all the truth about the Bible, it's all true, but academia doesn't want to admit it. And at the same time, academia is, is against mythicism. Can, mm -hmm. can both those things be true at the same time? Well, that could be true at the same time. But I think more the question is, are there examples of things happening in academia to suppress mythicist opinions? Like what? 
I don't think well, so. Well, um, uh, okay, I guess if we're going to go for examples, are you familiar with the story of Thomas L. Brody? No, what's that? So uh, Brody, uh, he is a Dominican. Uh, he's actually a Catholic priest. And he and Dennis McDonald probably did some of the most important work for, like, developing mimesis criticism. Okay, now I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what was it? Maybe a decade or so ago. I forget how long ago. Um, uh, Brody comes out with his memoir book where basically he comes out as a Jesus mythicist. And now you don't hear anything about him again because um, he basically lives in the Catholic Church. And he's basically told, you're not going to be lecturing anymore. You're not going to have any students anymore. Um, you're basically, you need to be quiet or you're going to be out of the Dominican uh, uh, order. And telling an old man that uh, with no Wait, skills that's that could the go into church. the workforce. That's the church. That's not academia. Well, I mean, saying this is an example of this sort of opinion being suppressed. Yeah, but you can't even, you, you could go to, you could be in a church and just say that you think Jesus wasn't the God. Like you could say the Trinity's not right or something. You could get criticized for the, like that. That's like, that's not surprising at all. Uh, I could also mention, like, for example, what happened to Christopher Rolston, who was at, um, I forget which college it was, but he was tenured, and he lost it because he basically made some statements about the Bible not being egalitarian on women's rights, and basically a bunch of the funders for that college came in and said, hey, this is a bunch of bull, you're going to get rid of that guy, you're going to lose funding, and he had to then leave and fortunately find another position. And right. if we want to talk even more recently, look what's happened to Emma David Litwa, who's now lost his own academic position. And, and I've, I've always brought this up with very, uh, very conservative Catholic or Christian universities. Yeah. But what, what who's to say about yeah or uh, um, North Carolina or Duke or all these other these places well, don't have that going on. Hopefully not. I would hope not, at least. They don't. But they I'm just pointing don't. out here. Just... Here are examples of what well, mind you, uh, Litwa was at a Catholic university. So in theory, he should have that not, sort of academic but freedom. But, but it's not, it's more complicated than just him his ideas. There is more going on there, and it, it's not just you might know more than things. I do about this because yeah, you I have do, better, I okay. do, and it's not what people think. It's not he was he wasn't just saying things and they didn't like it and fired him. There's there was more to it. There's more bullshit going on that the people don't know about. Okay, but um, I but, don't know how much that, of that you're but even. Yeah, I'm not even going to talk about it. But okay, but that's not to say that that, that that you're not wrong about these very conservative tight schools but i'm not yeah. talking about those i'm talking about the wide academia as a whole like okay why isn't why isn't it that uh carl ruck who came on my channel and said he thinks he doubts the historicity of jesus he even said i think i'm a mythicist mm -hmm. maybe not the same like mind you, know, you he's emeritus yeah no this is this is bit like this is big this is somebody somebody who been right. looking but at like I noticed, text. but he's someone who had to retire Why isn't he before fired? coming out with this. No, no, he's he's still teaching right now. He's as an emeritus, right? Yeah, he's still teaching. Right, but emeritus is basically a retired professor. They they think, have like no, some. I think he's. It, it it usually means you can have some teaching duties, but you're not taking out PhD students. You're not expected to do research. Uh, that's usually emeritus right. status. Um, okay, or so if we want to talk more research. So, um, so where where uh, where is where, where why doesn't he lose that? Like where where where's all the. Where's all the where's all the uh, controversy over Karl Ruck and his mythicism? Where's all that? Nobody gave a shit. They're just okay, cool. You think that cool? Because right. you want to know why? Because Karl Ruck's not going to go around saying that there's a conspiracy against him and he's right and everyone else is wrong. That's the difference between Karl Ruck and Carrier. Now, here's the thing: I don't want to argue about conspiracies, especially where there's a lack of evidence. Uh, do I think there is a university-wide conspiracy against mythicists? No. What I think there is, is there are plenty of people in those positions that think so little of it that they don't even want to give it the time of day, and they just go, ugh, every time someone brings it up and it's like, one more internet mythicist. And I totally understand that attitude, considering how much of the stuff out there is utter garbage. I mean, remember, together, we actually did some debunking of the mythicist crap on Zeitgeist. Yeah, of course. And mythicism, yeah. if you look at the history and the... 19th century, 20th century, mythicism was a a position, a really strong position for a while. Depending it fell on where you people, were. People have abandoned some of these ideas because mm -hmm. they didn't they didn't argue, for example, they didn't argue that Paul thought it was all a myth. They were mm -hmm. arguing that this all happened before that. Like, oh, it's all it's all agricultural stuff like that. 
like a yeah, yeah, the, the dying gold, rise golden and stuff. Bug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, you also see there's kind of like some overcorrection where people keep saying the dying and rising gods didn't even exist; that that was just a false category. But we've both seen the evidence that these concepts absolutely existed. So it's a strange thing to hear Bible scholars just deny that there were dying and rising gods. Yeah, that's that's you know a weird thing where I just have to think it's like. No, I, is so I, right about this. Why isn't the rest I've, of the Academy getting on board? I can't, you got, anyone who watches my channel knows that I've always, 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 always promoted those ideas. And I believe in those ideas. Mm -hmm. Like I just did a, I did a video about Eshmon and Yasios and Serapis. Yeah. And like, I'm, I'm showing you guys that the Christ, not Jesus, the Christ is based off all this Greco Roman mystery stuff. I believe that still. I'm not holding mm -hmm. that. I, look at. I know that that's not the consensus, mm -hmm. but I think it will be one day. But right. I think mythicism should be taken seriously. Right. Right. But if, if and, you want, and, if people like want it to be taken seriously, I was going to say, here, if but people want it to be taken seriously. Yeah. Um, and, and I do believe that. That's actually my argument here. I'm not going to even argue that the historicity of Jesus is so lowly probable that it's absolutely absurd that Bible scholars believe that. Because, again, I think there are good reasons to come in and think there is a dude, and it takes a lot of work to come to the mythicist conclusion. Now, I think that's because there are good reasons to, but I also agree that it also takes a lot of legwork. There's a lot of premises that have to be argued in a lot of detail. It is not something that is just a trivial thing, and to either dismiss it like Holocaust denial, um, or to also say there's just a giant cabal of Catholics running all the universities in the world, and it's just a giant Jesuit conspiracy. I don't believe either of those sorts of things. <laughs> but it is yeah. noteworthy, though, that when the mythicists claim there were dying and rising gods, and then you have people like Bart Ehrman just completely denying it, that seems awkward because we see the evidence with our own eyes. Why is it that we see in the Academy this denial of it when it's so oh, it's apparent? Completely no, that's 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 completely justified to, to, yeah. to feel that. No, yeah, no, actually, I mean, actually, it's, I think we, we don't use this you don't even have jump. to be a scholar. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna, you don't even have to be a scholar to find this information out. Right, right. Yeah, so it's like really you, you weird can you can look at denied. you can look at online images of the Temple of Eshmun mm -hmm. in 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 uh, Lebanon, and you can look at the inscriptions where it says Eshmun saves or. Mm -hmm. You could talk, or, or you could you could look at the Phoenician inscription that talks about, and you could you could even you can even if you can read, you know, if you can read the the letters, mm -hmm. you could do your own translation where it talks about a start day, rising Eshmon up into heaven, mm -hmm. resurrecting him, and then he's coming back down as a healer god. Yep, you could see that for yourself. You don't have to. I, I'm not depending on some scholar for that. Yeah, that to me, for for someone to not know that or deny that, that is kind of crazy. Right, I agree. Uh, and like I say, I think, though, a reason it's denied is because it's seen as a premise in mythicism. And if you're a Bible right. scholar and you already think mythicism is Holocaust denial, you are pushing back against all the claims, even to the point of denying the evidence. And that's the problem I see in the Academy right now. There's such assuredness about the premise of Jesus existing that these claims or these challenges that um, the better mythicists make are just not even being addressed. And that, I think is a failing of the Academy, and I honestly want this to happen. I want the Academy to take it seriously, to also see here's what also is going on, and then use that to maybe a greater historicity thesis to better explain how the religion came about, assuming there was a guy. I think mythicism provides challenges that should force historicity to improve if it is the correct theory, and if historicity is false, then we move on to a new paradigm. To me, it's basically... Um, Copernicus coming in, do we um, just steadfastly stay with the Ptolemaic system, or do we at least try a different astronomical system to match the data? And now one the of last them thing, might be right. The last thing I want to have a little discussion on, and then because I think we agree on most of the stuff we're saying now. Yeah. But the what do you what do you because you're you're all about the data, mm -hmm. and you're a data scientist. Now, what 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 do you say for? The no nobody's contesting that this guy existed, even Jewish sources, even T Talmud. We both we both think, we were talking about this. How, yeah, the Talmud has this weird thing where they keep saying it happened at the time of Alexander Janaeus, but everyone kind of knows that this is the same Jesus. 
Well, actually, let's talk about that because it is let's such a weird thing. And right now, um, I don't see a good explanation for this on historicity. Um, and on mythicism, I can make much more sense of it, which is one of the reasons I consider it evidence for mythicism. It seems more likely on that. Now, that also means if a historist or a scholar can come along and explain this at least as well as I can, that will be awesome and it will advance the field. And that's what I want to see happen. Now, let's let the audience know what the hell we're talking about again. What do you mean Talmud Jesus? So yeah. in no, well, the chain, heard, oh, oh, if you want to go ahead, go ahead and explain. No, go ahead. All right, okay. So the key thing is when we are looking for outside references to Jesus, Obviously, we've talked about Josephus to death. I'm pretty sure Josephus is rolling in his grave <laughs> about all this. But if we move on to other Jews that may have talked about Jesus, there does seem to be mention of our friend Jesus in both the Babylonian and the Jerusalem Talmud. Now, people will say, well, the Talmud itself is composed in like, or, or at least compiled in like the 5th, 6th centuries AD. It's so late. But, you know, this has some older sources. And either way, we want to look at this and see what was their view of Jesus? And the weird thing is, in multiple tracts within both Talmuds, they seem to place Jesus about a century before Jesus. <laughs> Not in all the texts, though. Which there one? are some. There are the ones that about the ones that they use his name as Jesus Ben Pantera. Mm -hmm. Have him in the first. Have him in in Sepphoris, which is is literally Nazareth. Like I was just there. I'm not kidding. You can. Yeah. It's one. You got a hill here. You got a hill there. Sephiroth. You could you could throw a rock at each other. It's the same place. Yeah, yeah. They're definitely nearby each other. But saying it's taking place in Sephiroth doesn't put it in the same. Well, Sephiroth is story. the greater region too. So yeah, Sepphoris but, but, but here's the thing. Nazareth. Telling me it's in Sephiroth doesn't tell me the time it takes place. And in well, all it these does. narratives, no, it, it does because it talks about the rabbis that were around that time, and it's 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 talking about like like thirties, forties, fifties area region. Because it's talking about right after, it's talking about Jesus already being dead. It's talking about one of his followers named Jacob, who was healing in his name. Supposedly it worked. They're like, oh, wait, maybe there's something to this thing. Okay, and then well, in that case, sudden, we're not talking about Jesus. We're talking about Jesus's later day followers. But the story of Jesus, and here's the weird thing. In many, many places in the Talmud, it places Jesus during the reign of Alexander Janias, who was a king of the Jews, reigning roughly around 100 BC to 70 BC, which yeah, when it talks about his trial, it talks about his trial. It talks it, it puts him in that day. I've heard, I've heard a theory on this from mm -hmm. from two different people actually. One of them is a good scholar. Uh, um, wait, was it was it uh, he was either Tabor or Schaefer that he was referring to Schaefer saying this, but also some rabbis say this too that. Mm -hmm. The, the earliest Talmud that we have in physical copy is from like the 13th century. Mm -hmm. And before that, a lot of changing had been done. Well, they're living under the Romans. Mm -hmm. And so they're being persecuted for the blasphemy. You, can, you, would, you would die for blasphemy. So a way around that is to redate the text. And so they don't die now. They can keep the text there and don't die. That's, now, that's as a possibility. Yeah, but the problem with that explanation is, one, we see it in both Talmuds, including the Babylonian Talmud, which was composed outside of Roman control. Right, but I think the Babylonian Talmud follows them into Roman lands. Like I Eventually think it does, but we can see, though, if it's showing up in both Talmuds, that's come really coordinated changing, and that's a conspiracy. Yeah, no, that's that would, be, that would make sense that they would do that, though. But here's the thing: having a conspiracy at this scale is pretty. I'm not going to uh, die in that. I'm not going to die in that hill. So I'm yeah. Just gonna and leave the other that. reason this doesn't work well is that we actually know of Christians who believe this as well. In the works of Epiphanius, he actually right. says that yeah, there is this group of Christians known as the Nazareans, and they believed that J Jesus basically was the last true king of the Davidic line and died during the reign of Alexander Janias. Right. Yeah. So that's and another multiple I've heard sources. another person say I heard uh um what's his name? I just had him on my channel. I just had him on my channel like two weeks ago. Uh oh my god, hold on, just give me one second. I'll look at it right now. I just I'm having okay. a huge uh brain brain screw up. Hold on, sorry about this. It's okay. It is Bruce Kilton. Okay. Bruce Kilton thinks that it's possible Alexander Janaeus is the last of the Maccabees. He 
establishes the Sanhedrin, which passes down into the Herods. The Herods mm-hmm. are the last people to have the same Sanhedrin that was set up by Alexander Janaeus. This is the same Sanhedrin that treated the Jesus case. Mm-hmm. So if it's under this Alexander Janaeus government, maybe, he's, maybe they're talking about the government that he set up. That's the a possibility. The problem, though, is that if we look at the narratives, it actually has Jesus running away with the Nazi of the um, League to Egypt, and we are told the name of that person, and that person was also literally running away from Alexander Janaeus. So the story itself places it. Wait, which, wait, which, one, wait, which one is this? Let me bring up the correct reference. Uh, da, 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 da. I have it in my this blog. Might be, so this might be one I haven't along. seen yet. Yeah, let me get to the right place. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, according to Sanhedrin 107b. We're told that Jesus goes along with Joshua ben uh, Parachia. I'm, I'm sorry that my Hebrew is so terrible in pronunciation. So uh, Joshua ben Parachia, he is the Nazi during the second century BC. And according to the narrative, both Jesus and this Joshua go to Egypt together because they are escaping King Janias. Now, is this the same? This is the, how do you know this is the Jesus that they're talking about? It says, uh, I forget if it said Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus Ben Pantera. Let me triple check. Yeah. Let me go to the that. correct reference. Because this is, like I say, this is in the Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin 107b. Uh, for all the you know, people at home who want to follow along. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. All right. So let me find our friend JC again. Da, 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 da. I'll probably have to share my screen once. There's I a lot of it. Jesuses. There's a lot of Jesuses in the town. Oh yeah, oh yeah. The yeah. There's a but, there's a lot of Jesses, Jesuses, Joshuas. Right. Ah, yeah, right here no, it says actually Jesus of Nazareth. Oh wow. So there's okay. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So like I say, that thing. explanation doesn't then fit. It doesn't fit what the Talmud says, and it doesn't fit what Epiphanius says. No, it makes no sense. But here's it. So and the Talmud's very weird like this. The whole mm-hmm. thing doesn't. Unless you're an expert in the Talmud. You're just looking at stuff that's completely foreign to what you know when you start reading this stuff. It's just it's a lot of parables and stuff. But anyways, let's let's get right to it, because seriously, though, we have a Jesus of Nazareth. Whose mother is named Mary, whose father is questionable, Mm -hmm. you know, who is hung on Passover Eve Mm -hmm. for leading Israel astray. And. He leads a movement that that's start that continues after he's dead. Yes. Can we have? Is it even possible? You're 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 the data scientist. I'm not. Is it even possible to be talking about two different Jesuses? That would be a coincidence beyond calculation. <laughs> beyond calculation. Yeah. So and so yet, I think, and yet he's a century in the past. It's. I admit it's a really weird thing, but yeah. I don't think it should be abandoned or not or just discarded. I think we're talking about some history here. But how can it? It's literally impossible and, for Jesus to be in both times. But here but here we have these people, these Jews, mm-hmm. who are, they lose their government, so they're not going to have written records that are going to be easily contained within some temple somewhere. Like, they're, like, keeping these things, like, in houses and stuff, and they're going back and forth from Babylon and Jerusalem, and that's why you have these Talmuds things set up, right? Mm-hmm. Now, they're keeping really good records. They have quotes from rabbis from the second century BC, quotes from rabbis from the first century BC, quotes from rabbis in the first century, all the way up to the present day. They have quotes from rabbis going back all the way. They're keeping records. They're keeping genealogies. They're keeping things together. Mm-hmm. Don't you think somewhere, someone would say, Jesus of Nazareth does not exist. He's a myth. Somebody made him up. But no one says that. Well, here's the thing, though. We still, like I said, I want to stick with this right now, because what is the historicity explanation for having Jesus a century in the past? The only thing I can think of is not to get killed for blasphemy. But it doesn't fit all the data. It doesn't explain Epiphanius, for example. That's a literal belief by Christians that Jesus died around the reign of Alexander Janias. That's actually believed by some Christians, according to Epiphanius. It's... It's something I want to explore now. Like I want um, to find I have, a, out. I have a link to the passage in my blog post as well. So, but, um, but, again, but, yeah. but think about this. If this is like this is going to sound crazy, but I'm just going to this is how I am. I ha- I have to explore things, even if it sounds crazy. I have to look at it. If he really was a guy that lived this time period, 
Does that mean historicity and mythicism are both wrong? Well, here's how I think it would work on mythicism. Here's my idea. So if originally the idea of Jesus that he was some sort of cosmic figure and then later was put into stories in history, different groups will place him in different histories because they're not coordinating with each other. Now, why would they choose the particular times that they do? I have an interesting guess for that, but I haven't done anything that passes peer review. But my guess is the way they figured out when Jesus actually was, and notice these square quotes, these scare quotes, is they were using the 70 weeks of years prophecy from Daniel and using that to try to predict when the Messiah was supposed to come. Um, I played around with that and with some the same sorts of assumptions that Christians were making. The Well, first off, the Christians themselves actually used the Daniel week of years prophecy to say that Jesus died during the reign of Pontius Pilate. You find that in Julius Africanus, for example. He literally does the calculation to show that at least some Christians were doing that. I suppose, what if Christians did it with slightly different starting assumptions? And one of the ways I found out is that it predicts that the Messiah would come in the year 103 BC, the beginning of Janias's reign. See, this I like this. I like this. This is this is like something that makes, that makes sense. Yeah. Now, like I said, this is not something I've had go through peer review. So um, if I tried articulating it in a journal form and get feedback there, I might have to change my mind. But this is an example of how potentially you could go from cosmic Christ to Christ in history by people using their same sort of pressure or midrash logic, um, all the sort of Bible code stuff, and then using that to predict when Jesus was, quote unquote, supposed to have existed, and then write the story based on that. In the same sort when, of way how well, Jesus when, was supposed to come from Bethlehem because of prophecy, for example. Yeah, but why would that happen in the Talmud, though? Well, because what I would suppose is this might actually be something that was created by some of the early Jewish Christians in that church that basically disappeared after the end of the Jewish war. And you think those fragments get passed on into Babylon and get put into the Talmud and they're just, they're just the scribes just putting down what they have? That, that's uh, because, a, lot, a lot of people. And a lot of the Talmud is exactly that, by the way. Yeah, it's something like that. It seems like this must have been the idea that was circulating amongst Jewish Christians. Because, again, Epiphanius tells us this was the belief of the Nazareans. And he also says these Nazareans still hold to the Jewish law. They're basically Jewish Christians. If there were other Jewish Christians in Babylon or elsewhere in Palestine, and this was the version of Jesus they talked about during Janias' reign, and that's what the Talmudic rabbis heard, that might explain this weirdness yeah i don't know i think it's very strange i'm not gonna lie it's yeah and that's and that's why i, I, I wish it was because, more clear yeah but it does seem like it does seem like they're referring to a, an event that happened but the dates are off and that's oh, yeah, that's, totally. that's 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 yeah well, that's not only just say. the dates but also the political context i mean this is literally taking place not only before the Roman Empire, it's even happening before like the reign of Julius Caesar. And it would be a really weird thing if you remember Jesus saying, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but you put it in a context before there's even a Caesar. <laughs> well, yeah, because if it happened in the time of Janaeus, that would mean that there would still be, would it be the Seleucids that was still controlling that region? Or it's the, um, Parth it's not the Parthians yet, it's Seleucids, I think. Well, during Janias' uh, reign, uh, well, Janias' reign, they're independent of both the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. Yeah, so the Seleucids are falling apart. Yeah. The the uh, Mithridates' kingdom is starting to grow mm -hmm. in Pontus in Asia. Yeah. And that's when Pompey the Great comes through around 67, 66. Mm -hmm. 66 Somewhere in the 60s, through the yeah. whole Yeah. And then that's when you get Julius Caesar after that. But, mm -hmm. but... The whole point is, this is before all that shit. Yeah, yeah. This is taking place at a time where Julius Caesar is at best in diapers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he would have been... No, you know what it would have been? It would have been during Sola. Sola. Mm. And Sola... I think Sola, you're right, yeah. Yeah, Sola, Sola was the first one to cross the Rubicon. And mm -hmm. he threatened to kill Caesar. If Caesar... Yeah. He told Caesar to... Because Caesar was, was royal... He, had his, he was a royal patronage. And yep. Yeah, the Julian Claude. Yeah. yeah, he had to... Uh, Divorce his wife, or he was going to kill him. So he had to, Caesar had to flee for that. But anyways, that's all yeah. side stuff. But right. um, the whole point of me saying all that is because the time period is so weird. Because like, yeah. why would this all be? It just 
I don't know, right. Doesn't make sense. And and this is like I say, this is my challenge to mainstream scholarship and historicity in general. This I can make more sense on mythicism that there was a mythical Jesus and then different people put him in history differently, and that's why they don't line up. That makes sense on historicity. Yeah, I just don't see why the Jews would do that. No, I get well, the that. The thing is, my, see... my, well, my claim isn't that the Jews did this. My claim is another group of Christians and the group of Christians that the Jews at the Talmud knew said this, that this was. Basically, there was a group of Christians who had a different version of the gospel than the ones that we see in the modern New Testament. And in their version of the gospel, Jesus was running around during the days of Alexander Janias. Well, that's an interesting take. Yeah, not sure well, like I say, I'm my question, sure though, is how, well, well, the right. reason I say it makes sense on mythicism is that if a person isn't historically real and people take different stabs on when he actually existed, they're not going to coordinate well. If there was a historical dude, you wouldn't expect people to be off by a century. No, you wouldn't. I mean, it, it, it doesn't make sense. I mean, but you do have, you do have historical evidence. Actually, it's a historical fact that Jews were killed for blasphemy for talking about Jesus in a bad mm -hmm. way. Yeah. We have evidence. We, 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 I could show you examples of this. And I it's from count. the Talmud. And mm -hmm. it's from the Talmud. So no now, now, now take that in consideration. Put that in the back burner now. Now put now, now, here's the kicker. Though we don't know, we don't know of any Talmud records before the 13th century. We have no idea what those Talmuds versions say. So we don't know how much coordination and change could have happened for a thousand years. A thousand years. But remember, so it's though, very, it's remember possible though, there's they one other detail. Things. There's one more detail, yeah. though. Remember also the testimony from Epiphanius, who tells us that there were Jewish Christians in the 4th century that also believed the same thing. Yeah, I have to look at the end of that again. That's interesting. That is, that does, yeah. You're right. That, that is a, that's an interesting point. That's an interesting yeah. point. So, yeah, and like I say, and this is why I'm like, we need, uh, if historicity is correct, we need an explanation for this weirdness. And the fact that I can't find one that actually matches up with all the evidence screams out for an explanation. So... I would challenge uh, historists to come up with an explanation for all this data so that way we can move forward or otherwise say this is at least more explicable on mythicism because on historicity, you can't have Jesus in two different centuries. Right. Wasn't there another thing all that the we... other times that people put Jesus like um, if you look also in uh, Irenaeus, he also puts Jesus later than the Gospels do. And I also... Um, have argued that potentially those dates were also chosen for using the Daniel uh, 70 weeks of years prophecy. Well, you know, I talked to Mike Lawrence, mythicist, who doesn't okay. get any credit. He doesn't get any credibility because he doesn't have a PhD or whatever. I don't know. I think he's a really smart dude. I think he makes, he makes a good case for mythicism. And he thinks that the dates from the time he's born to the time he dies you have two significant 70 years for the temple, just like it says in uh, Daniel and Jeremiah, and then 40 years from the time Jesus is gone, you have 40 years in the wilderness before the temple falls. Mm -hmm. You're without your Messiah for 40 years. You're alone in the wilderness. So he's you're, you're with your Messiah for 30 years, 70 years before the temple, and then when he dies, you have 40 more years left in the, in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. That's Those dates match up pretty good. So yeah, you could yeah. argue. You could argue that that's there's it's either a really big coincidence, or it was placed that way. But it's one yeah. or the other. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. When there are coincidences like that, they're interesting. Though I will slightly push against that coincidence, just because the gospels are not clear on what year Jesus is killed, and that forty years only works if Jesus is specifically killed in the year thirty, and the gospels don't make that straightforwardly clear. Right. Yeah, you have to go with. Well, they kind of, but they kind of hint at that though, because they do say it happens under Pilate. Yeah, but he he reigns for about a ten year period. You can't lay, you can't get it down to no, a no, particular no, but, year based but, on that. But you get the fourteenth year of Tiberius in there, so it does. You sort of get it pinpointed. You get the thirtieth year, he gets baptized. So you you're already you're you're close. They get you close. 
Yeah, well, actually, there's a few things that make this a little bit complicated. One is that, yeah, it says in such and such year of Tiberius, I'm forgetting the exact numbers, but yeah, yeah. In, in the beginning of Luke chapter three, it says that John the Baptist started in such and such year during the reign of Tiberius. Jesus comes, he's about 30 years old. But right. we actually don't know when Jesus comes to John the Baptist. Does he come a week after he opened shop? Or has John the Baptist been running the show for 10 years? We actually can't tell from the story. And we also yeah. don't know how long Jesus' ministry is. So again, you can't really pinpoint an exact year based on this. Now, because I've looked into this, this is where astronomy comes in. <laughs> now I can use the background. <laughs> nice, nice. So if you take the, the, the statements about how Jesus is killed um, either like the day before Passover or on Passover, uh, what have either the day before Passover or two days before, depending on if you use the synoptics or John, if you say then Jesus was born on a Sunday, or it's not born on a Sunday, he was resurrected on a Sunday, that whole three days thing, and how it lines up with the Sabbaths, how it lines up with Passover, et cetera, et cetera. You can actually figure out what dates can fit those criteria using astronomy because the um, Jewish calendar at this time is completely based on observations of the moon. And we can project what the moon like looked like on any given night and then figure out when would have been the first of Nisan. And then you can figure out when the 14th of Nisan would be and see, is that three days before Sunday, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then you can have some criteria. And then you find that like the only two years that really match up with this is the year 30 and 33 based on the astronomical data. But complication, complication, there's always complications with this study. This only works with the Johannine chronology where Jesus isn't killed on the, uh, I'm getting the dates mixed up. If John said the 15th, yeah, John said that Jesus was killed on the 15th of Passover rather than the 14th, which is alluded to in all the synoptics. So you have to take John's chronology to even have any candidate work, which is strange. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. this is a whole nother tangent, which might be a fun video in itself because yeah. you might know this, but I kind of like astronomy. <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I do too. Let me, let's take a break for a second and read yeah. some of these super chats out. And let's, because I've, I've been holding, yeah. Thank you, right. Sabra, for the super chat. It's this simple. If Jesus did, doesn't, didn't possess every single trait that almost all Christians would use to describe Jesus, then he didn't exist. <laughs> Christians don't worship just some guys that did some things. Well, you no, know, no, no. This is actually not a bad point because. It, it, there is, yeah, there is the philosophical point of how much of the Jesus story needs to be true to say there is an historical Jesus. I've been saying this forever, and I, and I stand by it. Yeah. But so much of the Gospels are myth. Mm. That doesn't, like, even if there was just a guy, who doesn't matter what his name is, who was crucified under Pilate. Is that, is mythicism still true? Kind of. You know, if there's a, yeah. a guy named Jesus who got crucified. That's all that happened. That's the only thing that happened that the, the, that the Gospels get right. Is mythicism still wrong? Not really. That's all. I'm, I think that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. And it is right also worth noting to the else. audience in general that when we are talking about the historical Jesus, we are not talking about the whiz-bang Superman of the Gospels. We're just talking about was there a dude that basically things got out of control and he basically became master of the universe in later stories. But originally, he was just some guy who got himself on the wrong side of the law, ultimately. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Omega, Omega, thank you for the super chat. Neil, I think you should just you you should have just made your points, but left out the slightly repetitive clown joker stuff. It made everything a little inflammatory. Oh, that's you know. Thank you for your uh, feedback. Sure, I liked it. Um, I think I, it I add, add, adds though, a little that, bit of. Well, I, I would add though that it does kind of have a tonal imbalance if you say. Carrier makes good points, mythicism is plausible, and Carrier is a total clown, and the idea is ridiculous. That doesn't really jive. I don't care I don't care what his ideas are that I don't I disagree with. I just think that when he then says, when people when people disagree with him or think that he's wrong or think that he's off, then they he'll just say, you know, they're they're all you know, they're theists or they're uh they're they're or they're insane. They're they're literally insane because they don't, you know, whatever. Like that's you. You sound. You look like a clown. You look like the Joker. Like you look like you're like. How do how do, the reason why I picked the Joker is because he sort of fits that role where he's like the all academia is all against me and it's like I'm over here like in my laboratory like hey hey like that's what it feels like like you're you're singling yourself out you're making it seem like that no one wants to deal with you 
when you do that. That's all I'm saying. And I do want to say that I do think Carrier's rhetoric has not done what he wants it to do. It is not making academia want to treat him more seriously or his thesis more seriously, which is also one of the reasons I'm here taking a very different approach than what Richard Carrier would do. I still believe in having these sorts of conversations, even with people I disagree with, who I think have made arguments that are bad and should have been done better. I still think that I can say, hey, your argument is bad, but I'm going to still argue with you rather than drag you through the mud as much as I can. That's, I'm trying to take a different approach. I can understand why Carrier does that, but I don't think he's ultimately helping himself. And even if he'd like, even if there were examples of, you know, academics who are like, you know, shitting on Carrier for no reason, and he just kept it in stride, he would look so much better instead of going the other route and trying to be like, oh, this person's a crazy person. Hey, look at, they said this, or... He are, you be, like, wait, are you suggesting we should turn the other cheek? Where have I heard that? <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I mean, I don't know. I'm not saying he shouldn't be able to refute people. I'm not saying that. Yeah. But I, I think that. you get what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. I'm, not, I'm not even going to talk about it anymore. Right. Paul Kickling, thank you for the super chat. Why do mythicists ignore docetism? Even if Christ came as a spirit in the mind of the apostles, the platonic world is realer than our fake world. So if he came in the flesh, he would be he would be less real, ironically. <laughs> but you know um, what, though? This is a good point, because where is the mythicism in the in the books of Irenaeus and Hippo, Hippo, Hippolytus? Well, they are, of course, saying that the Gospels are the authorities in these sorts of matters, so they're going to follow that. But more importantly... If you look at Irenaeus, he also talks about how Jesus, you know, rises through the heavens and he has to pass through the gates to get through all the heavenly levels to return back to the throne of the Almighty. So those sorts of mythical elements still exist in there. And not to mention, all the Christians definitely believe in demons and Satan and all those things. They're not a bunch of secularists. <laughs> not even close. No, no, not at all. But what I'm saying is, if mythicism was the original Christianity, mm -hmm. like was the, that's how it started off. That there were, you would think that there, this would be a um, uh, what, what's the word for it? Uh, that there'd be some remnant heresy, there'd be a heresy. This would be a heresy. Well, you know? the thing is, though, there might be some signs of this. So, for example, it's actually interesting that Paul brings up docetism. And if you look, for example, yeah. at the letters of Ir uh, not Irenaeus, um, Ignatius, so um, the Ignatian letters. A lot of scholars will say Ignatius is, at least one of his targets, are docetists. But the thing is that's a bit interesting is, you know, our idea of what a docetist is, is Jesus is here on earth, but only in like ghost form. That you only see basically an image, he only seems to be here. But the interesting thing though is when Ignatius is arguing against whoever he's going against, he is also saying, um, how dare they not say, or now how dare they not believe that Jesus was actually born of Mary, that he was actually crucified under Pontius Pilate? Why are they specifying these very particular time markers if the docetists are just disagreeing on whether Jesus actually suffered or not? Th to say that the docetists or whatever his opponents are don't believe that Jesus um, was there during Pilate's time, this sounds like he's attacking some other different group that doesn't actually have a more historically grounded version of their Jesus. But this is a little bit speculative on who the targets of Ignatius really were. Yeah, no, I just, um, I think if you had this thing going on before Mark wrote his gospel, I think you would find it in the her heresies. I mean, mind I you though, if that. this, mind you though, um, all the heresies that we know about, if you look at like all the heres heres heresiology books that we have, whether it's Irenaeus, whether it's Tertullian, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the oldest heresy people that they actually quote, they're all from the second century or later. We don't have any first uh, century heretics. Well, well, they do say that the Ebionites are heretics and they talk about the Ebionites being in the first century. But, but the but all the stuff that's supposed to be quoted from the Ebionites is what the Ebionites are claiming in the second century. We don't actually have anyone saying here was a heretic in the fifties saying these sorts of things. Right. We don't have that yeah. You don't have anything like that. No, that's, yeah. that's so, true. That's and true. so, like I say, there's this there's this hidden gap of where we just don't really have good documentation at all, and this is maybe where all the mystery stuff happens. 
it's it's, it's basically point. the big question mark in what happened in Christianity and how it developed. And we're just trying to use second century and later data to try to project back the best that we can. Now, we have some first century data. We obviously have the letters of Paul. And then, of course, well, how about, would you want to argue until we're blue in the face about what Paul actually said? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Obviously, that gets, that becomes another can of worms. And how we interpret Paul, then we might say, well, how did other people interpret Paul? Well, who was interpreting Paul in the first century? Oh, we got the same problem. Oh, pretty much all the interpreters of Paul that we know are interpreting Paul are second century and later, which again is after the time that mythicism may have become the forgotten heresy in a sense. It's possible. Robert Herring, thank you for the $2 super chat. Sending love, happier, you're better. I'm getting there. I'm still, still a little out of it. It's a little sweaty. Honestly, but... you sound good though. I'm, I'm glad you're feeling better though. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely good enough to be doing this. That's for sure. Very good. Christine Wilson, thank you for joining and becoming a member. Appreciate that. This is a this is a weird video to join at me. I'm probably not my best self. I'm yelling at you and you're yelling at me, but no, this is just how drama. I, this, I'm gonna go get some popcorn right now. <laughs> no, and that's exactly how I am. If I'm talking sports with my cousin or brother, I get the same way. I start getting loud. I'm from New York. This is how we are here. I it's not like I'm not really I don't care. I'm not like I don't take this seriously. I could be wrong about shit. Like, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm just, this, I'm just arguing what I think. And that, that's just how it comes off. Maybe some people might think it sounds crazy, but that's just, that's just the nature of me. So, and right. I think you picked up, so, I think you know that about me. So that's why so you what you're saying is yet. the next stream, we need to be shouting at each other about the Buffalo bills. <laughs> yes. <laughs> By the way, I don't even know what a Buffalo bill is. So I'm going to be terrible at that argument. <laughs> I forgot what they named it at. Oh, some guy, it was a guy it was a person. There was a person. Yeah. It's back in some time period. I don't know. But I remember reading about that. Yeah. It, most people in Buffalo don't know that. Yeah. Most people I, in Buffalo are like, oh, I have no idea. And I'm here in Boston. I have no idea what a Bruin is. Is it a bear? Is it a is it a bagel? I honestly don't know. Bruin? Yeah. I always yeah. wonder that. I think it's a bear, right? <laughs> you, might, you might be right. But honestly, without looking at Wikipedia, I don't know. Sports. That's, that's the real mystery religion to me. <laughs> yeah. Then you have like um, uh, what is it called? The uh, there's some weird names out there, but uh, yeah, whatever. I don't. I, I'm yeah. I'm just so out of it right now that I can't even think of it. Yeah. But uh, anyways, let's see what the next one says. There's a couple more, I think. Um, damn, there's a lot of comments. I'm just scrolling through these comments. Whew. Here we go. Liren Shoham, thank you for the super chat. Adair follows the consensus when it's convenient to him academic hypocrisy i try to see where the evidence is and if i disagree with it then i try to do my research now i think what lyrum is coming in is that uh when i've gone on like uh, this channel or jacob berman's channel to argue against electric universe lyrum sees that as far more plausible than i do and the thing is the electric universe people it's not that they're outside of academics and they're heretics it's that they just don't know shit I have to be absolutely yeah. honest about it. They don't know shit. The people who promote electric universe stuff aren't physicists, don't know physics, and have to make blindingly absurd things about that. So uh, it's not a matter that I just stick with the consensus, is that, hey, they make claims about the sun that we can test our wrong literally sitting in our living rooms. We don't need a particle accelerator and an academic consensus to see it's a bunch of ball hockey. Sorry, yeah. I have nothing kind to say about Electric Universe uh, ideas. Yeah, yeah, this I I used to like that shit when I first when I was back in my just leaving the church, but still yeah. thinking something exists. Electric Universe is perfect because it sounded sciency, it sounded like it, there was explanations behind shit, yeah. but it still had something. It still was like, ooh, the universe is it's, everything means something, but like you know. It didn't take me long. It's in fact, um, uh, what's his name? What's his name? He has that channel. He, he debunks it so good. Oh, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Dave explains. Professor Dave explained. I, I, that's how I found him. I mm -hmm. found him through looking up the, you know, electric universe shit. I wanted to learn more about it. And then all of a sudden he comes in the algorithm, like, listen, listen up, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Like he just shut the whole thing down. I was like, this dude just debunked the whole thing. Yeah. I can't even I can't even look at that anymore. 
So now he uh, he he's good. He's good. Mm. Presser Dave. Yeah. But uh, and the key thing though is the reason I follow the academic consensus on that point is here are basically science has an advantage that religion and history don't have is that science can usually go and collect more evidence. The historian is kind of already limited to like what's already been collected from the past. Like the chances that we're going to get another encyclopedia from the first century of data is unfortunately low. Do we want to get better pictures of the stars? We can build a new telescope and do that. We just did this last year. That's something that, you know, science has and that history wish it could have that have that quality of data. Now, I'm not saying that history can't make any conclusions. I'm just pointing out that one of the reasons science is so successful is its ability to get extremely precise data in large quantities and scientists to then come together to figure out what data they need to argue between competing hypotheses and do the crucial experiments. That is just harder to do in history. Um, it's not the fault of the historians. It's just a matter of what kind of data can exist in these two fields. Yeah, and honestly, I, I follow the consensus because I'm not an expert. So, but it doesn't mean that I don't hold positions that aren't consensus. I hold a lot of positions that aren't consensus. Yeah. But I also try my best to understand why my position is not the consensus. And I don't try to say that they're all, I'm right and they're all wrong. And I don't yeah. look for that. And look at, and, that, and that's not to say that I have, I can find a scholar that agrees with my position. I don't just hold, I don't just pull that card out every time. Look, he yeah. said it, it's true. Like, exactly. I don't do that. That's, I just feel like people should stop doing that. But, you know, anyways. Um, yeah, and I should I, also repeat that if you were a new person coming to this whole Jesus mythicism debate, if this was completely new to you, what would I tell you? Hey, here's the consensus view. They actually have lots of good prima facie reasons for that. If you want to become a mythicist, you're going to have to listen to these minority groups a lot. Um, so only if you want to deep dive should you even consider mythicism. Otherwise, stick with the consensus because that is the responsible thing to do unless you really want to learn the languages, the materials, the sources, and get down in the dirty and read all of the uh, top-level scholarship on the subject. If you're not willing to do that, then you should probably pause and just say at the consensus level. That's my general approach. Yeah, and because you get a lot of mythicists that are not, you know, they don't know the material, like... They're just like, they, they think it's all astro theology or some Pythagorean. Like they're, yeah. they're totally in some other, in some other camp, but they think that like, that's what mythicism is. I, mean, you, I get a lot of comments like that. And I like, that's, people are in their own lane sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Philip, thank you for the super chat. Do, do we have, do we have complete copies of all 20 Josephus's books? Yes, yeah, we do, but we yeah. don't know what the uh, we have quite a few. We don't know how much of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think all the oldest manuscripts are like from around one thousand. I think that's the oldest copies we have, but we have quite a few different copies in multiple languages, um, and of course we have quotes and references earlier than that as well. So, um, I just I'm looking well through some of these com. I'm looking through some of these comments, and that's just funny to me how how emotional people are. About about mythicism like what yeah. is it about this idea that you have to get like so you get you get so mad at me about yeah I, I have to say that this does exist unfortunately on both sides and i think it's one of the reasons it's so hard to make progress on this question because if both so, sides are being like, a sorry, it, yeah yeah okay. sorry that i'm not an expert and i just and, I, and i'm i'm going with what's the likely scenario for, for yeah. what people who i trust in say right like I, I right. do this for everything. I don't do this just for Bible study. I yeah. do this for climate change. I do this for, I do this for political science too. I, I, I go to the experts. Look, I went to school for economics. I know a little bit of economics, but bachelor's level economics is not the same as PhD level economics. Mm -hmm. So I'm not an expert in economics. You're not, not you're not going to come to me and get. I ha I still have to go to other people above me to get real good information. So I'm not like I'm not going to sit here and be like. Yeah, huh. I went to University of Buffalo for economics. I know everything about economics. I don't know shit. I just I know the lingo. I can I can I can hold my own in a conversation about it. Yeah, but I mean, quite honestly, uh, when uh, if I go to a physics conference and I have a PhD in physics and I still don't know what the fuck most people are talking about, <laughs> there's so right. much esoteric stuff that you have to really deep dive into to understand what's going on in a lot of these fields. Um, that's, and when it comes to, exactly. and I should also note with biblical studies. 
Again, do I have a degree in biblical studies? No. Do I have a degree in classics? No. Should I be listened to? Definitely not based on credentials. All I can claim is that I'm basically an advanced novice um, who has published in um, the history of religion journals, in uh, biblical studies journals, and I've participated in SBL. In fact, I'm going to be flying there in about a week and a half. So um, I'm at least trying to participate in that academic conversation, though admittedly as an outsider, so I'm also usually very... Um, uh, not kowtowing to others, but very um, cautious in the claims I make and the feedback I want to receive from uh, academics on my ideas. Yeah, I hope I hope that goes well. We'll see what happens. Uh, Paul Kickling says, mythicists somehow believe more evidence for Christian doctrine outside of Christianity means it's less true. Looks like all other mythicism agree with Christianity. I'm trying to interpret this and maybe he's referring to like the evidence from the talmud and from josephus and things like that or um, maybe prop maybe like prophetic shit like uh he should come from nazareth like i've heard this pace made by mythicists especially because bart Ehrman talks about how there's there is no evidence for a prophecy about a guy coming from nazareth yeah he should you know he's the, the davidic covenant comes from bethlehem he's got to be born in bethlehem so they try to fix that in the gospel. Well, I heard, I've heard mythicists say, but it says right in the text that the prophets say it shall come from Nazareth. But it only shows that in Christian texts. We don't see that in any other text before that. So I think what Paul's saying is like, oh, look, the Christians, mythicists agree with Christians because Christians will say there has to be a text because the Bible says there is. Well, um, so, just I think, Paul, though, because he's talking about uh, evidence for Christian doctrine outside of Christianity. So like the Talmud, for example. I think that's what he's talking about. Okay. Well, I was going to say, like the, the prophets saying that there's gonna, the Messiah is going to come from Nazareth. That would be outside of Christianity, right? Or before Christianity, because at least in theory, Matthew thinks he's quoting from the Old Testament. Right. Um, now, where is this quote coming from? Obviously, that's the big mystery because, yeah, people have been searching the Old Testament pretty hard. And it doesn't at least exist. that doesn't say there. So... There's hypotheses about how that could have happened. Maybe that, there's some other manuscript don't you tradition. Think that, don't you think that's another strong case for historicism? Like, why would that be? What, what was, what's the point of the whole Nazareth thing? Well, if they're saying it's according to prophecy, then that must be why. Otherwise, they're lying about there being a prophecy, and that's not going to fly. Yeah, I think that's more likely that they're, they're making up. The, the guy came from Nazareth, so now they have to explain it away. And so they'll just say, yeah, there was a prophecy. Okay, so actually, here's an idea, uh, a way of when it comes to, like, comparing the hypotheses. So the two hypotheses are there was an historical Jesus and he came from Nazareth. On uh, the mythicist point of view is there was an historical Jesus, but there was this idea that the, the um, Messiah has to be a quote-unquote Nazarene. And then going for some text that now, says where, where, he will where, be a where, Nazarene. Where, 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 what text do we see anything like that? Well, I'm saying that here's how it would work on mythicism. This would be like the two hypotheses to explain the same evidence. So right. saying that there's a prophecy that says he will be a Nazarene when this, this um, prophecy doesn't actually exist as seen, then either they have to be making up to explain he comes from Nazareth or they have to be making up to explain why Jesus has this title of Nazarene. Yeah, but if, there, if he's a myth, you, then you, you, you but don't he's have also to add has that. Like, but here's the thing. He's a myth uh, and he has all sorts of other titles, you know, the logos and things like that. How do we explain that, for example? Yeah, it isn't really the logos thing kind of. That, that, that's like philosophy that gets tossed in. It's, you know, the peripatetic school, the philos. Like, that's yeah, but a, nonetheless, that's it like is a, one of the titles of Jesus and it is not a title he has because he comes from the town of Logos. <laughs> right. But Nazareth early on. But mind you, though, that, mind you, though, the prophecy does not say he will come from Nazareth. The exact wording is he will be a Nazarene. True. And the word True. there, Nazarene, isn't actually the word you would use to say someone from a town of Nazareth. It doesn't have that structure. This sounds like it's some other different title. And what it actually means is unclear. Really? You really think that? Where do you get? I don't. That's. Yeah, this is another example to me where it seems like we're just we're just adding stuff that doesn't have to be there. But here's the thing, though. Like I say, grammatically, here's the difference. Like, if I want to say um, Socrates was an Athenian, there's a particular way of how you write Athenian. And that structure of how you designate a person's town from isn't being how used do we know, for Nazareth. 
But how do you know that's not the way to say he's a Nazarene? Well, I mean, this is Greek grammar. That's the that's just straightforward. Yeah, but where where else in Greek do you see people talk about people from Nazareth? You don't really see it. But we know grammar. That's the key thing. Even if a new word comes, it still follows grammar laws. Right, but it's also coming from a... It's also talking about a place, so it's not like... Well, no, though, the key thing is, it doesn't look like it's being treated as a place in this prophecy. They're saying he will be a Nazarene is the same you know, thing as saying who, he will who, come from who? Nazareth. All right, so where are you getting this information from? You, are you, you know Greek really well? Um, I've studied it, yeah, and I have a grammar book I could go grab later for... Um, so I'm just, I'm, but... I'm, I'm a beginner. I know a little bit. Mm -hmm. I would have to, I want to, like, I want to see what, the, this, is there any Greek experts that are saying this? Is there anyone, maybe, like, I'm not saying there isn't. I'm just asking. I remember in uh, Carrier's book, he does bring up a few uh, references about people trying to explain where does the name Nazareth, Nazarene come from? Because people have noted, I think the oldest source he mentions, what, noting what else, about a century what else, ago. What else would you say besides he would be a Nazarene? A Nazarethite? A Nazarite? That wouldn't be Nazarite. That's a Nazarite vowel. What else would you say? Well, for example, if you wanted to say someone's from Athens, how would you say it in English if you were from Athens? Athenian. Exactly. That sort of Ian, that sort of um, uh, suffix Nazarene. at the end is how you... So Nazarene. Do you think it would be Nazarene with the... I'd have to double check the exact form of it if it would be like Nazarenos, uh, so it'd be like Athenios, but my memory on that exactly there is fuzzy at the moment. Uh, the thing is, it's a really strange way to say this is a city designation um, in that construction. It's also weird because actually like the spelling of Nazareth or the word Nazarene, it has like different variant spellings throughout the Gospels. It's actually a little bit strange as well as... And also, there's um, in the various commentaries from the Christians themselves about what Nazarene means is uh, debated. You find like all sorts of references about different groups interpreting Nazarene differently, um, according to Irenaeus. He, of course, mostly puts it with a bunch of heretics, but that's what Irenaeus would do. <laughs> yeah, it's like I say, like it's I one said. of those weird things. It's like I say, it's an oddity, not a proof of one thing or the other. I'll have to look into that. I'm going to ask some people about that who know who know the Greek and ask them if that's the, if that's what they think. But it's yeah, it's an at the very least, point. it's, it's an not interesting that, point. Yeah, I will say um, it's not that you can't claim uh, you can't say this doesn't mean someone from Nazareth. I'm saying it's not the normal way of how you would do it with Greek grammar. So yeah, and the fact that it's abnormal means it needs an explanation. It can't just be hand waved. Interesting. Paul Kickling, thank you for the, another super chat. Appreciate it. By the way, if I don't, if I look like I'm not like being grateful for these super chats, I'm just a little out of it, just a little bit of a headache. That's all. So thank you everybody for the super chats. I really appreciate it. Can't express it any more than I think. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Paul, because you this is like the second or third maybe that you dropped tonight. We don't question scientific development, but spiritual knowledge has to come from out of nowhere. Hypocrisy. Tanakh even says it's a slow dissem dissemination. Yeah. Well, what do you think? I question scientific developments as a part of my job. <laughs> oh, uh, that's true. That's true. I mean, the whole reason we actually do develop it is because of the questioning. That's we the whole point of science and then, is to keep. Yeah. Yeah. The whole point. Yeah. I mean, heck, even like modern evolutionary theory isn't the same as what Darwin said 150 years ago. So I really don't know what's being meant there. And as for spiritual knowledge, I would claim... Um, no one has spiritual knowledge because knowledge means justified true beliefs, and no one has been able to justify anything about spiritual stuff except, I would claim, the atheists who say there isn't such a realm. Yeah. So uh, we're, yeah. we're pretty far apart on this point, Paul. I think we'd have to have a very separate discussion. <laughs> well, Paul has another super chat right after this, so thank you very much for that one. You don't understand the mythicism of Christianity if you think Christ cannot be in two different centuries. Christ comes infinitely forever as Platonic knowledge. Ooh, that's interesting. Where, what are you going to say to me now? Got you. Who, me or you? Is it you? I think it's well, you. Well, what I'm going to say is, Paul, I'm starting to worry that you're Ralph Ellis and now you have a time-traveling <laughs> Jesus. And uh, we don't want to go down this route, okay? Uh, this leads to bad places. Oh, by bad the places. way, <laughs> by the way, remember when I, when I was challenging Ralph the first time when I had him on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, the whole uh, Isa thing. I, I showed him the Assessi thing, the, the pharaoh from Egypt. Mm -hmm. I found his tomb when I was in Egypt. Oh, 
Pharaoh Isesi. It's in Saqqara. Hmm. It's a little, little tomb outside of one of the pyramids. Little, if only little, I could have a little, little tomb. <laughs> yeah. So I was, I was right. It's not too far from Joseph's pyramid. It's that pyramid. But that, there was some crazy shit out there. But anyway, that's. I'm gonna. All right. I got videos coming on that, so let's 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 keep moving. Right. We have been doing this for a long time. Mm, yeah. Um, I do. Oh, let's see what else we got. There's a lot of comments. That's it. Okay, so. Cool. Um, that's the last super chat. Now, is there anything else that we didn't get into yet that you wanted to hash out? I think there's one last thing because when I split my blog up into sections discussing your video, I said, here are the stuff that's good. Here's the stuff that's kind of middling. The rank rabbit thing, about. right? The rank rabbit yeah. thing, right? And I was going to get to, yeah, the stuff that I thought was um, uh, poorly argued and was just not um, good. And yeah, was relating to how you were trying to approach the or critique the use of the rag, raglan uh, mythotype. So again, let's let the audience know what this is all about. What's a rank raglan? Can you buy that at Walmart? No. <laughs> so Ronk uh, is for Otto Ronk, who was an early um, mythology stu student who was also trying to use Freudian psychoanalytics to explain old myths. And uh, the Raglan part comes from Lord Raglan. And as the name suggests, English dude with tons of money so he can just sit around all day and read dusty books and come up with hypotheses. Uh, the thing is that these two guys, mostly separately then, were coming up with what they were seeing were patterns in the stories told by um, uh, great heroes from stories, especially from the ancient Mediterranean world. And the system in particular of these 22 features in common comes from um, Lord Raglan. He bases it primarily off of uh, King Oedipus. And in these 22 points, you have all these things that, you know, um, sometimes don't seem too incredible, like the person's father was a king. That's not too incredible. Uh, on the other hand, he was um, said to be the son of a god. Um, they had a mysterious death on top of a hill. It's things that start getting a little bit um, weirder and stranger. And the thing that Raglan noted was that this pattern of 22 points seemed to um, fit to a lot of different uh, figures. It you know not only fit well with the story of um, Oedipus Rex, but also for... Um, other various Greek gods like Zeus, uh, Dionysus, um, other uh, legendary figures like um, Pelops and so on. Uh, all these other mythical characters. Now, Raglan himself didn't apply it to Jesus. Later, um, uh, Folklorus did. And Jesus on this scale also scores super high. Basically, it's about as high as anyone else on the list. And so Carrier basically says, hey, this looks like an interesting pattern that if you look at all the folks who score at least half or score more than half of the points on this list, they all seem to be mythical. Jesus is in there as well. So this would put him in a pattern where Jesus would be exceptional. Therefore, this leads to uh, his prior probability of Jesus being historical to be low because he looks more like these mythical people rather than historical people. That's the basic outline premise of what the whole rank Raglan mythotype is supposed to be used in this argument. Now, right. uh, what Neil wanted to do was say, actually, there are historical people that meet more than half of the criteria, and therefore, Carrier's uh, uh, probabilities based on that are not justified. And then I pushed back because the sources that I found Neil to use were not reliable, and in some ways should have screamed out and said, this is not good. And the, the example that stood out the most to be ridiculous was the Trump um, one? yeah the Trump one Trump. because I, this I even said it, I even said the Trump one probably is debatable because I thought that yeah. one was kind of it was kind but, of but here's uh, the thing but, but here's the thing whether that's debatable and honestly it's not but we'll talk about that the fact that that is in that list and we are supposed to treat seriously the claim that Trump meets 20 of the 22 uh, criteria there that he actually meets all the criteria that Jesus did including Trump dying a mysterious death when the dude isn't even dead just should make you stop and say, wait a minute. All right. All this right. can't that be reliable. One, that one you got me on. Yeah. But Alexander the Great, Augustus, Napoleon, these are people who make who meet the requirements. Well, there are definitely things about, like, say, um, Caesar Augustus that are in the list, but he doesn't get more just than the half. Suetoni, just the Suetonius alone, I think you can get to half. I think mm -hmm. we can get there. Want to look at the list? 
Well, do you want to do... Actually, um, you were actually making well, the I, most hay about Alexander. So how about we stick with that? Because that's the one you all seem right, to... Alexander. Like Alexander. Okay. okay. Where's... Well, did you, can, you, can you just give me a li- the list? Let's go from 1 to 22. Yeah, let me see if I can 22. find it somewhat quick. I say somewhat yeah. quick because I don't have it's quick it's eyes. quick <laughs> off the top of our heads because I, don't, I really don't have time to... Yeah, I just we... Uh, doobie 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 doobie. This is what happens when you don't have the page open already. No, that's okay. Uh, take, your, take your time. Take your time. Uh, I just don't want to have well, a lot I, of dead air. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So, like I say, this thing is called the Rank Raglan Mythotype. So, those of you out in Radio Land can also um, Google or Wikipedia this so you can look at the list for yourselves to make sure that we're not just making things up. Well, I might be making up a little bit. Hint, hint. Uh, let's see. Page. Oh, I just looked at it. 229. Okay, start there. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay, so uh, here is the list. Uh, you'll find the list in different orders elsewhere, but here's the basic things. The 22 features are the hero's mother is a virgin, his father is a king or the heir of a king, the circumstances of a conception are unusual, he is reputed to be the son of a god, an attempt is made to kill him while he's a baby, to escape which he is spirited away from those trying to kill him, he is, regard, uh, he is reared in a foreign country by one or more foster parents. We are told nothing of his childhood. On reaching manhood, he returns to his future kingdom. He is crowned, hailed, or becomes king. He reigns uneventfully, that is, without wars or natural catastrophes. He prescribes laws, loses favor with the gods or his subjects. He is driven from the throne or city, meets with a mysterious death, dies atop a hill or high place. His children, if any, do not succeed him. His body turns up missing, yet uh, he still has one or more holy sepulchers. Uh, okay. Before take- let's, okay. Yeah, there's let's a few start with the first that. one. Let, let's start. do one at a time. First yeah. one is, say, say it again. Uh, hero's mother is a virgin. Now, this one I can say you can check. Because his mother doesn't have any children yet. Alexander's not born yet. She is impregnated by a miracle serpent that comes in her room and gets her pregnant. And then Alexander's is the son. I, I think you have a mir- I think you have a virgin birth here. You definitely have a birth that is uh, exceptional. So for example, criteria four, he's reputed to be the son of a God that his conception is unusual. Criteria three, he would meet those. He meets three and four, oh, but oh. one is specifically the mother's virginity. And that's never established. I don't think it is. I, I, but I, I wonder if, I wonder if you can, there's another text that says that she was a virgin before Alexander. None that I, I don't know think, of. I think she was. I, th- I don't think, I think he might not be the oldest though, actually. Let me just look this up. Yeah. I think he was, I think she, but, that's but the, the, case. the key thing though, is we need an actual declaration that um, Olympus, uh, 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 Olympias, um, Alexander's mother was actually a virgin before Alexander was conceived. Do you, do you really think that Philip of Macedon would wed uh, somebody who's not a virgin? Well, the key thing, though, is Philip could have had sex with her already at some point. That tends to happen on the wedding night in old cultures. Yeah, you're right. You'd think that would happen. But um... yeah, so okay, you don't let's... necessarily conceive the first time. And uh, as someone who's okay, wanting let's, to have kids, let's, say, uh, let's, cross, let's cross that one up. Okay, let's go okay. to the next one. All right. His father is a king or heir to a king. Oh, yeah, definitely. Philip of Macedon, check. king. There's yep, one. that's definitely a check. Uh, circumstances one. of conception are unusual. We definitely have stories about that. Yep. Two. Reputed to be son of a god. Absolutely. Three. Attempt is made to kill him when he is a baby. Um. Yes, four. Yes. Wait. Fact, I'll show it to you right now. Philip of Macedon does not want to have the child. He's going to kill the baby. He's going he's gonna to kill the baby. Until he gets an oracle from Amon that says, no, 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 no. This is God's son. I put him in here. Keep the child. And then he says, okay, I will. That's but in that's the text. Literally, but then that's literally Greek no Alexander attempt was romance. made. But no attempt was made then. But it's thought about. I mean, why don't, should we read the text? But here's the thing. Thinking about something isn't actually attempting it. And also, note the next criteria is... To escape, to escape the assassination attempt, he is spirited away from those trying to kill him. But no attempt is actually made to kill him, and he doesn't have to escape from it. I want to look. I want to go back to the text. There might be something in there that I'm not seeing right now that I've seen before. Yeah, I, 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 I remember che- what I you're talking about. But, but, but yeah, I but, think but I also, those off. Well, also, mind you, in 
um, the Alexander Romance. Philip in the is Alexander away. Romance. Yeah, in the Alexander Romance, Philip does not want to have the child because he thinks that she had the child through adultery. Mm-hmm. And then a miracle intervenes, and he says, "No, have the child." You know what I'm saying? And then mm-hmm. I, I'm not sure what happened. I can't remember. It's been a while since I read it, but there is but, something. There is something like that. The circumstances are certain like that. But there's no actual attempt to kill. I checked. Like nobody pulls on a knife. No one has to escape from this happening. Right. I mean, that's so specific, though. Yeah. But... Well, and well, that's why I say we want to actually follow these criteria as written. Okay, not but how, how do we stretch them? Right, but how does how does this happen with some of these other Oedipuses and stuff? Is it exactly the same way? Oh, actually, yeah, because um, Oedipus, he is originally going to be killed by his parents because of a prophecy, but instead um, they have him... Well, what they originally were going to do was they were going to have uh, Oedipus as a baby uh, live out in... be exposed to basically just die out in the wilderness, but he um, is actually discovered by a shepherd, and then the shepherd takes him in, so that way the child actually lives. That's actually what happens. Yeah, so is, is that an attempt, though? Or is that, yeah, yeah they, wanted the, they wanted the baby to die because they said there was a prophecy and they put the baby out to die of exposure. But isn't that not the same when Philip Mastodon wanted his baby to die? But here's the thing. They actually did put the baby out to die of exposure. They actually did attempt. I'm not... Okay, I'll go back and look at that again. But, yeah. um... Okay, let's um, and of course, if we want to really compare this to our friend JC, very direct attempt to kill Jesus by Herod the Great. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Let's keep going. What's the next one? All right, all right. So, um, to escape, he's spirited away from those trying to kill him. Like I said, that doesn't happen to Alexander. He's reared in a foreign country by one or more foster parents. No, he grows up in Macedon, his kingdom. Here, check this out, though. The Alexander Romance tells you the story from the perspective of Egypt, not Macedon. Egypt is the true home of Alexander. He's actually buried in the tomb of Nebo, who is his real father. It tells you that Ma- Philip Mastodon isn't the father, it's Nectanebo. Nectanebo gets kicked out of the land of Egypt and sent to Macedon to sort of like father the son. Mm-hmm. And bring. And then when, when Alexander returns back to Egypt, it says the prophecy of you will leave as an old man and return as a young man. So Philip is out. El- Philip becomes, or I'm sorry, Alexander becomes Nectanebo. He takes on the legacy of the, ne- of the last pharaoh of Egypt. Here's the thing. You're talking about legacies, but we're talking about what happens to Alexander himself. And no one says that Alexander is Nectanebo. Right, but he's not. Those aren't his. He's with. Philip is not his real father. He's he's basically spirited off to another land. But he's not. He uh, he. Mind you, but he's, Alexander but he, grows up in the same place he's born in Macedon. Right, but he's. Nectanebo, there was a prophecy in the beginning of the book. Is Nectanebo Alexander? Are they the same person? It is, it's, the, it's sort of a continuation of a, of a spirit. Yes. Then no. No. <laughs> That's not Alexander. That's Nectanebo. I get what you're Nect- saying. I get what you're and saying. Also but- in, in, I also checked in the story when Alexander learns this prophecy himself and looks at a statue of Nectanebo, he doesn't say, oh, that's me. He says, that is my real father. So he still identifies Nectanebo as a different entity than himself. Right, but the prophecy is about himself, though, which and was that originally case, if about you want Nectanebo. To argue that, though, if you want to argue that way, then you would be saying it's not Alexander who's reared in a foreign land. It's Nectanebo who's reared in a foreign land. Yeah, but when that, when Alexander returns to Egypt, he's returning home. So that was then counter the story of Nectanebo, not Alexander, because you're saying it, it is it is complicated. You're right. It's too. It's, it's not just complicated. complicated. It's just absurd because we're now saying one people is two people is one people, and this is not the Trinity. That is not what this criteria system is about. <laughs> well, that's how myths are written. So it might be how myths are written, but I'm just saying like how this arc of story works it's not that we're just going to take one person and then have a prophecy so that way they're actually another person as well they're two people at the same time all right what's the next one all right next one uh we are told nothing of his childhood that's also false we know quite a bit about alexander's childhood even in the alexander romance we learn about him taming horses we know about what he has yeah 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 um on reaching manhood he returns to his future kingdom well he doesn't return to it yeah he he returns he returns to Egypt. But he doesn't come to his future kingdom. But that's the whole point of the beginning of the story is to tell you that Alexander is an Egyptian. The whole but here's point. the thing. 
Alexander isn't an Egyptian. He's born See, in Macedonia. This is where we defer. We defer on some of these on these key details. That's why we're not getting. Well, this number. is just straight up factual. What story says that but Alexander he, was? He is. He gets what, buried in mind Egypt. you though. It says he returns. That's his kingdom. To, it says returns to. But that's the whole point of the prophecy. You but here's will the thing. leave as an old man and return as a young boy. But now this you're again claiming Nebuchadnezzar and Alexander are the same person, and that's absurd. I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is... You just did. Returns... You're saying what happens to Nectanebo is what happens to Alexander. No, well, I'm saying that Nectanebo sort of prophesies the coming of Alexander. Sort of well, prophesying like the coming of Alexander is it's not the same like a John, thing. It's sort of like a John the Baptist in a weird way. It's, like it's a forerunner. But that's still not the same thing as what's being said here. This is not Alexander returning to his kingdom. That's what, that's what the text is trying to say, though. That's what I think. It's definitely trying to be very pro-Egyptian. Absolutely. People who are but, watching this right now, go read the text and leave a comment. I, oh, by the way, when we're text. talking about the text, the Alexander Romance, Greek when Alexander we say you're Romance. reading the text, there is a really complicated manuscript tradition, but there is a good website that actually shows like the, the Greek yeah. version, oh, no. the Syriac no, get, version. Get, you can compare side by side. Get the Penguin, the Penguin edition. It tells you all the manuscripts in which... Even even the chapters you're on, it'll have an I or a J or an A, yeah. so you know where you know where you're at with the manuscripts. But yeah, yeah. But that's yeah. The, all the stuff that we've been discussing are from the earlier manuscript, by the way. All the stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but again, it is quick, uh, again worth noting. Nectanebo in the story is Alexander's true father. Yeah. But that means that Alexander is still born in Macedon, and that is where he grows up. And that is where he gets his kingdom. And then from there, conquers the rest of the known world. <laughs> True. But, you know, he, it's the, the legend is coming out of Egypt. It's a Ptolemaic. It's a Ptolemaic. That, that's irrelevant to what's actually in these criteria. We only need to stick with what actually so. are these points I don't here. think it is. I don't think it is. I think, I think that's a fair point. All right. I so. Do. Let's go right. to the next one. All right. So. Reaching manhood, crown. Okay, next one is he is crowned, hailed, or becomes king. Oh, that's a divin. That's a definitely a divin. <laughs> uh, he reigns uneventfully. Um, that's a fact. He only reigns for what? Not even a decade. Well, no, he says he reigns or... uneventfully without wars or national catastrophes. His entire oh, is that what it is says? War. Oh, yes. is that what it says? Okay, okay, yeah. you're right. You're right. Yeah, you're right. He prescribes laws. Yeah, I think so. As yeah, a king, he does. Yeah. Um, he loses favor with the gods or his subjects. Not really. No, um, his subjects though, because he does have, he does have a fight with his, one of his big, he has a falling out with one of his generals. He has to kill him by accident and then he mourns over him. He yeah. has a falling out. It's in Persia. And then but, his old people kill him because they're jealous of how he's treating the Persians instead of the Greeks. So he does have a falling out of his own people. That's a check mark. Yes. Wait, actually, wait, where does it say that Alexander was killed? Alexander gets poisoned. That's one of the allegations, yes, but that isn't that his subjects have turned away from him. That's some guy poisoned him. Sent by a Macedonian. Sent by, I can't remember the guy's name right now. Um, uh, it's coming to me. It starts with a C. Um, um, I'm not going to remember anyways, off the top of my head, but uh, it, here's a way of comparing, or here's a way of checking if he fits this criteria. Let's see how this originally applied to Oedipus Rex. In the story that we have... Uh because like, what, about, again, what about what about the um, what about the the big uh, when they turn on him in India when he wants to keep going and they all turn all his people turn on him, and but they still stick with him. They re, he he agrees to them to return to India, but they don't throw him into the Ganges River or something. Right, but he they still convince has... him to change his mind. That's very different than losing favor with the subjects. Yeah, but I think you could say with the people who. It just depends on how many subjects. It doesn't say how many subjects. Well, like I say, the best way of doing this is to compare how this happens in other myths that we're trying to say this fits in the criteria to. So again, this comes from the story of Oedipus Rex. And in that story, that because, um, spoiler alert, um, Oedipus Rex had uh, accidentally killed his father, married his mother, and had children with his mother, and the gods are sending plagues to Thebes, and eventually um, Oedipus has to abdicate the throne because he's discovered just what he did, and he's so distraught by it, and so... Um, that's how he loses favor with both the gods and his subjects and is no longer king of Thebes. So that's an example of losing favor with the subjects and the gods. That sort of thing doesn't happen to Alexander. He basically has his subjects until the day he dies. Yeah, but he does lose favor with Macedonian royals. That's who sends out to kill him. 
But that's not this. That's like, for example, that's not what happens with the Jesus story. That's not what happens with the Oedipus story. Uh, this criteria is much more. He loses favor not with like a couple dudes. This is the, basically he gets kicked out of office in a sense. I still think there's a case to be made there. I don't know. You you wouldn't want to make this so broad because anytime a person disagrees with you, you match the hero criterion. That's a stretch. <laughs> Yeah, but it's not that it's not a stretch though. He's being he's losing favor with the people who sent them on the road to begin with. But here's the thing though. That okay, let's put it this way. Uh Donald Trump probably has lost some favor with some of his fans, but I don't think you would say he has completely lost favor with his subjects. It seems like if he runs for president again, he's going to get the nomination. Some people have said no more to Trump, but that doesn't mean he's lost favor with his subjects by a long shot. Well, I guess we disagree on that one, but let's go to the next one. All right. So he's driven from the throne or city. No, he dies uh, in uh, Yeah, no, he, you know, he just, that's true. He doesn't get driven. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, he meets with a mysterious death. Not really, not like uh, it does for, like, say, Jesus, you know, dying on top of a hill with lightning or, like, with the Wait sun being blotted out and the moon turning to blood. Mysterious death is, a, is the definition of Alexander's death. He know. dies of poison. That's not a mysterious... Well, here's the thing. Again, let's compare this to other deaths. In particular, the mysterious deaths of people like Romulus or like Jesus, where... But they, they, he, doesn't know, he doesn't know how he dies. No, people don't know how he dies. Like I say, uh, never, the way of understanding this criteria is to see how it's being applied in the other places. And so, like, when Jesus dies, for example, like, the tombs open and dead saints come out, the sun stops shining, and uh, all these other super uh, miraculous things are happening. None of that happens with Alexander's uh, uh, death. I think there is something like that in in, in certain in, in some, one of the manuscripts. There is something like that. We can double check that later. Um, yeah. He, all right. Next criteria: like he dies atop a hill or high place. Not really. No. Uh, I'm not sure. I can't remember that part. I I, I don't I, I don't even have my own list here. Yeah. Best I remember, he literally dies in bed surrounded by his uh, generals. Well, he, you know, it's out in the open though. It's out in like the field. It's, it, it, yeah. If it's in the field, then definitely it's not on top of a hill. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't, I'm not really sure. Yeah, yeah. Death of um, his, is great. Okay, his children, if any, do not succeed him. That's true. His children don't become the next king. His body turns up missing. Uh, we know where his body goes eventually. You know, of course, it's stolen and such, but it ends up in Alexandria. Say that again. So the one of the criteria is his body turns up missing. We know his body gets oh, stolen. Oh, as, but... oh, yeah. This is this is check off automatically. No, his body goes. His body goes missing. His body is being sent back to Macedon, and then it gets rerouted down to Egypt. So they know exactly where it is, that it's not missing. But that's 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 literally like, that's the definition of his body's gone missing. If you know where it is, it's not missing. If I know where my keys are, they're not missing. <laughs> yeah, do you think the Macedonians knew where it was? Yeah, in Alexandria. That's where they was taken to. I don't think it was taken to Alexandria. I think it was taken somewhere else. I mean, else that's, I mean, that's like where like Julius Caesar came and things like that to pay homage to that's Alexander where, and his that, tomb. No, that's where it stays. That's where it does get eventually. Yeah, so it's not missing. Yeah, but it's not going to where it's supposed to go. That's not the same thing as it says. It says his body that's, turns up missing. That is gone. But it's not but gone. The, we know exactly where... How, the, the, the story tells us exactly where his body goes. All right, what happens to Oedipus then? Uh, with Oedipus, I forget exactly how he goes, but we definitely know how it goes for, say, Jesus. We definitely yeah, know how it goes know, for Romulus. You know, in this story, as you're reading the story, you know what happens to Oedipus. It's other people in this story who don't know what happens to Oedipus, just like in well, the actually, story of Alexander. Well, here's the just thing. Like the people in the story do know what happens to Alexander. They know his body is stolen and is took into Egypt. They don't know. And right we know away. from historical records where he had been for centuries, and people like Julius Caesar came to pay homage to his uh, grave. Yeah, that's after the war was fought. That's after it's but all said But here's the thing. Done. They're coming to his body where he was buried. Now, compare that to the empty tomb story for Jesus where oh, the body's but, just but, gone. Yeah, but you know, you want to know something even, even crazier? His body's missing right now. But it was not... Uh, here's the thing, though. At the time of the Alexander Romance, like where all these you know legends are being written up, that isn't part of it. When the Alexander but, Romance is written, it's the case that everyone knows where his body is. So you're saying it has to, what matters is after it's all said and done? We, we, here's That's the same how, thing. In the, what, what we care about are these read, stories. And in this story, uh, in like the Exiler Romance, they know where his body is. Read, read what the criteria says. just want to hear what it says. His body turns up missing. That's what happens. His body turns up missing. It doesn't say it's lost forever. When? 
No, but that's not what the criteria says. I don't his know. His body turns up at. missing. Yes, it's found later, but his body turns up missing when it's on its way to Macedonia. It doesn't go missing because, again, they know exactly where it is. It was stolen and taken by the Ptolemies to go to Egypt. That's not missing. That's taken. <laughs> but that's, you know, you can't know where exactly where something is if you don't have it in your possession. I mean, literally, they built a giant opulent tomb to hold Alexander for the whole world to see. This is where Alexander's yeah, body but that's, is. That's where he a whole ends relic. up. That's where he ends up, though. Which means it's not that's missing. Not... But now it is, though. So it doesn't matter. It's not missing the during point, the time no, of the these point, stories. The point I'm trying to make is... His body ends up missing for a period of time. Then it's found. That's not what it says. It says That's his body the, the goes criteria. missing. That's all it says. Right. His, body, his body goes missing. Turns up missing. That's what happened. But it didn't turn up missing. Oh, it gets found later on by the Ptolemies. It's, it's not found later. It's not like it fell off a, uh, the train and then somebody actually picked it up. It was stolen. It was always known where it was. I would check that one off. I don't know. Also, well, and here's the other thing. Again, let's compare this to all oh, the translation okay. stories. Yeah, let's compare... Well, let's compare like for it to Romulus other, other or for myths. Jesus or for Asclepius, yeah. where their bodies are translated to heaven. That's the body turning up missing. And then come back down sometimes. The body of, well, when, like, for example, Romulus comes, he's basically coming in some sort of heavenly being. And the other key thing is um, he, uh, so his body turns up missing. And this also relates to the next thing. Yet he has one or more holy sepulchers. So there's no body and yet there's a tomb for the body. That's true for Jesus. That ain't true for Alexander. No, Alexander has a tomb, yeah. And with a body in but, it. No, no, but he does get switched into another coffin. That's so some gets, sort of put, later legend to explain why the gets, body isn't known today. No, but I think there's a text. There's a, there's a, there's a uh, Alexander, or, um, Ptolemy text that talks about the tomb of Alexander being in Nectanebo's tomb. He got Whether that's true or not, it's still the case that there is a tomb for Alexander, and that's where his body was kept for centuries, where people came and visited and honored um, at the corpse of the hero. All right. Is it the last one? Uh, no, we still got a couple more, unfortunately. <laughs> um, right, go ahead. Before taking, uh, so I'll just go quickly. Before taking a throne or a wife, he battles and defeats a great adversary, such as a king, dragon, that's true. giant, or wild that's beast. That's true. That's uh, a that's a hundred percent fact about Alexander. He doesn't take a wife till he gets to um, till he gets to Bactria. That's where he takes his first wife, and he battles a dragon before that too. A dragon, well, literally. He literally battles a dragon. Well, this is saying before he takes the throne, he does the battle, uh, the dragon battling. Before he takes a throne or a wife. I'm gonna have to double check on that just because my memory is for, poor on there. But all right, last two criteria. What does it say? Simply... So just read it. Just read it again, real quick. Okay. All right. Yeah. Before taking a throne or a wife. He there you go. And Done. It's a great adversary. Check. Check. All right. Last two. His parents are related to each other. Not as far as I know. I don't know about he that. He marries either. a queen or princess related to his predecessor. No. No, because his predecessor would be. Yeah. No. Yes. His predecessor is Darius. He takes Darius' throne. Darius is related to uh uh this queen. Uh, what's her name? The queen of the. It's one of his like daughters, basically. So yeah, that's a uh, check. No, no, uh, Alexander. The only person he marries is Roxana, Roxanne, who's from Bactria. Roxanne. Yes, Roxanne. But if you look up, Roxanne. but she was a person. She was a Bactrian. She was from a different tribe. No, no, no. Hold, hold on a second. Hold on. Let me look this up. I'm pretty sure this is um, Queen Roxanne. I'm pretty sure she's related to uh, Darius. Well, actually, I'm going to read this more broadly because it says queen or princess related to his predecessor. Uh, maybe that predecessor can be also for other kingdoms he conquered. So I'm going to say, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty safe to say. Okay. So All if right. we go through and add things up of the things we agreed on, I think we're talking like 10 of the points. Well, we, did, we just agreed on a few, like four, I think. we. I think you and I were split on like four, at least. We didn't, we didn't agree on like four of those. Well, uh, that's why I said. I think the things we did agree on, it was something like 10. The ones we agreed on. But then there was yeah. four of them that I contested that I still think that I have pretty strong. But the thing is, well, none of, of the ones you have are factual. You have to, like, stretch these criteria and not really. the meanings of not, these things. Not my You opinion. kept saying, like, you have to basically have the story of Nectar Nebo become the story of Alexander and treat them as the same person. And I think that is definitely no, not no, fitting I, I ended up, I ended up taking that one off. I ended up saying, okay. let's go off. That, that right, was not well, one of the four. All right. That was so not one of the four that I was. To quickly go through the ones where we agreed on, 
Uh, father was a king. Yes. Circumstances unusual of his birth. Yes. Reputed to be son of a god. Yes. That's three. Um, then the next one we agreed on. Uh, da, 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 da. Reach. Uh, he's crowned uh, or hailed king. Definitely that. Um, prescribes laws. Yes. I th you know what? Fine. Let's just say you're right. There's ten. I don't even care because I, I Six. you know you know what all this is all of this talk is just and I, I even said this in my video. All all the, the only thing that really matters to me is that humans who live get mythologized. Mm -hmm. It's not abnormal. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. Now, you, if you want, and if you want to say that Rank Raglan is a is very specific on certain things, you're right. Sure, you're right. Very specific. You could also make a list of very specific things about failed messianic leaders, like mm -hmm. Simon of, of Perea, Judas of Galilee, and I could put Jesus finally on that list, and then I would take all these other myths like Dionysus off that list. You could do that too, right? So but then we the have to actually do the counts. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. And so, but I'm saying we'd actually is, have to do those counts and actually then compare. But right now, we're just saying we could do this. We need to actually do this. And so, for example, right. what Kerry has actually done is actually done the count. And here's the thing he noticed is that we have like, um, we're just looking at his book here. Yeah, he has 15 examples of mythical people that mate more than half of these criteria, and there are no historical people with more than half. And that's right, an interesting that's result. Sweet. And well, I think there's, I think there are some people. I, like I said, I think Alex. Well, the thing is, though, the and... source you used, unfortunately, is utter garbage. And I have to be explicit about that because the person who is giving that to you cannot tell the difference between actual scholarship and parody, who is telling you that somehow a living person had a mysterious death, who literally went and took a book written by the same person who writes a hagiography uh, as a joke for Kim Jong Un, is also telling us that Jesus or that Trump is actually Jesus, even though that's not even what the book says. You just have to say, okay, this person does not provide reliable information. If you want to say anyone does meet more than half these criteria, well, you're going to have to do your own research. You can't trust this person. I want, I want to, I want to, I want to talk to that person again just to hone in on some of these. Yeah. Get some, maybe, maybe there's some information that I'm not looking at. But like maybe you're thing, as I pointed out though, this person literally cited parody scholarship to prove that Abe Lincoln was fitting all these criteria. Yeah. That is not a reliable source for someone who literally hasn't checked to see that something is parody. Yeah, but Abraham Lincoln was mythologized. Not to the level that he fits all 22 criteria. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not. No, 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 he didn't. I mean, that's the thing. Literally, if like I had to read what this source... Okay, so again, I mentioned this in my blog. I have links to it so people can look this up. Uh, this was a pamphlet written by a person named Francis Utley in the 1960s, if memory serves. And yeah, he's basically Zuby, yeah. showing that if you were a folklorist at that time and you were using these criteria way too slipperly and making them overly expansive, then you end up arguing that Abraham Lincoln was a myth. And this falls into a tradition of other scholars showing if you use these sorts of uh, connections uh, and do this sort of parallelomania, then Napoleon was a sun god and never existed. And you get absurd conclusions like that. The whole point of that was to show if you do crap folklore studies, these are the results you get. So to take someone and say, don't do crap folklore studies to prove here's what folklore studies actually show means you haven't checked the source or understood it. Yeah. And that's a well, big failing of any sort of scholarship. If you literally don't read the source you cite and then say it claims these amazing things. Yeah, I don't really care about Ray Franklin. I think it's a dumb. I just think it's, I, I just wanted to make the point that people. Well, no, no, it's, it's not dumb. It's actually used in folklore studies. Yeah, no, I'm sure, I'm sure it is. I'm sure so, it is. so I don't know why you called it dumb. Well, my whole point was that humans get mythologized. But the, the key thing, though, and the whole reason this even mattered is the observation that, yes, humans do get mythologized, but when it comes to that level on the scale to be that high, there aren't any other actual humans that high on the scale. And that is... But it's not, it's not impossible that someone can be that mythologized. Well, and the, oh, with, that's not the claim. The case that it's of, with the case of a guy who has... Not just four gospels, but like extra tens and dozens of gospels written about him. Yeah. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that he makes the list. Compared well, here's to the thing, else. though. He would be the only human ever to have done it. And it makes sense. It, it, well, I, I seriously doubt that. To make, well, to no, that's the key thing. That there aren't any other counterexamples from all these stories from antiquity of a historical person getting uh, more than half of these points. And that's the thing that's interesting. 
like I said, I still think Alexander and uh, Augustus both make that list. Well, we just talked about Alexander, and the most you agreed with was ten points, and that's not more than half. No, I think I had fourteen. That was my that was my number. 14. That was your count, but we also but you also said you retracted a whole bunch of them. Uh, do, I, do you really want to go over it real quick? Because I'm pretty sure I have at fourteen. <laughs> you uh, you let's had just, fourteen in your video, yes. But then you just also said you retracted. No, 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 a bunch no. no, no. Let's let's go through it right now. Just go through number. Tell me which one. <sighs> Ready? Just go. What, just start from the beginning. Let's go to the end. That's why I think this is the last thing we're doing. Then I gotta go. All right. Mother is a virgin? No. No. Father is king or heir of a king? Absolutely. Yes. Circumstances one. unusual of his birth? Yes. Reputed yes. to be the son of a god? Yes. Attempt yes. made to kill him while, while he's a baby? None. I said yes for this one. You said yes, but there's no actual example. Well, I think his, his father doesn't want to have him. This is factual. There is no attempt on his life. Well, this is why I said you, you think there's 10. I think there's 14. I'm, that's all I'm trying to do. This is, is a factual you. statement. Did someone try to kill Alexander? Like, actually try? He thought about it. Did he try? I'd say, yeah. So thinking about it is the same as doing it? I mean, he had to, he had to have an angel. He had to have but a God come and tell but him. But then he didn't do but it. But he, he had to have a God tell him not to do but it. But he didn't do it. The criteria well, is an attempt is made I, I got, on his life. I'm going to read the text. Want to read the text? It doesn't matter what the text says if he's not actually attempted to be killed. Yeah, but it sounds pretty bad to me. It but like it's not the same doomed. thing. You, this is like I say, this is the example of what happens with the crap folklorists that other people are saying you can't do this to the criterion and expect there to be useful results. And yeah. let's also put it another way. In a court of law, thinking about violent things and attempting to do violent things are very different. <laughs> yeah. If I'm angry with someone, that is very different from me actually trying to attack them with a knife. So one day, Olympias' belly grew until one day she said to Nectadebo, what shall I say if Philip comes home and finds you pregnant? Have no fear, queen, replied the wizard. Amon will come to your aid in the following way. He will appear to Philip in a dream and relate to him all that has occurred so that Philip will not be able to make any accusation against you. In this way, Olympias was taken in by magic powers of Nectanebo. Then Nectanebo took a seahawk, cast a spell on it. He instructed it in all things he wished to tell Philip. And when it was fully prepared by his by black art, sent it off to, to fly to Philip. The seahawk came by night to where Philip was and spoke to him in a dream. When Philip saw the hawk speaking to him, he woke up in a great disturbance of mind at once uh, for a certain Babylonian dream interpreter who had a good reputation and described apparition. Uh, I saw in a dream some god of great physical beauty with gray hair and gray beard, and he had horns on his temples, which looked as if they were gold, and in his hand he held a scepter. I saw him go into my wife Olympias by night and lie down with her and make love to her. Then the god stood up and said, Woman, you have conceived a male child who will make you fruitful and avenge the death of his father. Then I saw myself sewing up her body with papyrus fibers and sealing it with my own ring. The ring was of gold with a stone in it, and the stone was engraved with, with the sun, a lion's head, and a spear. While I watched this, I seemed to see a seahawk standing beside me who roused me from the sleep with the beating of his wings. Tell me, what does this signify? Long live King Philip, the dream interpreter replied. What you saw in the dream is true. The sealing up of the body of your wife is a reliable sign that she is pregnant, for no one seals up an empty vessel, but only one that has something in it. As for your... As for your sewing up her with papyrus, papyrus grows nowhere but in Egypt. The seed then is of Egyptian origin. See? And not mm -hmm. Hubble, but glorious and great fame, as the gold ring indicates. For what is more glorious than gold, and what we can make honors the gods? And the seal portraying the sun, the lion's head, and the spear shows that the child will fight against the peoples like a lion. Damn, this is long. <laughs> and then it says, uh, I'm trying to find out what, where Philip's reply is. Some days later, Philip said, Philip said to Olympias, you were deceiving me, wife. You were not ravished by God, but some other. You may be sure he will not escape me. Nectanebo took, took due note. Soon there was a great feast in the palace, and everyone was celebrating with Philip the king's return. Only King Philip was cast down because of his wife's pregnancy. Suddenly, Nectanebo turned himself into a serpent larger than the previous one, and crept into the dining room, hissing in a most fearsome way, so that the very foundations of the palace shook. 
When those who were dining with the king saw the serpent, they leaped from their palace in fright. But Olympias, who had recognized her special lover, extended her right hand to him. The serpent raised himself up and placed his head, his head on her lap. He coiled himself and lay on her knees, popping his forked tongue in and out to kiss her, which the onlookers took as an indication of the serpent's affection for her. Philip was at the same time annoyed and amazed and could not take his eyes off the apparition. Suddenly, the snake changed into an eagle and disappeared. No one could say where. When Philip had recovered from his shock, he said, Woman, I have seen a sign from, of the gods' concern for you, for he came to help you when you were in danger. But I still do not know which god this is, for he appeared to me in the form of Amon, Apollo, and Asclepius. He made it clear to me when he lay with me, Olympias replied, that Amon is the god of all Libya. Then Philip congratulated himself on the god's favor since the offering of his own wife was to be of a god. Sounds like he was pretty pissed off when he was ready to do something. He said, save me. He said, save wait, me. Wait, 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 wait. Nowhere in there you said that Philip was even angry and was going to attack Olympia, let alone Alexander as a baby. What do you mean? He just said. He just said. Woman, I have seen a, I've seen a sign of the gods concern for you. For he came to help you when you were in danger. And where did it say that actually anyone was going to be attacking Alexander? There was no statement in anything no, you read. You, I just whole, said. You, you just said like three pages and nothing said there was an attempt it on says, Alexander's life. It's not a statement. I re I'll read it again. Some days later, this is after that apparition, mm -hmm. Philip said to Olympias, you were deceiving me. Wife, you were not ravished by a god, but by some other. And you may be sure he will not escape me. Who he, is he? He changed his mind. Where, where, where did it say in there that there is an attempt on Alexander's life? Nothing you read is even related to that. Yeah, but she's, he's inside of her. He's, a, he's in her womb. And so there's no attempt made on either Olympias or on the fetus. So there's no attempt in this story on Alexander's life. Well, I see it. I see it that way. I think it's pretty clear. Where? Where did it say there was even an attempt? He literally tells her that you're deceiving me through through trickery and magic. And then he says, and a couple paragraphs later, wow, the gods really have your back because you were in danger. That's pretty Where clear. Where did it say there was an attempt on anyone's life? Whatever. Where does it say I, it? I, I just told you. I just you didn't. You. Not anywhere. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. No. Nowhere. Not in a single place was there even a saying that he was going to do anything violent. The I, only I violence that actually being talked about, the only person that talked about being clear. in danger. I think it's pretty clear. He gets an apparition. He rejects it. Then thinks it's her. Then tells her she's in danger and that God saved her. This actually sounds much more like the story with Joseph and Mary. Were you say Joseph was trying to kill Jesus? No, because Joseph never said that you're, you were in danger and God saved you. But he was upset and he was going to divorce his wife until he got an apparition. But this never sounds said much that. more in that category. <laughs> okay, fine. It's like Jesus. Does that refute my point at all? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, because the Whatever. criteria is there's an attempt on his life as a baby. And heck, in this story, it's also worth noting, the attempt is made on when he was a baby Alexander's not even born yet. He's in the womb, so. As I say, if I'm saying what this is saying, there's an attempt on him as a baby, and Alexander's not even born. It's not even possible to have an attempt on his life, and nowhere in there does it say Philip is going to, like, take out a knife and attack uh, Olympias or the fetus or the future child. The only person who some, the, there's an explicit, like, um, threat towards was the person who impregnated Olympias until the discovery that this was actually some sort of magical being. Well, I put that's that literally one on what you there, just so. read. I put that one on there easily. I... I think you're just making the criteria because this is literally the case. There's no baby being attacked. There's no baby even there to have an attempt on the life. You have a fetus in danger. Didn't even say that. Big time. Didn't yes, say that does. even. No, not Whatever. at one. Not any point that you read. Show All me where right. it says I, the fetus I was can't, in danger. I can't. I'm, I'm getting, we get, let's go to the next one. All right, all right. Okay, so uh, we just talked about trying to kill. Uh, to escape to escape the murder attempt, he is spirited away from those trying to kill him. That doesn't happen. 
reared in a foreign country by one or more foster parents. No, he he's grows up in his home country. His of seed, well, his seed is from from Egypt, and he returns home later on. It says he is reared in a foreign country. Alexander is a Macedonian. He born in Macedon, and he grows up in Macedon. That's not that's not what the myth says, though. The myth says he's an Egyptian seed born. Egyptian it's, seed. It says he's reared in and a foreign country. And then he returns country. home. Those are the last two that I. Those are the last two that we disagree on right there because they connect. He here's returns home Again, to Egypt. Here's how we can tell how this is different. That's why I have compare. 14. You have 10. I just figured it out. That's why. Well, here's the thing. Again, let's actually compare. Let's compare this to other stories. When it comes to the story of Oedipus, he is the supposed to be the heir to the throne of Thebes. He is then set out to die of exposure in the wilderness. A shepherd comes along and takes him and he grows up in a different um, city state. So that's him being reared in a foreign country by foster parents. If we compare that to Jesus, he has to basically escape to Egypt um, and grow up there for a while until he can return back to um, Israel. But even then he has to go to Nazareth before he can finally come to Jerusalem. According, let me ask you this, according to this story, is Philip of Macedon the father of Alexander the Great? No. So he's a foster parent. Right. It says he's raised by foster parents in a foreign country, but that's not what happens. He's he, when, he, when he goes back to Egypt, he's told that he's returning home as a young man. Where was he born? Where was Alexander he's, born? He's born in Macedon. Where does he grow up? In Macedon. So he's reared in the same place he's born. But his seed comes out of Egypt, though. That his doesn't count with this Egypt. criteria. It says you're born, you're raised in a foreign country. You're raised in a different mm -hmm. place than you were born in. Yeah, but I think what the text is trying to say is that he's from. Don't Egypt. tell me what it's trying to say. This is what the story actually no, says. That, no, but this matters because that's why that's why they have the funeral games. The Ptolemies are trying to make claim what that they does have... the story say? Do not make it the say story, something else. The story says that he's the Egyptian. Does it say he was raised in a country different than where he was born? Well, it says that he's raised in a, in a country that's not where he's from. He's an Egyptian. Where did he, what, where was he born? He's, he's, he's born as a baby in Macedon. And where does, he, uh, where does he grow up? In Macedon. So he's reared in the same place he was born, not a foreign country. But that's, that's, that's not his true home, though. According to this There's story, nothing not in here home. about true homes. He is raised yes, in the same place he's born. That's the whole point of the story is that he's an Egyptian. It doesn't matter what that story is. It's what the criteria are. Well, that's okay. That's Again, what here's the different examples. Again, with um, Oedipus, he's born in Thebes, but he grows up in the countryside in a different place. Egypt, or sorry, uh, Jesus, he's born basically outside of Jerusalem, but he has to basically grow up first in Egypt and then later in uh, the Galilee before he returns to his kingdom in Jerusalem or the Jerusalem area. That's examples of someone who is reared in a foreign country. They were born someplace and then because of their need to escape as an infant, like um, uh, Oedipus had to, like Jesus had to, they are then being raised in some other country than from where they came from. Now, what was the other one that you disagreed with me on that I said that was an easy check? Uh, let, let's get through the rest and then we'll see. Because right now I counted right. three. Um, we are told nothing of his childhood. That's not going to work. Um, no, I didn't, reaching, I didn't say that. No. Yeah. Uh, on reaching manhood, he returns to his future kingdom. He doesn't return I to it. I said he did. But he... I think, he, I think he returns he, to his original home in Egypt. Where was he born? For, where was he born? It doesn't matter. It says he's where was he born? It says his seed was Egyptian. Where was he born? Where was he born? He, Macedonia is, means nothing to the story. Yes, it is, because that's where he's born. That's not what, this, that's not what the romance is He is born, he grows up, and he inherits the throne all from the same place, Macedon. And then when he goes to the Oracle of Siwa in the desert of Egypt, he's told that he's the son of the God, and he's in his mm -hmm. true home. His home, okay, but this is saying... He returns to his future kingdom. Guess what? Well, Alexander can't return to his kingdom. He had never been to Egypt before that. This is returning from the place the, he was kicked but it out. But text actually gives you a prophecy explaining that. But that's not Alexander. That's Nectanebo. Nectanebo is not Alexander. But it's just, whatever. All right. It's the They're seed. not the same it's person. The They're not the, the same person. I didn't say it was the same person. It's, but it's you require prophetic. it to be. You it's require mythology. It. It's but that's not the story. The story isn't the, him being Nectanebo. But the prophecy says 
You will leave as an old man. You will leave as an old man. Did Alexander ever leave Egypt as an old man? Indeed, that's why it's not no. actually Alex. That's why Jesus. Right. That's why Alexander and Nectanebo aren't the same person. Right, but it tells he tells Alexander, "You will leave as an old man and return as a young man." Are he you saying left. Alexander is Nectanebo? No, I'm saying it's it's mythology. Then the prophecy is either wrong or it's metaphorical. No. It's metaphorical, exactly. Exactly, which means in the story, Alexander doesn't actually return to his kingdom. All right. Let's go to the next one. All right. Um, he is, uh, let's see. He is crowned, hailed, or becomes king. Oh, definitely. <laughs> That's a given. Yeah. Uh, he reigns uneventfully. I would say no. He's got lots of wars through his whole career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. Uh, prescribes laws. Yeah. Yes. Loses favor with gods or his subjects. No, he basically his is subjects. ruling until the end. Yeah, but he loses favor with his subjects. When do his subjects kick him out of the throne? Well, he loses favor with his greatest, one of his greatest allies, and One subject is not all his subjects. It's not. And then he gets the poison. And then he gets poisoned by the Macedonian royals. Well, here's the thing: if somebody goes and poisons uh, Joe Biden right now, does that mean the Democrats are against Biden, or one it means person somebody lost favor? It means someone lost favor with Joe. Someone, Biden. Someone, but that's not the same thing as losing but control. That's not, of your it doesn't say how many. It just says his subjects. But here's the thing: he doesn't lose favor with his subjects. He is still the king until the day he dies because of poisoning, allegedly, at least. This is probably why so many people have problems with Rank Radling, because it's you can you can interpret things differently. No, no, this is us being strict and literal. Well, that, well it's only if strict, we're being hyper flexible. Can we fit anyone strict, in? Where is the strict and literal when we're reading Origin? Well, all of a sudden we're interpreting Origin how we want, but when it comes Here's to the this, thing. We just, the whole point of this criteria is for us to see factually which points do people meet and which points do they not meet. This is a straightforward right. factual question. But when you have your own your own people sending for you to get killed because you are now ruling in favor of Persians and not Macedonians anymore. You've lost favor with your subjects. Did he lose the throne? Was he, he kicked killed. off the throne? He, did, he gets killed. He gets poisoned. And is that because his subjects now want him gone or because one person tried to do a power grab? That's not the same. No, thing. it's not just one person. It's a well, we don't know from the story, period. do we? We just, in fact, we don't even know if he was poisoned. That's just one of the allegations. That's why it's a mysterious death. He uh, just walked right the into the that mysterious one. deaths. Well, we'll get to that, but that's actually about supernatural events at the death. But that's not what it says. It just says mysterious death. It doesn't and say it has to at, be magic. Here's the thing. Again, what you can do to s interpret these points is to actually see how are they actually applied. When this is why, this Jesus is why dies, I really don't. This is, very, this is why I think Rank Ragnar is not the greatest. And but it's commonly, it's, wait, 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 hold on. Remember before you said you wanted to stick with the consensus? Well, folklorists use this. Right. And that's what I'm saying. And I, I, I think that there's a good case for 14 of these easily. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. You just said you wanted to crap on the rack rattling criteria altogether. And now you're backing up and saying, oh no, but Alexander fits this. You are now trying to go back and forth and no, switch goals. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is rank raglan is it's very specific. And yeah, Jesus finds on that list because Jesus has so many myths written about him that it's, he, it's, he's the most, most mythologized person. Now ever. you're moving the goalposts again. Why no, is it though? No, I'm not. No, you know, no, you're trying to explain away why is Jesus up there, which is still the fact that only Jesus makes it in this list and it's supposed to be historical. I don't think he's, I don't think he is the only person. But we haven't found an example yet. I just, I just gave you my, you just, you just, and you I've just been pointing out over agree. and over again, you're factually wrong. Oh, no, not. Absolutely. You told me there's an attempt on Alexander's life as a baby. You showed me not a single example. You didn't even show me Alexander as a baby. In your story, Alexander isn't even born. How can there be an attempt on a baby who's not a baby yet? He's a fetus. He's in the mother's womb. Not a baby then. And there's no attempt on his life. There's right. no one saying, I'm going to kill you. There's no attempt. It's just, I just think it's funny how you, you, you're sticking to very specific details when it comes to this. But other texts, we could just... It's, we can interpret it and fudge the numbers a little bit. Well, here's the thing. I'm actually trying to be strict on these criteria and the other places. I'm looking at what is the total evidence for what was actually like original to the text. And every time I have tried to bring up evidence to my point. Right. And I think when he returns to eat, when he gets to Egypt and he's told by the God of Egypt that I'm your father, this is your kingdom. I think that's that checks that box. 
You don't think so for whatever reason. I think it does. Again, how can he return to Egypt if Alexander's never been to Egypt before? He's the Egyptian seed. It tells you that. Is Alexander born in Egypt? He's not. I told you. We already went over. So he never over. returns to Egypt. He first comes to Egypt. All right. Well, let's let well, we've already we went around this so many times. <laughs> the people can decide what they think about this. Okay. Uh, but here's the thing. We're, we're not going to agree. This should don't be agree straightforwardly and factual. I think it is. And here's the thing. I don't actually find other folklorists also giving these high scores to Alexander when I've checked. I don't. Okay. So, again, if you're trying to say, well, here's what the evidence is, or you're wanting to go into the consensus of the experts, but I'm also pointing out the experts use this criteria that you occasionally just start shitting on. And other experts, when they look at this, they don't actually say Alexander is uh, this high up on the scale as your alleged. What, like who? Well, in particular, when I pulled this from the um, work of Alan Dundas, who was the first person I remember learning about the Rank Wrangling criteria, he was a folklorist, I think, at Berkeley, um, wrote a couple different books, you know, including ones on the Bible, and he also started applying the Rank Wrangling uh, criteria to Jesus. And right. in that list of things, he was saying, like, yeah, here's all these gods and heroes, but uh, um, I don't remember the, how far up Alexander was up on that list, but he wasn't that high up on the list, and he definitely wasn't as high as Jesus. Well, I didn't say he was. Yeah, I understand that. But like I say, uh, and I also remember that the whole point of like some of the parodies that I've mentioned about people overstretching the criteria or the sources they try to use to make people fit this criteria, those were supposed to be examples of bad folkloric studies. That the folklorists are basically saying, if we're crap in our using our criteria, we're going to get ridiculous and unuseful results. So we need to be more careful about how we actually are doing this counting, and we should be more strict and methodical in our methods, rather than what sorts of ways can we stretch these things to actually fit the criteria. Well, yeah, I would say the same thing about every other point mythicists make about stretching facts and data. and. Well, in that the, case, don't try to do the same thing to try to make Alexander fit something he doesn't fit. I, I don't. I think it's, I think it's solid. He doesn't I, I'm return at, to Egypt. I'm looking that's at what a fact. The, I'm looking at what the text says. And, and he I'm never returned at, to Egypt. That's a fact. Straight up fact. Well, well that's where that's what the prophecy says, so it's mythology. Does he actually return to Egypt? Does he actually return to Egypt? Well, if you go with the prophecy, yes or no. Yes, yes or no. If you go with the prophecy, yes. No. Because that's, that's what the prophecy not, says. Then why, would say, then why, would, it, why would it say he's returning as a young man? He's returning as vengeance for Mnectonebo. It's not literal. Exactly. That's so why are you taking point. something not literal and saying it's factual? Because it's mythology. And this is saying none, none what actually literal. happens to the person. This is not what happens to Alexander. All right. All right. So I really got to get going. It's real late now. Okay. And, uh, I, all right. I think the entire audience might be also burned out, but uh, yeah. uh, maybe we should do some quick closing statements to make sure that uh, yeah, we don't yeah, want to yeah, reach yeah. each other's throats out. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, man. Yeah. All right. All right. So <sighs> look what mythicism is doing to us. <laughs> this is a lot, whole lot of hot air to basically even argue about each and every one of these points and all this sort of debate. Now, I think, of course, having some steam in these debates is reasonable. And also notice that we have not attacked each other in character or anything like that. I hope that we have felt that we've been just attacking ideas, not persons, right? Yeah. And that should be us doing our best here. There's going to still be plenty of heat trying to make this argument. But that's as you can see, to that's... make these arguments you one can't... way or the other takes a lot of detailed analysis, um, a lot of study, and... No one should be convinced one way or the other about Jesus being historical or not in one, even three plus hour video stream. <laughs> right. We have a lot of research for us all to do. And my big challenge isn't to say mythicism is so obviously right that everyone who disagrees with me is a liar or a lunatic or anything like that. My argument is historicity needs to, I think, respond to the best arguments out there. And in doing that process, it will not simply throw away mythicism. What it will do is make a better historicity. And if Bible scholars can't do that, then we should be 
treating mythicism as a much more plausible hypothesis than what other Bible scholars have done thus far. So my ultimate argument is we should be having the argument and treating it seriously because one way or the other, we're going to either come to the conclusion that we can't know or we're going to come up with an even better version of what is the best theory we can achieve. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm actually going to agree with you on that. I think mythicism should have a place in the, in the conversation. It's just, um, it just needs to keep, let people, let, let people have their, their opinions. Otherwise, like it's not, there's no conspiracy. It really isn't like there's no conspiracy. Like no, nobody's like getting paid by Catholics universities to make sure Jesus is a guy like, I don't know, people might think that or not, but with that being said, though, I'll admit this, and I've always pointed this out, I've always pointed this out, that a lot of people really do shit on mythicism as like it's some crazy conspiracy theory. It's very possible that there no, was no God. Like, that needs to be admitted by pretty much everybody. There's no physical evidence. There's nothing he wrote down. In fact, you got people in the region during that time period, writing about the same topics, who don't even know who Jesus is. It does, it's like it's not there yet. So that alone, sorry, I'm starting to get all, like, I just feel my, you know, I'm getting tired. But um, oh, yeah. that alone, that alone is enough for somebody to really take this seriously, I think. Like I used to, like I said, I used to be a mythicist. I, 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 I think it's more likely that this came from somewhere. Something happened, and this all got mythologized. I just think that's the very likely scenario. Nothing, nothing supernatural about it. I'm not, I'm not just agreeing with the text or just blindly accepting faith or anything like that. I'm just going with people who have been doing this for way longer than me, who have way better credentials than me. I'm just going with what they say. And I'm listening to what they're saying. I'm not just accepting it. They do make sense. So try to try to listen to some other perspectives trying to find the one scholar with the phd with the who got peer reviewed for some a couple things here and there and just refer to him for everything get some outside opinions that's all and, and then i think at that at that point we can have better discussions like this oh i just agree you, you should know. be only listening to me and everything i say <laughs> right but um yeah i'm interested to see what happens with after you do, what, so when are you, what are you doing next now, you said? Yeah, so um, I'll be heading to SBL. I'm flying out next week. Um, I'll be giving a paper related to the interpretation of the heavenly woman in Revelation 12. It's very similar to a talk I actually did on uh, Gnostic Informant, what, nine-ish months ago? Uh, you know, in, in another sort of antiquity, <laughs> YouTube antiquity, I guess. And it will be arguing that um, there is a better approach of how we can actually derive this story from Old Testament, Testament, uh, Old Testament scripture reading and can help advance the field in understanding where some of the more mysterious imagery from Revelation comes from and make it just a tiny bit less myster mysterious. Yeah. Revelation is, you know, I used to think Revelation was so weird and pagan. And then I started getting into the pseudopigrapha text. And all the um, sibling, Christian sibling oracle stuff. And that, yeah. like, okay, it fits in great with that stuff. Oh, yeah. Like that's, it's coming out of that vein of thought. Oh, so yeah. yeah. When you first read it and, you, you know, you're seeing all these, like, animal faces floating around and things like that. And you're just like, where are these drugs coming from? Because you're not going to even find those in California. But then you realize, oh, these are just a hundred thousand different allusions to the Old Testament or other uh, myths going on in Jewish Christian circles at the time. And it goes from... You know, what's he smoking to? Oh, okay. I don't want to smoke it, but at least know what's going on now. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, but there are still but, some mysteries in a lot of, uh, there are still mysteries in Revelation, and I'm going to try to add my tiny bit to help resolve them. I'll be looking forward to that. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I don't think there's any more super chat after that. So we're ready to rock. And I've had fun. I like these, I like these debates. I wish I, you know, was felt, felt more hydrated, but uh, I'm, we're good though. So, uh, thanks for coming on here, and uh, you have just attained true gnosis.
you have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. Today I'm joined by Chrissy Hansen, and she has her Twitter link in the description. You can follow her, but today our topic is the history of mythicism. We're always talking about mythicism. We're always battling in the trenches. Is it real? Is it true? Is he historical? Is he a myth? We never get into like how this word mythicism came about. Who was the first person to be a mythicist? Were people mythicists right away? Were the Roman pagans like, nah, this dude didn't exist? Or was this something that happened later? And Chrissy has been look, looking into this. In fact, you, when you were on Myth Vision a long time ago, before I even knew Derek, when I was just a fan watching Myth Vision, you were on his channel and you were you were recommending books about like James Frazier, for example, a couple other ones. And I actually went out and bought those books and read them. And I was, and I just, I learned so much. You are a resource for knowledge. Like you are like a, a, I consider you sort of like a teacher, even though you're not teaching like professionally, I consider you very much a, uh, an educator in these fields. And I appreciate that. So without with that being said, well, I'll shut up and let's get into this, the history of mythicism. I can't wait for this. Let's get into it. Yeah. So hi all. Uh, I'm Chrissy Hansen. Uh, I research mythicism for the fun of it. I'm one of the only people that I'm aware of that uh, does any um, substantial research on the topic anymore. Um, a number of people, you'll always find like references to it in like little handbooks and stuff. So, you know, you'll find Typical little histories and, in, for instance, um, Did Jesus Exist by Bart Ehrman. Uh, there's not a, a whole lot in there. And it's unfortunately kind of startling because when you go and read his book, he's like, I don't need to give a full account of the history of G uh, history of mythicism. And then he the account he gives is fairly inaccurate. Like, um, So everyone usually has this idea that mythicism starts in like the 1700s with uh, Constantin uh, Volney and Charles Dupuis out in French, and it's loosely tied to the French Revolution, um, which is not the case, actually. Uh, uh, what I ended up doing is I ended up uh, deciding to do a whole bunch more research on uh, deist movements specifically, um, because I figured if there's going to be any more mythicists around earlier than that, we'd have to go and look at the early opponents of Christianity, those people who are going around and fighting uh, Christians, fighting oh, like, did God exist or what kind of God existed, when, where, etc. Um, and so I started looking at deists um, and those who were accused of being deists. Um, one thing to also keep keep in mind is that a lot of the people who are usually accused of being deists aren't actually deists. It was just a stock polemic that was often thrown around. So um, I ended up tracing mythicism back long before the French Revolution. Um, long before people like uh, Bart Ehrman tra trace it, occasionally you'll find references uh, to like Lord Bolingbroke, for instance. Um, 
this is in, around the 1750s and Lord Bolingbroke had some followers who apparently decided that Jesus didn't exist and they part of their argument was based on the fact that the genealogies for Jesus in Matthew and Luke are completely uh, inconsistent and cannot be reconciled with each other. Um, and comparing the gospel accounts, it's like you cannot make these mesh at all. Um, and so eventually they came to the conclusion that Jesus didn't exist. And they presented these uh, findings to um, Voltaire. Voltaire then referred to them as more ingenious than learned. Uh, he he didn't have he didn't think very highly of them. He did he thought that Jesus existed, but he was definitely skeptical of the Christian miracle claims about him and everything like that. Yeah. Um, usually in the mythicist debate, the earliest reference you'll try that people will try and come up with for a mythicist text is the um, reference to you invent a Christ for yourselves by Trifo in the dialogue with Trifo written by Justin Martyr. Mm. Um, the comment is completely taken out of context and it, there's a similar content he, or co comment he makes later on uh, which clarifies this. Uh, Trifo is very specifically talking about um, that Jesus is just not the Messiah. And that even if he was anointed, or even if he was the Messiah, he's not, he doesn't even know it. And he's not even relevant until he's been anointed by Elijah. And so since Jesus was not anointed by Elijah, he cannot possibly be the uh, savior at present. Um, this is not a reference to mythicism, no matter how much mythicists have tried construing it. Uh, that way, I know of virtually no scholars who agree with this reading, except for, oddly enough, Lewis Feldman. Um, but I don't know of any others. Um, outside of that, just no one seems to agree with this. It's only mythicists who really come up with it. Um, the, the, the debate uh, on whether or not Jesus existed, at least in, uh, like an, as an analytical discussion, first starts popping up in the in the 17th century in the 1600s uh, there is a, another debated earlier reference um, by it's a polemical comment by John Bale and it's from 1574 and uh, he ascribes this comment to um, he ascribes this to a, uh, one of the popes, I think it's Pope Leo X, something like that. And it says, all ages can testify enough about how profitable that fable of Christ has been to us and our companies. Who said that again? I'm sorry. John Bale it, uh, ascribes John. it to Pope Leo X. Wow. Yeah, so, now, so is he the first person to call it a fable? Because I know someone else ends up doing that too. Um. We don't know for sure. So this is why this is uh, a problem is we don't actually really know what uh, a we don't know if this is actually e even legitimate. We don't know if this actually even goes back to the Pope to begin with. Mm. Um, it's in a book that is essentially a polemical screed against Catholicism. So it's already of questionable veracity as is. Sure. But even in addition to that, even assuming that this is a legitimate quote, the problem is that we don't know what he's referring to. Is it the figure, like the historical figure who's a fable, or is it like the gospel stories that are a fable? Like, what is the fable about Christ? It's very unclear. So even if this is legitimate, I don't consider it any clear reference to mythicism. There are also claims of another pope being a mythicist and that his, uh, and that he connected things to like Mithras and stuff like that. This is also, of course, um, illegitimate. It first pops up in the, uh, I believe it was the early 1800s in a French encyclopedic text, again, by another guy who's an anti-Catholic 
Um, and at that point, the works of Volney and Dupuy had already been published at which where they were already comparing Jesus to Mithras. So I just think that this is just stealing from Volney and Dupuy and putting it in the mouth of a pope as a, as a, a way of polemicizing the Catholic Church again, because it's also relevantly another French text. And or, you know, late 1700s, early 1800s, France doesn't exactly like the Catholic Church. <laughs> yeah, just to get, just to give you an example real quick of how much they hate the Catholic Church. This was a, oh, where'd it go? Did I download it? Oh, you know what? Uh, just keep talking. I'll pull it up in a second. Okay. I'll show it. But so, yeah, go ahead. yeah, the first confirmed reference that I can ever find to... Uh, that seems to confirm the existence of mythesis is actually in the works of um, uh, Hugo Grotius is, is what we uh, tend to call him. Uh, and this is in 1627 in one of his um, Latin texts. Uh, he essentially writes, and this is uh, in translation, uh, that there was such a person as Jesus of Nazareth who lived heretofore in Judea when Tiberius was emperor of Rome is not only most constantly professed by all Christians who are scattered all over the face of the earth, but acknowledged by all the Jews who uh, now are or ever rose since those times. Nay, the very pagan writers, that is, such as such as are neither of Jewish nor Christian religion, namely Suetonius, Tacitus, and Pliny the Younger, and many uh, more after them do testify the same isn't it funny how those are the three that are always brought up when we get into this oh discussion? yeah and this has been oh, the, those three it's and a it's consistent crazy. argument in favor of jesus's historicity so uh, yeah. something to keep in mind is that we have no early texts from actual mythicists before yeah, yeah. Yeah. before yeah. this reference to uh, or before the works of volney and dupuy really we don't really have yeah. any clear cut you, have, you have to admit that to mythicists you have to because otherwise yeah. it's like they're, 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 they're sitting there wondering, why are they not seeing what we're seeing? I'm like, well, no, yeah. we're not seeing what you're seeing. Trust us. But I wanted yeah. to show this to show you, thank God for the French, because they, they were the first to actually like say, you know what? Screw this theocracy shit. Like, look at this. That's the Pope on the ground. Then you have yeah. Caligula and Nero, who are like the worst emperors ever, according to the church doctrines, church history, and then Napoleon's head on top. But I don't know. That's another story. But I just wanted to give an example of like that's how much. Oh, yeah. yeah, they they hate, they hate the, they hated the church. Oh, yeah. So, but yeah, one thing to keep in mind is that we have no uh, like from the 1600s, we don't have any actual mythicist texts. Um, but we know that they existed, and we know they existed because of references like this in the works of Grotius. Because why are you arguing that Jesus existed as a real person? unless someone's talking about how Jesus didn't exist. Like you have no reason to to argue that he existed unless that was in the public consciousness. Right. Um, and this is how it continues on for a while. So uh, after uh, Grotius, we have a few other references to mythicists like uh, Laurent Francois. Uh, he, he writes, and this is my translation from the French, you cannot still believe that those who assure us of the existence of Jesus Christ, his miracles, the books of the New Testament, were errant in all of these facts without making it fall onto God himself. Again, it's pretty clear cut that he's, uh, he, this is clearly a rebuttal to those claims that Jesus didn't exist. Um, and that reference is from 1758. Uh, we actually have references to the mythicist debate prior to Volney and Dupuy uh, in England, Germany, and France. So at least in three different countries and also um, Holland as well because of Grotius. Um, so it seems to have been a widespread thing already that critics of the church were already starting to come to the conclusion uh, either for polemical purposes or just from their own analytical reasoning that Jesus didn't exist. And they were using this as a rebuttal. But this is also not the only way that mythicism was used. because a, And this is part of my theory of where its origins may have stemmed is actually as a Christian polemic. 
Um, one of another one of the earliest references which I have found is in an anti Quaker uh, statement. They they they're so the early church hates Quaker or not early church but the Protestant church and Catholics they hate Quakers a lot. It's it's concerning how much they don't like Quakers. Can you just tell? I, I, I cannot like stress this enough. They really don't like them. Can you just tell people if they don't know what a Quaker is, real quick, just what it is? Um, so Quakers, uh, they're a sect of Protestant uh, Christianity that essentially uh, broke off, and they have. Let's yeah, say a lot yeah, of non. They have a lot of non-orthodox. A lot of non-orthodox views. They are strict, pa like strict pacifists, for instance. Uh, they are very much devoted to community. They are somewhat evangelical in their uh, missionary so work. Notes. <laughs> so you get that or no? That's from the serial Quaker. Yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. No, I just wanted to make sure people understood Quaker is yeah, like it, not essentially they're not just a, they, they were a really small movement that uh, no one that none of the established Protestant movements liked. Sure, um, especially Puritans hated them. Yeah, um, like kill them kind of hatred. It's pretty wild how these when when the Protest after the the like the result of Protestant movements splintered the world of christianity so much that christians are going to war against each other at that point but oh yeah that's another yeah just wanted to, i just wanted to lay that lay that out so people understand what we're where we're at now in this in the world yeah yeah um so another one is so like on on this note uh, you have uh, the work of Johannes Lorenz von Mosheim, who wrote a history of the church in 17, and it was translated in the 1720s in English. And this is essentially what he had to say here. He said, the European Quakers dare not so far uh, presume upon the indulgence of the civil and ecclesiastical powers as to deny openly the reality of the history of the life, med meditation, and sufferings of Christ. But in America, where they have nothing to fear, they are said to express themselves without ambiguity on this subject and to publicly maintain that Christ never existed but in the hearts of the faithful. Oh, wow. There is no evidence that any of them believe this. At all. Now, who, who wrote that? Uh, uh, a German um, uh, academic, uh, von Mosheim. He sure. wrote a history. He wrote a history of the church. Um, and they just, it, this is just a polemic. This is a, these are Protestant Christians going after a, uh, a heterodox group that they don't like and declaring that they don't, they don't even believe Jesus existed. Right. That's the ultimate jab at yeah it, and so this looks like mythicism is both an a polemic against christianity and then also one of christianity's stock polemics against opponents mm. uh they're just dishing this out every which way um which is really interesting to me uh that this was originally a uh, in some fashions also a christian tool of essentially asserting um an orthodoxy and uh, attempting to main maintain dominance uh, theologically um so the this is basically how it's beginning you have other writers again a lot of these early references are all of a very similar capacity just uh, we know jesus existed and we know he existed because x sources say so uh if you think otherwise you're wrong <laughs> Um, reference, and they're always referencing some completely, uh, uh, like nebulous figure. Uh, they're one of the more notable ones, and this is one that's probably much easier for people to find. Is from Edward Stillingfleet. He wrote a letter in response to a deist, and he has a lengthy section in there. So he 
goes at length to argue that Jesus existed. Tacitus attests him. Here's the huge quote from Tacitus. Um, and what's interesting is actually how much he's well is he also gives ground to mythicists because he's like, yeah. well, even though I think that Josephus is authentic, and why couldn't Josephus have said all these words? Um, anyways, like maybe he was just being inconsistent or incoherent because all people are incoherent sometimes. Uh, he's they still like, I'll just grant them that this isn't real, but we still have Tacitus. Look over here. <laughs> that's interesting because you hear that. That's sometimes a, a lot of myth historicists. I hate that word because we're just like, oh, yeah, just not mythicists. Basically, it's like non mythicist, it should be just regular and like people who just go along with the scholarship you know like, whatever anyways historicists sometimes do use this sometimes do say oh right, let's grant you that josephus is not legit and then blah 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 so you're seeing this the same sort of groundwork that the same sort of yeah. atmosphere of arguments happening in this time yeah that today. yeah um, and it's funny how tacitus is the one that ever everyone always jumps to i think that's the biggest mistake you can do if you're arguing that Jesus exists, why would you go, oh, yeah, and some guy in the second century in the 120s, yeah, he wrote about Jesus. If I'm yeah. a myth mythicist, I'm saying, so? That's a, almost 100 years after his life. <laughs> almost. like <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. actually funny. I've got a paper coming out on Tacitus soon, so yeah. specifically on this topic. <laughs> yeah, you, you and I both agree. This is just a, yeah. a, a he's a He's not a very helpful source, but in this day, uh, and this is also just standard for Christian apologetics in general. Uh, going through the history of this debate, one thing that I have found is that Christian apologetics, when it comes to mythicism, have been virtually unaltered for centuries. Like, the arguments are identical because it's always just an appeal to all the extra biblical sources. And then there's just not much more after that. They don't really have anything else after that. Um <laughs> Apologists don't really uh, know how to get into the nitty gritty of actually arguing that Jesus existed, which is really interesting to me. It is. It's um, a really strange thing. It, it, so, it, yeah. yeah. Mythicism, anyway, mythicism continues on. We finally have, are going to get um, the first indications of it in uh, Germany with Johann Gottlieb Teuner uh, in 1764. A, this is my translation from the German, but he writes, friend, you are on the brink of unreasonable skepticism if you have nothing further and more certain for yourself than that it is possible that Jesus never lived or never taught and did what the Gospels ascribed to him. Again, blatantly clear that people just there are people that don't think Jesus existed in Germany. And this is before Bruno Bauer. This is... Um, it would be around 80 or more 80 ish years before Bruno Bauer started writing his most critical work on Christianity. Um, so yeah, mythicism was well into public consciousness throughout. And then you finally get the works of front uh, Constantine Dupuy and Charles Francois or Constantine Volney and uh, Charles Dupuy. Uh, in the 1790s. Um, Volney is the first one to write, but he actually bases his, a lot of his work on drafts of what Dupuy was working on, because those two are buddy buddies. Um, and he uh, right, he finally releases his work in the early 1790s, and it's a huge smashing success. Everyone uh, in the skeptic and non-Christian world loves it. Thomas Paine likes it. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, the our future president works on translating Volney's work and actually translates most of it into English. And then he has his name removed because he was going to run for the presidency and didn't want his name tarnished. But it's actually pretty clear that uh, Jefferson was quite probably a mythicist. Yeah, actually, a lot, a lot of the things he says is very uh, leaning towards it being a myth. Yeah, um, Thomas Paine. Right Oh, Thomas Paine. Tell him what yeah. Thomas Paine says about Jesus while I pull this up about Thomas. Jefferson. Yeah, uh, Thomas Thomas Paine actually has a whole section where he goes on to it, uh, like an ash in uh, uh, it's one of his more famous ones on. He says it's about the sun, right? Yeah, he says it, it's all it, and it's all on a astro theology, and that's oh. actually like the first mainstream mythicist theory that catches on is the astro theology stream 
uh, I actually found the quote from Thomas Paine. And oh, excellent. The Christian religion is a parody of the worship of the sun in which they put a man called Christ in the place of the sun and pay him adoration originally played to the sun. Also, Thomas Jefferson says the day will come when the mystical generation of Jesus by a supreme being as his father in the womb of the virgin will be classed by, with the fable of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. Wow. Yeah, and, and will, there's even more. Than, there, there's even more than that. Actually, it was later reported um, by other historians that he would at Monticello he would have uh, friends over and they would discuss how Jesus and the twelve disciples were all uh, symbols of the sun and the zodiac and stuff. Uh, Jefferson was very clearly a mythicist, in my opinion. Yeah, but this, this all is the evidence seems to point to this. He loved Volney. He was a very good friend of Volney's. Um, they exchanged letters. He translated Volney's work, etc., etc., etc. George Washington also is known to have read Volney's work. It was in his library. Um, so Volney's work became widespread. But here's the interesting thing about Volney is that Volney wasn't a mythicist. And this is what's oh, yeah. been misrepresented about him for a long time. He still thinks that there's like possibly a shadowy figure behind Jesus. Um, if for, for those who are interested, um, George Albert Wells, who is one of the most famous mythicists of recent living memory, um, actually wrote an excellent essay on Volney and Dupuy back in the 1960s in the Journal uh, for the History of Ideas. Uh, check it out. It's an excellent article. Um, but, a lot of these guys are Freemasons too, and Freemasonry was like this. Um, I'm not sure. Well, yeah, yeah, some of the, a lot of the a lot of the American um, right. fa uh, founding fathers are. I'm not sure about Volney or, or Dupuy being. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not talking. I was talking like George Washington and yeah, possibly Jefferson. I'm not sure. Maybe I, I, know, I don't. Sure I don't. Think there's nothing I found that's like there's any inherent link i think it's just more to do with the fact that washington uh jefferson and a lot of the church fathers were just a part of this more skeptical movement sure towards christianity in general um they're well the only reason why i brought that up is because when you go to some of these other freemasons like like um uh, uh who wrote albert is it pike yeah albert pike and then you i think um how's his name uh hall manly hall i think is a freemason too and mm -hmm. they they the, their writings are very leaning towards mythicism like they there is a there's a text where manly hall says that jesus or christ and krishna are cognates and they're they're both by basically they're, it's the same as osiris and all that yeah so, like that's what the stuff that was coming out of those those uh groups so you can i can i'm just saying like there might be something there too to that yeah um no idea have not looked into that specifically yet yeah um what's interesting is that moving into the 1800s mythicism actually gets then picked up by a lot of other revolutionary movements so in england it becomes a favorite of secularist movements fighting against the stringent christian control in government um and a lot of these guys are going to end up in prison for it as well uh you know, people like Robert Taylor, the devil's chaplain, of course, and uh, Richard Carlyle, his friend. Um, but also, interestingly, uh, one of the most uh, well-known speakers of that time was actually a woman, Eliza Sharples. Yeah. Um, Dude, she, can, I, can I not to just hold that thought for one sec? Because I just want to yeah. show people what I'm talking about so they're not, they're, they don't leave them like, what? Yeah. Christ and Krishna are cognates. Obviously, it's not true. Everyone knows that. But this is from George Steinmetz, uh, early 1900s, I think, or 1800s, and he. This is this is the actual text right here. Can you see? Uh, can you see it? Yep. Krishna, the Greek Christos, and the English Christ. Yeah. Each turn derived from the former meaning the anointed. Like, yeah. What? What are you? Where is he? There's a lot of pseudo scholarship going it on. Time. Well, it's, this is in the infants. This is also, in fairness to everyone, is in the infancy of linguistics, um, is in the infancy of mythological research. Like Volney's work is considered one of the most foundational texts of comparative religion. Um, it's one of the earliest uh, out there. And so uh, 
in fairness to a lot of these people, including these mythicists, a lot of their ideas are actually fairly innovative. Uh, sure. The time. Sure. Um, and and actually eventually set the groundwork for a lot of what we do today. Um, but yeah, no, there's no linguistic connections between all these uh, as it will yeah, turn that's, out later. That's, that's like established beyond. Yeah. Beyond, yeah. Yeah. But at that time it wasn't. So it's un understandable because a lot of linguistic comparison and actually like some of the foundations for cross um, called uh, cross linguistic comparison that went into studying uh, language families was based on these similarities, like looking at the similarities between different languages and their words for water. That's one of the that was one of the key ones, how we figured out that Hindi, English, German, French and all these other languages are all pretty similar and related to each other is that they have very similar words for things like water or for things like um, father, mother uh, and stuff like that. Um, so th this sort of thing is not it, it's not irrational. It's it, sure. it, had, it actually had a method and some basis in reality at that time. Um, now it's just wrong. Um, but moving on. Um, back to the English radicals, these guys um, in this movement is actually like one of the earliest um, activist feminist movements in England. And Eliza Sharples is at the head of this. Um, she's like a, a spokesperson of it. And so she would um, give speeches at a place called the Rotunda. It was a theater in London. Um, she published a uh, a lot of stuff in magazines. She was actually an edit. She was an editor for multiple magazines at the time as well. Uh, one that's called the ISIS. And in these were she was originally a Christian. She became an atheist, and then things get really interesting. And in that she starts coming up with her own theory for what she calls rational Christianity, which is almost pseudo gnostic in a way. Like knowledge is the is the is the thing that is liberating for us that's literally definition gnostic yeah. in my opinion because a lot of people like to go oh if they have the demiurge or it has to be demiurge theory like no i think it's about knowledge gnosis that's what i think. yeah well and and this is and she even has like kind of demiurge thought as well like oh, uh, yeah. and, and there's no doubt uh, like uh the god of the old testament is this uh, evil creator who's trying to stop us from attaining gnosis yeah that's that's a nice that's not um <laughs> it, 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 it is really wild uh but she ends up also very pro-feminist um they write tracks in favor of contraception and abortion rights and stuff like that and then also on top of that she also she also declares things like when I'm speaking in this place, there is no gender. All people here are equals. She was ahead of her time. Damn. Uh, it is. It is. The stuff that she says is wild. She, and she's it, not, for she's how radical. Gnostic informant before me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and, but she's also a virulent mythicist uh, as well. She does not think Jesus existed at all. Um, wow. She, um, and there's actually some a really interesting reason why she's like, okay, we all when we do analytical study of all these other religions, like we don't say Hercules existed. No one says Hercules existed. No one says Osiris existed, etc., etc., etc. Why are we treating Jesus so differently? Hmm. Like her main thing is why is it that Jesus gets the, gets off the hook for critical analysis? when these guys don't. It's a good question. And so she comes to the conclusion that, no, Jesus didn't exist. He's just like all those others. And she concludes that basically everyone in the Bible is a myth. Like she goes through, she has a whole series of, of writings in her, uh, in the ISIS, the, uh, she was also called the ISIS as well, I should say, um, after the Egyptian goddess. Um, but uh, she has a whole series of writings in there. Uh, uh, going through on her mythological, allegorical reinterpretations of the Bible. And it's really interesting. And honestly, I've thought for a while of editing and reprinting all of those at some point. Um, but 
Yeah, so it becomes picked up by a lot of early feminist movements. In the United States, it does as well. It becomes uh, published in womanist journals. Um, actually, the work of Kersey Graves, everyone knows him because he's the 16, the world's 16 crucified saviors guy, um, the favorite of uh, Acharya S. and others. Um, it's a classic. He, uh, his work was actually very favorably reviewed in a journal that was actually run by the first woman to run for president in the United States. Wow. That, this is, yeah. I, this is, I, is, this is why I wanted to have you on. This is all amazing. Yeah. Right no, it, it is thoroughly picked up by, uh, in these movements and you can see why, because all of these movements are affected by one common thing. Uh, Christians are essentially trying to dominate the public sphere. There, there's mass censorship going on. In a lot of places, you have blasphemy laws, like in England. You can be arrested and and all sorts of other awful stuff for just about anything. Um, in Germany, we're going to actually see uh, the first case of a. a one of the only cases actually of a, a mythicist who loses his academic position and it's bruno bauer uh, bruno bauer was originally a christian uh theologian and he started doing historical analysis he's also a hegelian which essentially means that he really likes the philosophy of a man who i cannot understand for the life of me i i don't i i, I don't get hegel i don't get why anyone likes hegel i'm sorry he's a big name that's you know uh, I, 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 I have a minor in philo a philosophy and I cannot stand him. My, prof my professor, when he had us read Hegel, he's like, I don't expect you to understand Hegel. I have a PhD and I don't understand Hegel. <laughs> it's heavy stuff. Um, heavy stuff. But, uh, he really, he really likes Hegel. It informs a lot of his philosophy. And one of his ideas is that, um, religion the, the, the development of Abrahamic religions follows this trend of uh, essentially increasing personal freedom. So for him, he's also very anti-Semitic. He really doesn't like Jewish people. Um, for him, Judaism is the most restrictive form and quote unquote primitive form of religion. It's uh, adherence to these laws it has separated God from humanity. Um, it is this practice of essentially alienation. Um, not And then Christianity helps to solidify this more or, or break this down a bit. God now, the veil between us and God is now broken to a degree. But we're still beholden to a lot of these uh, uh, these uh, law rules, regulations, and these confines on the personal spirit. Yeah. So the ultimate freedom for the personal spirit eventually in his mind becomes shedding religion entirely. That's when true emancipation can finally happen. You know, so eventually he becomes a really ardent atheist and he really, really just doesn't like any religion at all. Yeah. Um, and so he argues that if for anyone to be emancipated in society, especially Jewish people, they must renounce their religion. So I just want to touch on that for one second, just to jump in for one second. There's this old book by a historian named Van Loon. You can see how old it is. This is my, my grandfather's. He got this in 1941 for his yep. Christmas. Well, it's so it's so think about the context. This is before the Nazis were. Well, I guess it's like right in the middle of it, but this is before like they were taken over. This Nazi Germany is still there, but he's talking about Russia. In one of the chapters, he's talking about Russia and communism, and he says, and he actually, um, I think he, I think Nietzsche says something similar to this too. But he says that Christianity is what gave us socialism. He says that socialism is not new. I can even read it if you want. Yeah, want to hear what he says? Okay, let me find it real quick. He says that socialism is not new and that it is uh hold on let me find it i'm in the russian section right now this is very fascinating stuff because i know you're about to get into the whole so uh not uh so or the whole communist russia ideas of mythicism. we're a bit off from that but yeah 
All right. Well, why don't I hold this up? Well, keep going, and then I'll find it, and then we can. When yeah. we get there, I, I, I will comment on briefly. Um, a lot of people have mistakenly thought that um, mythicism entered the Soviet Union and communist movements through Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, and that's because Karl Marx was a student of Bruno Bauer's. Oh yeah, um, I actually found the text. And they were and they were actually good friends for a while. Um, uh, they actually diverged heavily on the Jewish question. Ooh, this is what he says. Now, communism is an economic system is nothing new. The old monastic orders were really communistic institutions, and they in turn were based on the communism of the early Christian church. Now, you and I both know about the Carpo Christians. Yeah. In Acts 5. Give all your give all your things up to the feet of the apostles, and we all live equal. Anyways which recognized neither rich nor poor and did not believe in private property. The pilgrims, when they came to America, intended to form a communistic community, but all these efforts to bring about a more equi equitable division of this world's goods had been conducted on a relatively small basis. They never touched the lives of the people at large. And there is where the Bolshevik experiment differs from all others. It has turned the whole of the Russian plain into the Baltic, into the Pacific, into one vast political economic laboratory where everyone is supposed to work for just one purpose, the well-being and happiness of the mass. Okay, this is what he is. This guy thinks that Christianity is what gave them communist Russia. Yeah. And well, and actually you can see this and I'll get into this a little later, but a lot of the uh, cues that a lot of the rhetoric that takes place in the rise of of communism actually they take a lot of imagery from christian um uh history for that but um there's a a mistake going back there's that mistaken belief that mythicism entered through marx and Engels, and it didn't uh, marx never wrote on the topic of the historicity of jesus um, to my knowledge, I've gone through every uh, volume of their collected works that have been translated into English that I can, and I've not found any reference by Marx. I did find one by Engels, actually yeah. two by Engels. And by the um, way, and Engel, and in both, and in neither of them does Engels actually espouse mythicism. And by the way, what I just read, people are probably thinking, "Come on, look at look at the Christians in America today." Don't like. You're right. Like, I'm not saying that this is there's definitely some differences and some problems with what this person's getting at. There's definitely yeah. difference between like the early Christian, like the Carpo Christians, for example, who actually did live a communal lifestyle compared to this pro uh, free market, pro Trump conservative Christianity. So obviously I'm not saying like, let's not. There's no relation. There, no relation. Yeah. Uh, not not there. Protestant Protestantism is a completely different animal. Plus, plus some of the stuff that Paul gives us about women have women need to cover their heads when they come here, and they can't be preachers. So yeah, there's obviously bad ideas. We're not going to sit there and say that Christianity gives us equality because it really doesn't. Yeah, I just wanted to make that clear. I'm just reading. Some, don't kill the messenger here, guys. I'm just reading yeah. some. Of this. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, uh, Bauer uh, begins his um, his rather well-known um, texts criticizing and analyzing the history of the synoptic and Johannine traditions, and eventually also the uh, epistles. And he comes to some of the most radical conclusions uh, that you can think of, but also some that are now becoming mainstream, actually. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that's very integral in his works is comparing Christian philosophy and theology with the work of of Stoics and also uh, Platonists like Philo and noting just how similar they are. And he's like, these are clearly from the same camp of thought. And uh, it's interesting because for the longest period, um, people tried rejecting that and it's basically uh, becoming more mainstream thought now um, that yeah, Christians were definitely taking from Stoic and Plate and Platonist philosophy. Um, no doubt about that. Absolutely. Um, the it, where this gets most radical is he denies the um, authenticity of the Pauline epistles, all of them, 
Wow. Uh, he rejects the his he ends up rejecting the historicity of Jesus, of course, and he argues that the Gospels are probably second century texts and they're reflecting the zeitgeist of their own time period, something to and Jesus becomes essentially an embodiment of that zeitgeist. Um, he's not a real figure; he's a literary device, basically. Honestly, I'm going to say this, even though I think he existed, I can see that argument. I can see why someone would make that argument. Um, yeah, like fundamentally, as a lit, uh, as in terms of the literary analysis, I can, I'm definitely on board with this to the extent that the Gospels are definitely turning Jesus into yeah. a symbol for their own, uh, their own aims from their own time period. Yeah, they don't, drawn, they don't care to. This is not an accurate history. They don't care to yeah, actually they're, they're, preserve tradition or anything like that. Yeah, they're drawing from all these other stories and they're applying it to him. Yeah, so they're making him the ultimate character, basically. So yeah. yeah. There's obviously, like, there's obviously the gospel. Truth. The gospel of Mark is very clearly pulling from his own his own day, uh, post temple destruction, and arguing that Jesus is going to be the new the not only the Messiah, he's the new Messiah, but not only that, he is the Caesar. He's the new Caesar. He's been and he's adopted just like Caesar is at the baptism and stuff like that. Augustus, yeah. Uh, yes, I hold that Mark has an adoptionistic uh, Christology. Uh, wow. Sue me. <laughs> um, so anyways, that's Bauer and Bauer um, immediately gets censured and eventually loses his academic positions um, because of these uh, thoughts in the 1840s. And then he and Marx also eventually have a falling out. Um, they exchange some rather heated polemics with each other. Um, and despite some claims that Bauer like goes into obscurity he doesn't really like people are still aware of his work and it still pops up quite a lot uh it's just that people don't care about it yeah. um notably bauer also gets into a big fight with uh david friedrich strauss as well mm. um strauss as we all know basically is he's one of the launch of the first west. west yeah yeah um, he's the one who wrote the book quest for the historical jesus no, that's Schweitzer. Schweitzer? Yeah, Schweitzer, yeah. yeah. I get those two mixed up so much. I don't know why, I just do. Uh, uh, but, yeah, it's... Uh, Schweitzer comes about a, a century later. So, anyways, Bauer eventually uh, passes away in uh, the late 1800s. Uh, in America, mythicism still kind of just floating around in secular circles for the most part, and it doesn't really have a whole lot of notoriety outside of those move outside of those movements it's still the most dominant form of it, it everywhere for the most part is astrotheology and then in the netherlands in the late 1800s you get the dutch radical movement that starts up these are basically just a few guys at like the university of leiden amsterdam and a few other places who are like None of the Pauline epistles are authentic. Acts is probably a better chronology than they, than they are. Um, Christianity, as we know, it's mostly a second century movement. Um, and while not all of them are mythicists, most of them are. Uh, what's interesting is that one of their leaders, uh, Abraham Dirk Lohmann, actually ends up reverting on that. He, had, he goes from um historicist to mythicist and then back to historicist uh before he passes away um like you also have like willem christian van manen who ends up training a number of the later dutch radicals including the last major representative who is uh ga vandenberg von Isenia, or mm. however you pronounce that in dutch i don't know dutch, is, yeah, dutch is fake english it's okay <laughs> um so don't don't shoot me dutch people <laughs> Mo mojo in the comments is gonna go <laughs> come after me <laughs> yeah. um so yeah it uh, essentially the dutch radicals have almost no impact outside of their own specific circles they do have like a little bit of a lasting movement like um that goes into like the 18 into the 1990s even there were a few still floating around but none of them were particularly notable and never had a any strong impact 
Um, so outside of that, their only major influence was specifically on other mythicists and mostly on people like the most infamous of all of them, Arthur Dreves. Um, Arthur Dreves was a philosopher. He was an idealist monist, which essentially meant that he thought that the universe and everything is made out of one idealist material. Uh, God, there's a pantheistic God. It's very, it, it, it's rather peculiar. Um, but he's, it, monism actually is like becoming a really big thing in Germany at the time because in the 1890s, in the 1890s, the works of, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Ernst Haeckel become very popular. Ernst Haeckel is a Darwinist zoologist who doesn't quite get Darwinism. His fellow, fellow biologists and zoologists don't like him, but his ideas become really popular, and he basically starts trying to create Darwinism as a religion. Um, and his work also actually lays the ground, the like the bedwork for a lot of social Darwinist ideas as well in Germany. Interesting. Um, his, and so... So it's like it, a deist, is it like a deist, Darwinist sort of... He's more, more an atheist. Haeckel and his ilk are more atheists for the most part. At most at most pantheists um but Haeckel's work uh yeah one of the one of the most famous things is actually Haeckel's embryos people people probably know that he thought that embryos showcased the evolutionary stages of humanity through the ages as they pro as they progressed and this is later turned out to be false but it's rather interesting it was rather interesting and innovative for the time but his ideas you know, I quickly fell into disfavor, except for in these monist circles. And the monist circles were essentially an anti-Christian movement devoted to pushing monism as the new alternative to Christianity. Um, and they became really popular, especially with secularists. And they uh, widely published and disseminated the works of uh, people to the works of people to start dismantling Christianity. Um, interestingly enough, in the same movement, you would see them sponsoring um, events that would showcase the work of Arthur Dreves and Albert Kaltoff, who are both mythicists. Kaltoff was the first major president of the uh, the the Monistenbund, the, the League of German Monists. Um, the issue is that uh he ends up dying fairly early he's also a marxist and he presents one of the first marxist origins for christianity but he does it from a mythicist perspective wow. um his book the rise of christianity was translated into english and is well worth reading it's actually really interesting and i highly suggest it um another real but he dies and then their new mythicist spokesperson becomes Arthur Dreves, even though they're materialist monists and he's an idealist monist and they fight all the time on that point. But they are able to make, they're able to put that aside so that he can go fight with Christians. Um, and he writes De Christus Mytha in 1909. It becomes an international bestseller um, and also one of the most infamous uh, mythicist text ever written. I don't know of a single mythicist text today that is comes even close. Um, sorry, Richard Carrier. No. <laughs> His work was translated into Russian, English, Japanese, French, Italian, you name it. Um, it sold tens of thousands of copies at least. Um, and today, and it even still has an afterlife going on today. Um, the, his, so his work becomes rapidly, uh, part of it's also he, the reason this works is because he is very savvy with his public, with publicizing it. Uh, so it does lots of public debates, lots of, uh, press interview type stuff. 
and now, it, where is that like what's part of the world which, which uh, this is all in germany yeah okay uh it, this is a, um drevs is associated with the area of Vienna. uh primarily and that place is actually a focal point for a lot of horribly radical stuff <laughs> uh stuff that's going to get really anti-semitic real fast real fast yeah arthur drevs is actually going to be become associated with the uh german uh free religion movements and stuff like that so he was friends with the volkish guys one uh, of the books you recommended to me when you were talking about this this topic with myth vision was um was the uh oh my god i got it what was it called again? Shit. Oh, I think I have it right here. Oops. Oh, never mind. Um, oh, it's from uh fuck, I can't think of it. Never mind, I'll think of it in a second. But it was really it you it, it was one of the ones that you told me was like pushing an anti-Semitic Jesus's Tamil was basically stuff. And um yeah, it was uh from ritual to romance yes i just thought of it from ritual to romance that one and yeah i looked into it and it was sure enough and it was this is from but this is from england i think so never mind i thought i'm thinking germany yeah that's an english one i'm sorry i'm i'm changing i'm derailing the conversation all right never mind just go ahead yeah that book and ritual romance actually stems from james george fraser's work yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And actually, Fraser mixes into this because so okay, Fraser, I'll just, I'll just Fraser begins the dying and rising God thing, and his work gets co opted by mythicists immediately, specifically by Arthur Drevs, and then later by Jörg Brandis in Denmark and others. And now it's just a mainstay as kind of like a relic. Um, the issue is that Fraser's not a mythicist, and he did not like the fact that he kept getting lumped in with them. Um, really? So in a, in a later edition of the book, he actually puts in a big footnote. I think Jesus existed. For the love of God, stop it. <laughs> I have. I, I did not. Yeah. Point in, that out. In, in, in the really large version, like I, the, the, I one of the last read, editions, he does that. I literally thought right until right now that James Fraser was one of the leading no. scholars. No, he was not. Wow, that's a huge, that's a huge no. loss because James Fraser did some amazing work in comparison. Um, yeah, his work was very, his work was, it was interesting. So he was actually trained as an anthropologist, um, but his work actually didn't make a huge impact in anthropology. And it's very, for some very specific reasons. Um, and it's because scholars like Ruth Benedict and others who were very notable um, anthropologists were like, okay, yeah, you can do all this comparison stuff, but what does that mean? Right. Yeah, when, you're, was, when you have to decontextualize all these different myths to compare them by themes and stuff, you remove all the cultural specificities that make them interesting. Sure. And yeah. you, and you re, uh, so she compares it to a Frankenstein's monster with limbs taken from Tahiti and, and Timbuktu in different places. And it's assembled into this conglomerate. And it's like, what does this even mean? What does this do for us? But in Fraser's defense, he opens up the book and it's, it's he's talking about magic and rituals. Yeah. So he's, he's focusing on, okay, the an illusion of mysteries. They ate the bread of Demeter and they drank the wine of Bacchus and those gods entered you and you became one with those gods in Christianity. You have a Eucharist, Like he was yeah. pointing stuff out in a really good, like in a really, yeah, no, a lot of his comparisons are really, are really apt. And like, yeah, I'm not exactly. trying to disparage all of them, but a lot of them are, a lot of them, we're so far, so drawn ag across so far cultures right. yeah. to make them work. And especially this tendency towards universalizing. And this is actually something that a lot of comparative religion scholars early on are doing is they're looking for universal myths and there aren't any myths aren't universal. There are experiences that are universal, like death, but how the how death is interpreted, what death means to that culture, and then therefore what those myths are actually functionally doing yeah. and saying. Another one of, another one of the big ones he pointed out was in Ovid's Metamorphosis, you have King Kinneris who's playing yeah. the harp. And like, oh look, King David also plays the harp and you and know, it's like, those are separated by so by hundreds and hundreds of years. There's, right, right. It, in complete in linguistically completely di distinct it's fascinating. Culture. it is fascinating though yeah you know, it, 
No, yeah, it's really fascinating when you can find those comparisons because, at least from a literary perspective, those are actually real uh, comparison. It can be really interesting for elucidating yeah. literary tension. Right. But in terms of looking at like mythos, mythological origins and stuff, no. Um, but in this time, the only people really making a lot of these criticisms are, at, are like the early anthropologists who are already starting to come to this understanding. Um, there we go. It actually looked kind of cool with the sun like that. It was like <laughs> so died or something. Yeah. So when you so Fraser's work gets picked up, Arthur drives uh, tries listing him among mythicists in his book, which uh, Fraser has great consternation towards, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, and at end of the day, Fraser is not a mythicist. But Dreves' work becomes wildly popular. The first Russian translation that's attempted is in 1910, but the translation is actually destroyed by censors before it can be published. Um, it's not going to be uh, translated into Russian again until the 1920s. Yeah. Um, the work of Arthur Dreves is going to culminate in the 1910s with the uh, Berlin Zoological Gardens debate, which was sponsored by the German Monistenbund. Uh, and it's essentially a over a day long, it's of nonstop fighting between Arthur Drevs and various other theologians, um, including like Hermann von Soden, one of the most noted ones of the time and they are they duke it out it is heated unfortunately there is no english translation of the text but if you speak french or german you're there are some available um reports of it um the work arthur Dreves ends up becoming easily the most infamous mythicist and is rebutted to all over the world there's a there are russian scholars who rebut may write books responding to him um american english french uh spanish italian you like um peter de may and myself uh, between peter de peter de may co uh, counted close i think it was close to a hundred different rebuttals to his work and i found even more <laughs> Um, it's wild. I don't know of any mythicist, any singular mythicist who has even been cited that many times, let alone, let alone gotten that many responses, uh, in detail like that. Um, at this exact same time, our other mythicists going on, you have, uh, J.M. Robertson in England, who has become the most infamous English speak, English mythicist. Um, he's, uh, writes several books on the topic he's pretty virulent he also is a politician um and his work uh gets responded to quite a lot as well especially by frederick Con uh Conibert, um who writes a, his own text in response to mythicists um the works of uh I'm trying to think um with William Benjamin Smith in America also become pretty infamous as well, um, very specifically because William Benjamin Smith uh, was a polyglot. Uh, he has he, he wrote books in English, and then he also his first mythicist book that was actually in German, and it's for uh, for Christliche, uh, something I can't remember the last word. Anyways, uh, it's the pre-Christian for Christliche Jesu. Uh, the pre-Christian Jesus. And he he's one of the originators of this theory, actually, that there was a Jesus being worshipped in Judaism prior to the event of Christianity as a spiritual figure. And this actually is going to get picked up by a number of them uh, in, Fran people, in Fran people, people France. Still. Like, yeah, in France, you have like Solomon Reinach and uh, uh, Edouard Dujardin, who also argue in faith argue uh, mythicist uh, cases, Dujardin arguing that Jesus originated as like a Canaanite fish god. Oh, wow. It's, they, the theories get 
wilder and wilder the longer you now, go. Can you, Krebs can you, is an astrotheologist himself. Do you know where they're getting this from? Like, what, what are the sources? Like, I, is, oh yeah, well, like in the in this case, is a mistranslation issue or it, not really understanding. So you know, you so the name Jesus is Joshua, right? They think that this is stemming from the figure of Joshua in the Old Testament, who's a euhemerized figure in their opinion. And then Joshua is also, I think it's called Noon Fish. Son of Noon, yeah. Son of Noon, yeah. Son of the, son of the Fish. Oh, wow. Wait, because dog, dog is fish in Hebrew, but it maybe none is a different version of it, maybe? Yeah, it, 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 the linguistics get really wild. This yeah. is a this is a trait of a lot of early mythicists is that the linguistics are all over the place. So there's no um, there's not a whole lot of sense trying to make make sense of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, at the same time, also you have all the theosophists yeah. going on. Like theosophy well, is just one more question, real quick. I, yep that that was the one theory that you mentioned. But the other guy who who thinks that the Jews worship a pre-existing Jesus, what does he say about that? It's not the Philo thing, is it? That's a new uh, carrier. No. That's carrier's own thing. Yeah, that's yeah, a, that's, that's, that's carrier's own thing. That's creative I've idea. Any, carrier, I've right? not not found anyone previously who makes no. that argument or never. Yeah, but but what does he use that? What does he say? Is he say there's some sort of text that he's pointing to, or is he just thinking <laughs> that maybe they're all gone and I'm just gonna. I'm just going to insert it myself. Is that what he's doing? Um, so he basic he's our, he argues for it based on a complete reinterpretation of Yahweh as essentially a dying and rising figure. Okay. Got you. Um, and this is a theory that later gets promoted as well, actually in some mainstream scholarship, uh, but then gets, uh, I think it was by uh, Theodore Gaster, maybe. I don't, I'm not, don't quote me on that. There's one more that does this, and then uh, Chugbe Medinger is going to completely upturn that. Um, so, a, anyway, so uh, the astrotheologists are pretty much the dominant ones at this point. They, yeah. uh, for the most part, are leading the charge on does Jesus exist or not? Except for the historicists, and then World War One hits. Ooh. And the thing about World Wars is that mythicism, mythicism, and you know, did Jesus exist? Um, it becomes a really irrelevant question to be talking about when the world is erupting and millions of people are dying. Yeah, that's true. Um, so mythicism kind of in terms of popularity dips until the war is over it sees a brief resurgence in surgeons in the 1920s because of one paul louis Cushu, uh who is a another frenchman because of course um he argues that uh jesus was a cosmic figure and he and all his there's you know, you know a celestial passion and stuff like that. Essentially, this is where Earl Doherty and Richard Carrier's theories stem from. Is Paul Louis Cushu, right? Um, his work is also, in my opinion, the most convincing of this camp. Sure, of course. Um, it's, it's, you know what it is? You know what it is? I'm just going to say this, and um, I've, this is what I've come to conclude about mythicism right now. It's so hardened throughout the centuries of criticisms and how to and like like ways of like of like getting around the criticisms that's been thrown at it for so long it's almost become an apologetics at this point there's an, there's every anything you throw at a myth is there's an answer for it there's a there's a pre pre-prescribed answer and on how to get around it and it's it's very much like what apologetics is doing like over yeah. the centuries people have been criticizing christianity so they think of well eh, this is a possible out for that so insert this to any – here's the question you get. Insert that as the answer. And that's what mythicism – and that's why I'm saying, like, you see Dougherty and you see Carrier. It's more and more refined as time goes on. Now it's like – now you can't even debunk it at this point. It's 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 perfect. Now. Yeah. Um, I think one of the – well, I, I'll get to this later. Um, 
it is a it is an interesting topic that point though actually yeah. um very specifically how mythicism has lost a lot of its cutting edge because our, what's interesting about this is that despite the fact that these theories are blatantly wrong a lot of them are methodologically a lot more cutting edge and also a lot of their criticisms actually are noteworthy like these guys very much understood that we shouldn't be treating the gospels like they are some special repository of historical information they aren't they are they, they are fundamentally legendary texts uh even if you ascribe to them the status of a greco-roman biography greco-roman biographies are notoriously legendary right yeah. um i mean just just read the, the read the, leave the life of augustus by suetonius oh that is, yeah. that is a pure myth like he's um, born actually, when Virgin it comes to the biographies of the caesars like if you want to like a ranking a way to rank them rank them on their mythological qualities the biographies of, of the caesars by uh of the 12 caesars by suetonius very regularly fall into the rat the rank raglan archetype yeah oh yeah um, but, or no uh, more than 12. in fact several of them hit nearly 20. yeah oh especially augustus i mean um, augustus, actually augustus one, of, one of the top yeah. ones is tiberius yeah yeah and then you have um, alexander the great you have his story you have i mean this is how they wrote story Calig caligula is also fairly high and so is nero here's the best example in my opinion Diogenes Laertes, Lives of the Philosophers. We're oh, talking yes. about people from the ancient world who are philosophers, and he's writing about them as if they're like prophets and, and magicians. Yeah, and Pythagoras. Or, or the life of uh, uh, Pythagoras by um, I'm Black. I'm Black. And, and he and says that, he says that uh, Pythagoras is playing music and all the animals are coming up to him. And then he knows how to speak their languages. He can talk to animals like Dr. Doolittle. Yeah, well, and that, and well, and that that specific biography ranks around fourteen on my rank on my numbering. But yeah. anyway, um, Apollonius and Tiana, that's another one. <laughs> yeah, um, so it all of this is really interesting because um, essentially at this time, you know, everyone is all the mythicists are on point, and these are things that are being fairly recognized today. These are just on point uh criticisms of the gospel so you can't rely on them as historical documents um right. and we shouldn't be taking them as uh we we shouldn't be taking them as just um repositories of information at all um and we also can't and they're also very astute in their criticisms that the whole demythologizing tradition that strauss and others were doing is itself just methodologically not cogent you can't because the gospels are inherently religious and spiritual texts in a lot of ways and in the ancient world you can't really separate mythology and history like that those are two things that intermingle but if i will say this people like john kloppenborg and um others who constructed their cue and people right now people are going to roll their eyes oh my god you're talking about q it doesn't exist it doesn't exist we know that no one's saying it does but like there are some things and this has been this is by trained scholars who are trained in this specific thing to look like john kloppenborg for example to look for certain things that are written about a certain person that are not proven to be make not, not we're not saying that proves the existed it's saying that there's most likely this is based off something that happened because of how it's written, because of what it's saying, because of it, it's it's something that you don't usually just make up. Like there's cert, like certain like random uh, attributes or details, like being from Nazareth. So certain things that people put into the story, like Kloppenborg, when he puts his cue together, he's saying that these things most likely, not guaranteed, most likely were said by some guy. So then they say, what's the most likely scenario? Why even call him someone else? It probably just is a guy named Jesus. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, no. And that's where a lot of people are going to end up falling. But a lot of these early rebuttals to mythicism are very much trying to also uphold integrity of the Gospels as historical documents as well. Um, so mythicists were actually, what, at their start, ahead of the curve. Um, and I think people give them a lot of flack 
when they sh uh, especially these early ones like yeah they're really easy to criticize because so many of these things are just obviously wrong now but in that day they didn't know that firstly and secondly if you look at the way that they're going about criticizing these things and the way they're going about analyzing these things they were ahead of, of their time in a lot of different ways something that mythicists today aren't like mythicists are typically ahead of like apologists but apologists have been kind of stuck in the third in the third quest Jesus seminar era you know, for ages now. They haven't really moved beyond that. That's why why all of them still cling to the criteria of authenticity. Um, but like you go, essentially after World War II, um, mythicism aside from the brief kerfuffle that pops up with uh, Kushu. Uh, is going to hit a little bit of a downturn. That is until a certain man in Russia uh, writes a rather interesting um, pamphlet uh, called uh, On the Necessity of Militant uh, Materialism. And this is Vladimir Lenin. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. Lenin writes uh, in 1922, the well-known German scientist Arthur Treves, while refuting religious superstitions and fables in his book, De Christus Mythe, The Christ Myth, and while showing that Christ never existed, at the end of the book declares in favor of religion, albeit a renovated, purified, and more subtle religion, one that would be capable of withstanding, quote, the daily growing naturalist torrent, unquote. Here we have an outspoken and deliberate reactionary who is openly helping the exploitation to replace the old decayed religious superstitions by now more odious and vile superstitions. This does not mean that art, that dreads should be uh, not should not be translated. It means that while in a certain measure affecting an alliance with the progressive section of the bourgeoisie, communists and all consistent materials should unflinchingly expose that section when it is guilty of reaction. It means that to shun an alliance with the representatives of the bourgeoisie of the 18th century, i.e. the period when it was revolutionary, would be to betray Marxism and materialism. For an alliance with the Drevses in one form or another, and in one degree or another, is essential for our struggle against the predominating religious obscurantists. Essentially, yes, Drevs is religious, we should call that out, but we, he's a mythicist and his work helps to destroy Christianity, so we should endorse it and translate it and use it. Lenin is the reason why Drevs gets into, into the Soviet Union and why mythicism becomes dominant over there. So Drevs' work is very quickly translated in the 1920s into Russian, and it becomes a mainstay of... I'm trying to find a good spot here. <laughs> and it becomes a mainstay of, Ru of Russian academic thought. In fact, mythicism eventually becomes the dominant academic position in the soviet union um that's crazy yeah i don't think you can stress that enough like we're talking imagine going to school or whatever on a school i guess it would be school and like they're teaching history and they're like oh jesus yeah just the pure myth didn't exist he's based off all these other blah 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 and like that's the standard that's so that yeah. happened. In fact, I have tech. I actually own personally. I own. I own textbooks that were disseminated or that make this point. And they were. These were textbooks used by high schoolers. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because you have. There are mythicists today. I'm not going like, to call anyone out, but I've seen like people say there will be a day when scholarship catches up, and then it will. will it will be. Uh, scholarly consensus that Jesus did not exist. I've heard, I've heard a mythicist say this before, and I'm like, there, you know that this was already consensus, and we've twice, grown on it. yeah, we've got, we're past that now. Like that's yeah. old news. That's 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 bad. That's that's, that's so gone. there are two there are two things to uh, consider here. So yeah, a lot of these guys were act were legit mythicists. Um, 
in the, and also a lot of them were involved in early militant atheist movements. And to, the thing to understand about Soviet militant atheist movements is that they are um, horrible, awful, um, and also not the most competent at their jobs. Um, so one thing is they, for instance, try to start up anti-religious universities to try and train people to debunk Christianity. And what uh, quickly becomes apparent is, A, most scholars don't want to really get involved with these. And then, B, um, they're just bad at it. Um, so, you, so most of the students who would sign up would never actually make it through the courses. And then those who did would go out and then they would like debate a priest and the priest would know way more than they did and would just make them look foolish. Um, so these aren't working particularly well, but militant atheist agendas were strong enough in the Soviet Union that you end up with mass arrest of priests and Christians in the Soviet Union, forced repression of religion, and, but, and mythicism becomes a tool essentially of propaganda to try and de, just deconstruct the religious element of the country. Um, it's forced on kids in schools. It, Arthur Drives is basically treated as a textbook. Um, and a lot, as you can tell, a lot of this is coercive. Um, even in academia, there's a lot of coercion. Um, in fact, one scholar, Nikolsky, was very likely only writing mythicist material because of Lenin's diktat. He probably did not think that he actually had the freedom to be a historicist. And in fact, some militant atheist leaders in, the, in the, these organizations outright declared that historicists were enemies of the state. Are you serious? Yes. Now, that's funny because you hear that term militant atheist coming from Christians. But like... <laughs> you want to know what a militant you atheist got, is? There you go. You got your you got militant atheist right there. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy, though. Do you, Is there any... Um, do you know why? How do you how like where do we get that from? Is there anyone? Um, I found it. I found it in some uh, Russian texts on, on the matter. Sorry, I, I <laughs> there's not much in English on this. On yeah, it, unfortunately, yeah. wow. and there's actually very little in English on this debate. Um, the little I have found is rather scattered, but I have actually, and it's a linked or in my um, H Commons account. But I actually have published an article. Um, on the rise of uh, and downfall of mythicism in the Soviet Union and China. Wow. So for those who want an English rundown of what happened, aside from this video in more detail, there's an article out there for you. Yeah. Uh, the difficulties for the Soviet Union become with come with the fact that, so Lenin dies, Stalin takes over, World War II happens. At the same time that the Soviet Union is taking this over, also you have mythicism introducing into Japan through a uh, anarchist named Shos uh, Shutsui, Kot uh, Kotoku Shutsui, uh, my apologies, uh, who writes a book basically in English entitled On the Obliteration of Christ. And the book is a two-pronged assault. It is both an assault on Christianity, arguing that Jesus did not exist, and is also a veiled um, argument that the emperor should be removed. Wow. In 1911, he writes this while he's in prison because he was falsely implicated in a plot to assassinate the emperor. Romanov? No, uh, this is in Japan. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. this is uh, Kotoku Shutsui. And uh, he is um, subsequently executed. So, um, if you think you had, if, if, if you're a mythicist and you think you have it rough, grow up. <laughs> that's, that, that's what I have to say uh, to you. Um, the <laughs> you haven't been executed for the things you say. That's just wild, man. Christianity was has such an impact on world cultures that 
if there's people being killed because they think certain things about Jesus. You know? Uh, yeah. Also, real quick, um, chat GPT. Uh, no, I'm not anti-communist. Oh. <laughs> yeah. We're, just, <laughs> I mean, we're talking about a specific government that was doing specific things. Yeah. You know? Um. Anyways, um, I, I, I actively describe my, I, I've actively been part of communi uh, communist parties. So yeah, you told me about that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, moving on though. Uh, so Japan introduces, it gets myth, uh, myth, mythicism introduced over there, but it doesn't really pick up. And to my knowledge, it's never really been picked up over there. Uh, but Kotoku's, uh, Shutsui Kotoku's work um, does get picked up in China. And we'll get to that. Um, it, it, what's important to know is that on the obliteration of Christ um, is said to is said by in it one letter um, to have reached the desk of every major historian in China at one point. Wow! So this isn't just in the West. It was trans this is it was translated. It was also translated into Chinese, to my knowledge, around three times. Uh, throughout it's at least twice but i think it was three times Don't wow. there is a really good article in english on its the history of its transmission as well um so moving forward world war ii happens uh china at this point is actually still a monarchy um and mythicism doesn't quite pick up yet but after world war ii um, the the Communist Party wins out in China, and essentially from that point onward, mythicism becomes the official diktat of the state. And unlike in the Soviet Union, where there was like a fair amount of scholarship going on on early Christianity and stuff, uh, even though there was censorship, in China there's not. In fact, serious biblical studies on Christianity in China does not begin until the 1980s. Um, which we'll get to, but um, so moving forward, um, also during World War II, there's also mythicists in Nazi Germany, Hans Oppermeister, which is the most German name ever. <laughs> um, like... He write he writes the Entschlierte Bibel, which is the Bible unveiled or the unveiled Bible, and yeah. it is wild that is one of the most wild screeds of nazi propaganda i've ever read in my life and i, I actually have i have a copy of it if you want to see the copy sure can you give us some uh examples of what's right what's in there well uh, yeah so let me go to my bookshelf over here um for instance you get bits like um everyone comes from atlantis uh, this is another thing. So Atlantis is like a major thing in Nazi pro and white supremacist propaganda even today yes. because they want to believe that Robert there was Stone. some yeah th that there was some hierarchical civilization of great power that the Aryans all stem are the inheritors until yeah. like they want to say that they're the Aryans are outside of evolution and they came from aliens that were superior to humans. Yeah. Why? <laughs> yeah, and uh, this is this text is no exception to that. It is awful. So uh, this is the text. Wow, this is an original copy. That's got that 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 nineteen forties art right there. Yeah, and it's got uh, they got the our swastika. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Anti-Semitic, all over the place. It's called. Uh, it's published by the publisher is called Verlag der Judenkenner, which means the Jew knower. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. It... So. Uh, now, what does he say about Jesus in particular? Is he. Oh, yeah, Jesus is the myth. So is Paul. So are the 12 disciples. And Jesus is actually an instantiation of the god Wotan. 
who was crucified to give us knowledge. Oh, I get it. Because in the war the time, story, all. he hangs himself to save the world or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It comes, from, it comes from a it comes from a section of the Hova Mall uh, in the Poetic Edda. Yep, that's the it one. is. The whole thing is just a propaganda to get people to basically ascribe to Vol to Volkish Nazism. Yeah, like we were the first ones; they borrowed from us. Yeah, oh, yeah, and well, and that's basically what they say is like uh, the flood narrative in. The, the flood narrative in the Bible stems from the flood of Atlantis, and that's why Ad, and Adam is a, is called a red man because the people from Atlantis were described as having reddish, reddish skin, yada, yada, yada. It's really, yeah. That's wild. That is wild. You're right. Not you're not lying. This is it is one of the it is wild. But uh, by far the most dominant position in Nazi Germany is that is to transform Jesus into an Aryan and say that he was actually Aryan or at most he was only half Jewish and he was so great because of the Aryan side you know, of his heritage. You know that's interesting because in Mein Kampf you have Hitler saying that Jesus was the first one to oppose the Jews. Like he separates him from the Jews. In yeah. Uh, one text I know was specifically arguing that the god Elyon is not actually Jewish, but is a Germanic god that Jesus was the worshiper of. Wow. So maybe he'll, maybe maybe that Mein Kampf is getting from these ideas. Probably. Oh, yeah. Mein Kampf is pulling from a lot of this. Uh, interestingly enough, Sigmund Freud also doubts the existence of Jesus in, in his uh, text, uh, Civilization and its Discontents. Um, and then you'll then at this exact same time, you have Carl Jung coming out with his essay, Wotan, which has become a staple of white supremacist movements to this day. Really? Uh, yeah. Oh, white supremacists love Carl Jung, and that's because... Carl Jung is a. Uh, I noticed that you're right. Na Carl Jung was not a good person. Yeah, he had. And anyone who said, and anyone who tries to do the apologetic that oh he wasn't really a Nazi, it's like he was friends with Nazis. He did not like Jewish people, and he thought that the German unconscious was the most superior form. Grow up. I didn't know that. I did not. Yeah, know he's that. he's a terrible person. You're gonna, you're um, gonna have to, after the show, you're gonna have to show me that. I did not know that. Yeah, I, I I'm actually working right now on co-writing an essay or actually a few essays on specifically how mythicism and secularist movements intersected with the far right uh, throughout but history. It is interesting though, in his red book, he does pull from Gnostic ideas where you have this dualism between Jesus and the devil, but he's also pulling from the Sol Invictus crop, the ideas where you have Helios as the ultimate God. Yeah. And, and a, yeah. So this we he's he's all over the place and that and his idea. Yeah. So uh and what's going to be interesting is that Freud uh becomes a basis for auto rank for his his hero ranking and then at the, and then James George Fraser becomes the basis actually for Lord Raglan's hero archetype. Um and this is important cuz the 1930s and and forward um you get the Raglan archetype, you have the rank archetype, and then along in the night, and then you eventually get Joseph Campbell and the hero with a thousand face of a thousand faces, or with a thousand faces, whatever it's called. Yeah. It Bad book number five. <laughs> I, I have opinions on Joseph Campbell. Let's not get started there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, all of these eventually also become favorites of mythicists. Um, all these universal universalizing tendency texts become You're really right. become favorites, and it's because You're they're right. they don't rely on a lot. Uh, they they don't rely on very close inspection or um, no, it's a macro or it's historical macro, research yeah, in order to macro, make it work. It's a macro perspective on on yeah. history. You're not going and looking at the linguistics, and you're not picking apart the details you're, go you're going up on a high bird's eye view and you're saying heroes These journey. Look similar yeah and every story has a hero and a passion like of course that's it, it is a very vague thing to, to point out which yeah 
it it's is. like, okay, uh, it, it, it's not something particularly notable. So, uh, but mythicists really pick up on all of these quite a bit. Um, interestingly enough, though, it takes a while for all of them to really enter public consciousness for mythicists, mostly because mythicism from this point onward lacks much of any, like, there are not really any academics espousing it anymore. Uh, after the 1940s, except for in China and Russia. And in China and Russia, of course, they do have some of their own theories going on. Uh, Dying and Rising Gods gets int introduced into uh, over there. And then you also have other folklorists like Vladimir Prop and people like that. Um, but the uh, issue that comes up is then Stalin dies in the 1950s. And then comes the the period of de-Stalinization when Khrushchev takes over. And with that actually comes a lot more academic freedom given to scholars. And one of the texts that's translated during this time is by a Eng he's an Englishman named Archibald Robertson. He's actually the son of the famous Archibald Robert Robertson from New Testament scholarship commentary fame. Um, uh, and he is an English marxist and communist and he writes a book called the origins of christianity and it gets translated into russian because he's a fairly ardent he's such an ardent communist he'd make uh semi-regular trips to russia um and when it's translated into russian it's given a foreword by sergey kovalev who was one of the leading new testament scholars um in the soviet union and sergey kovalev is like this book is great except for that point where you think jesus exists and here's why i don't think that works and it starts a feud between them and they go back and forth back and forth for a few years on whether or not jesus existed and that ignites a huge debate all over Russia. Uh, in addition to this, the Dead Sea Scrolls are then are beginning to be published as well. And then you have the Nag Hammadi Library that's been discovered and is going to start getting published, and a bunch of other stuff. All these discoveries are coming up. And so Russian academics uh, are all infighting because also there's a new generation of scholars coming in. Uh, the old generation was all associated with the radical atheist movements. So you had like Yakov Lentzman and uh, Abram Ranovic and Sergei Kovalev and others. And several of them were actual leaders in their in atheist movements. Um, also Yosef Krivlev. Um, but the younger generation is not. They're not radical atheists like that. Um, so it starts like a, a bit of a fight going on between these between a lot of these younger scholars who start thinking that Jesus did exist actually and it eventually comes to a head the Dead Sea Scrolls actually become a particular point for a number of scholars to change their minds on Jesus's historicity even though they don't mention Jesus they contextualize the New Testament enough that they were like no these just make sense to be reflecting a historical climate so scholars like Alexander Kostan switched their mind. And then in the 1960s, the uh, a, a leading journal of religion, Nauka, uh, Nauka Il Religia, I think it was called, um, has a, spe a specific, a special issue done um, that is devoted entirely to mythicism. And it's a debate between some pro-mythicists and historicists. And it also carries with it the first editorial in Soviet history that declares outright that the mythicist school of thought is holding back historical research and should be abandoned. Wow. And from that point onward, it's just a downward spiral. The consensus completely collapses on mythicism. Really? Um, you then end up with um, M.M. Kublinov arguing uh, in favor of uh, the in, in favor of Jesus's historicity, and then a lot of them just also end up returning to more mar to more classical Marxist roots. 
Friedrich Engels famously wrote an essay on the origins of Christianity and they go back to it and they're like, you know, it probably just doesn't even matter if Jesus existed or not. It's kind of just irrelevant as a question, ain't it? Who cares? I don't blame him for saying that. Um, so it's like, with, yeah. So mo most academics in the Soviet Union are, are either like, I don't care if he existed or he existed and I still don't care. <laughs> yeah. I, um, actually, I actually really sympathize with that with that point of view because oh, same. whether whether he whether he is a guy or not like there's so much there's so much uh history stemming from this particular time period that it almost is like it, at this point something did happen you know what i mean yeah uh also during this you have um a russian orthodox priest alexander men who wrote, writes a uh, lengthy book on uh, Jesus uh, called, I think it's called The Son of Man. And he originally is not allowed to publish it in the Soviet Union because of censorship, but it gets it gets distributed out and outside of that and then makes its way in there through uh, like typewritten copies. And eventually it just becomes one of the uh, it becomes a very well-known and famous work among public audiences, and it has an entire appendix arguing against mythicism in there. It's a very interesting book. Unfortunately, the appendix, to my knowledge, has never been translated into English. The The rest of the book was, though. So. Um, really, really good book. Highly suggest trying to find a copy. Um, but outside of that, um, then there's also a novel that comes out called The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov. And this novel is an amazing novel. I love I, I love this book. But it is it opens up with a few opening chapters parodying the Christ myth debate. Very specifically, Satan in the guise of a man comes into it comes into the Soviet Union and he's talking with a guy named Berlioz who is a ardent an ardent mythicist. Wow. Um, and he goes through all the points. You know, Jesus is based on Adonis and all these other figures. Uh, Bulgakov definitely knows some of the mythicist arguments. In fact, we are pretty sure he had a copy of Arthur Dreves' book on hand when he wrote the novel. Um, so uh, uh, Berlioz rehearses that. And then Satan is basically like, I could go back in time and show you he existed. And even after this, after showing this, Berlioz is still stubborn. It's just a it's just a parody of just how stubborn and dumb this debate is. I I highly suggest those opening chapters. They're great. We're worth the read, honestly. Um, but this basically spells the end of mythicism in the Soviet Union. Um, by the 1970s, I only know of like two academics still there who are arguing for it. And then by the by the 1980s, the only person around is Yosef Krivlov, and no one really. That had to be a weird works. time. That had to be a weird time to be a scholar in America, and like you're, you know, the consensus is at a certain level. Like we're, we we agree on this, but like we're talking like over in Russia, this is what they think. Imagine. Oh yeah. Well, and um, what? Well, actually, what's interesting is that um, most, because of the Iron Curtain veil, and also because just, and I'm not going to be nice here, but also the fact that most Western European and American scholars are illiterate on anything that happens outside of England, France, Germany, and the United States and Canada. Um, has meant that they don't, uh, they didn't even know what was going on in Russia. They didn't know what was going on in Russia. They had no idea what was going on in China. Yeah. They had no idea what was going on in most any places. Right. So, and this is just a problem. This is just a problem. And it's understandable because uh, Russian is a difficult language for non Slavic uh, speakers to learn. Yeah. Um, and then all, in addition, you know, Chinese is one of the most difficult languages for for English speakers to learn and stuff like that. So it's like, of course, they have 
there, of course, there's a, a major part of this is just linguistic barriers. Oh, I, I have a question. This might be a little off topic, but I wonder if you haven't, if you might sure. know this, because the when the when the Soviet Soviets collapse, yeah, um, we know that the history of the Byzantine Church after Constantinople fell, they sort of moved themselves into Russia, and they sort of like grow there for a while, and then that becomes like the religion of russia for a while then then obviously they they get taken over the bullshit like the, you know the revolution happens now christianity is not the thing anymore but when the when the when the when the when the soviets collapse how do they get back into being orthodox again um well it's just because orthodoxy never went away so it's always been there even during communist yeah, it, 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 they never were effectively able to stamp it out. Oh, that's interesting. And in fact, in a lot of ways, they actually had to try and find ways to work around them. That's what I'm saying. That's, so, that's interesting, though. So how, do, do the, what, what are they doing when academics are teaching that Jesus didn't exist, but yet um, the church is down the street teaching? Well, that... uh, what, I, what I said before is basically that they were having public debates until essentially – um, mythicist academics and others just realized that uh, half the time people just thought the priests were better at the debates, so they just stopped. <laughs> That's interesting. That's so really Alexander Men, uh, who is uh, one of these priests, uh, becomes one of the most notable figures because he imposes himself into this. Oh, wow. Um, eventually, Alexander Men is actually murdered, um, not in the 1990s unfortunately he was killed by some unsolved murder killed by someone with an axe wow um but essentially what ends up happening so in russia it's collapsed uh in the united states and england we actually do and in germany we have a few notable mythicists who pop up we have uh of course george albert wells in the 1970s um, starts with his work, and his work is arguably the next, I would argue that George Albert Wells is probably the next most infamous mythicist uh, in terms of pop popular knowledge. Um, he ends up with a well-publicized debate at the University of Michigan um, with Morton Smith, actually. Um, he also ends up debating a number of other figures. He's on B the BBC at one point, uh, all sorts of things. Morton uh, and then he also he ends up having another little tussle with Morton Smith in an edited volume with R. Joseph Hoffman and Gerald LaRue um, in the in 1988, I want to say. Um, so Wells gets on the scene, starts a big, big tussle. Um, there are several books published in uh, like small books they're not big there are several little booklets and stuff published uh, uh trying to refute his views um and then probably uh the next most infamous mythicist at the same time is john marco allegro who kip davis who's in the chat probably knows a little bit about yeah <laughs> kip please uh a comment if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, John Marco Allegro, for those that don't know, was a Dead Sea Scrolls scholar, um, infamous for some of his ideas about the Copper Scroll, for one, um, and then also infamous because he publishes a specific book called, if I remember correctly, the title, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. Oh, yeah. Where he argues that Jesus big... did not exist. Jesus was a hallucination from mushrooms. Mushroom from a this... mushroom from a mushroom hobgoblin cult. <laughs> yeah, this became a huge Joe Rogan hit, too. Yeah. Um, and of course, also, yeah, why wouldn't it be? Of course, yeah. <laughs> and uh, if I remember correctly, also Art tries to argue that Jesus's name meant sperm that saves or something like that. Wow, I didn't know that. That's this is yeah. There, oh, there is a running theme throughout this, uh, the history of mythicism that um, <laughs> sperm pops up a lot. 
for some reason. So going back, uh, John Marco Allegro's work uh, becomes immediately infamous. His own dissertation advisor speaks out against him for it. Um, contrary to what a lot of people think, John was not removed from his academic positions. He, well, if I'm not mistaken, he was he actually, actually he left right? his positions before the book was published. Because I was going to say he's he was actually a pretty good academic up until this point. Yeah, right? uh, he. Well, not completely. He was actually already being long criticized because he didn't. Oh. Always, he wasn't always careful with how he was citing things. Um, his theories on the Copper Scroll, in particular, were fair, and, really controversial. Um, and I want to say this about the Jesus mushroom thing: when you're pointing to medieval artwork of of mushrooms in a church, or whatever, something that looks like a mushroom in a church somewhere, and like. You have to, at that point, when you make that claim, now you have to show that the artist that did that had the same ideas as you. If you can't do that, then you what are you what are you pointing to? You're pointing to an accident. Someone made it. Someone coincidentally made artwork of Jesus behind a bunch of mushrooms, because this is we're just talking about artwork in a church. This person who's doing this is an artist. They're not a scholar. So how would they know things that the public doesn't know? And then, then, then at that point, then your argument is: is this some hidden thing that only the church knows about, and they're they're keeping the secrets out in plain sight for everybody? That's fucking. That's like some Dan Brown shit right there. So you got to realize when people point to art and say, "Look, this image of Mary looks like the image of ISIS." You have to do more than just point to art. You have to dig into it and say, does this artist know about ISIS? What does this artist think? Who is the artist? How do they get their information? That's like, you, this is that this is like common sense at this point. Yeah. Um, and also, I didn't know this, but apparently Dr. Kip Davis's first ever publication was a book review of John Marco Allegro's biography written by his daughter. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, oh, yeah, well, according to uh, Dr. Cape, uh, one of his colleagues wrote a 110-page article of nothing but corrections <laughs> to his DJ day wow. DJ volume. That's a lot. That's a hundred. Yeah, a um, yeah, it, it's stuff like that. Uh, he, he thought the, the Copper Scroll was a treasure map and went, went on an expedition to find the treasure. Um, like people generally agree that the, that there was a, a little hoard from what I can tell, but that it's gone <laughs> and it's not a treasure map. Um, anyways, um, so we end up, so Allegro's bit comes out and then in Germany, uh, Rudolf Augstein, who is a, who he was a, um, a reporter and a journalist for Der Spiegel um, writes uh, a mythicist book, Jesus, the Son of Man. Um, or And actually, it's fairly well received for the most part. In fact, received well enough. You will not believe this. Um, uh it's I it. yeah um the book in its english translation got a forward it got a forward and an afterward by firstly no less a scholar than david noel friedman he wrote this is so. This is a mythicist book, and David Noel Friedman wrote the afterword for it. What does it say? Uh, he's he doesn't endorse the mythicism, but he does endorse all. It it he thinks the volume's interesting, but he has a lot of criticisms of it, basically. But it's really notable that someone like Friedman actually like picked this up at all yeah and because weird. of that the volume actually gets somewhat well known 
particularly in Germany, where it causes a little bit of a kerfuffle with a lot of different pastors over there. Um, the other, the other, the the other um, addition was to that book was by Gore Vidal. So, who's that again? Yeah, Gore Vidal. About I get that I'm not thinking of. Um, that again? He was essentially a, a public intellectual. Oh. He was openly bisexual. He was openly bisexual. He was well known for criticisms of U.S. politics and stuff like that. Um, I think I know you're about now, yeah, he's a he, he was he back in the day. People knew who he was. <laughs> so it was, it was what does he say? Deal. What does he say about this? He was actually pretty positive to it. Okay, as well. Um, so that volume comes out again. Another little bit of a success. Um, there's not a whole lot more that happens with mythicism, though. Like, there's, of course, secularist movements until the 1980s. And then we get one, Matt, we get the rise of two things. We have the Liberty Bell, which is a far right, racist, white supremacist magazine. Um, started by a member an ex-member of the hitler youth liberty bell of course yeah <laughs> anything with liberty. and it's an american magazine essentially you can guess exactly what it entails and then at the same time is the popular the growth and popularity of american atheist magazine and i bring these two up together because they co-mingle um and this is something I'm writing on with a friend of, with a friend of mine, um, so I don't want to spoil too much of it until we get the publication out. But essentially, Madeline Mur I'll give you a rundown. Madeline Murray O'Hare was a filthy, stinking racist, a horrible person. She was also homophobic. She was a Holocaust denier, for one. Um, she actively promoted all sorts of conspiracy theories about Jewish people all the time. She was quite insistent that atheism was far more important than civil rights. I am not kidding. No, that's crazy. Um, she deliberately tried to dispel and um, distance everyone from the, uh, from um, uh, gay, gay organizations there were a bunch of gay men in american atheists at the time who wanted to have their own branch association of it and she basically said no um she wouldn't allow it and she would say that you can't be jewish if you're an atheist stuff like that um you can't she said you know, ra races don't make any sense because they're all, like you'll see some races say that atheism comes from the jews and then in this person saying you can't be a Jewish and atheist. Like, what, yeah. which, pick which one you guys are going to agree on. Um, Frank uh, uh, Frank Zindler actually um, was would post a whole bunch of stuff like this as well. Um, people will probably know Frank Zindler because he's actually one of the most infamous mythicists alive today, um, and he was the editor and uh, for American Atheist Press. Um, but it gets even worse in that they were also promoting a whole bunch of eugenicist stuff in there as well, including going back to our friend Ernst Haeckel. They, American atheists in the 19, uh, in the American atheist move in the 1980s is just infested with far right rhetoric and, uh, and ideas. And it is a very, it, it's very scary. Um, and you see this specifically with that association with the Liberty Bell, um, because one of the myth, leading mythicists um, in the Liberty Bell is Revilo P. Oliver, who was a classical philologist. He was an actual scholar and academic um, who taught at university, and he was a raving white supremacist. And he was very clearly a member of American Atheist. He cites their uh, member newsletter on a number of occasions in the Liberty Bell. He was getting issues of American Atheist, and he was citing the work of Frank Zindler. <laughs> um, positively, uh, for white supremacist efforts. 
in the Liberty Bell, you also get stuff from another mythicist named Nick, Nicholas Carter, who is also another virulent white supremacist. Um, and it, it just continues on from there. Um, a lot of the mythicism going on in the 1980s and early 1990s and even into the 2000s is by people associated with the far right white supremacist and Nazi movements like Kenneth Humphreys published his book with a neo with a neo-Nazi press. Um, he tries to pass it off as iconoclast press as their leftist wing, but it's published. It was published by Anthony Hancock who was a Holocaust denier and was almost in, and they attempted to indict him into Germany for publish for uh, sneaking Holocaust denial material into there Damn. from, uh, from the stuff I read this guy, like, and um, actually from what I can tell, the first edition of Humphrey's book was not under the label iconoclast press. It was historical review press, which is the same, Nazi publisher press that published all sorts of just propaganda and also published Nicol Nicholas Carter's book as well. So that's what's going on there. Um, Frank Zindler eventually goes on a whole screed in the in the early in the 1990s and the early 2000s arguing that we have to ex expel religion. He's very positive towards the Soviet Union's forced extermination of religion. He thinks that there's a genetic defect that makes people religious because how po how else can you explain why scientists are religious? And then he ultimately argues that we have to event that we, what, what we dream of is to have this atheist utopia for a, ra a quote, rational race of the future. Whoa. This is like full on atheist master race stuff. That's wow. I did not know this. Yeah. This is what's going on in all, in all of this. And then uh, in the late 1990s, you have a whole bunch of books published simultaneously. I think all in the same year you have the Jesus mystery mysteries by Timothy freak and Peter Gandy. You have the Which Christ, the Christ conspiracy, by a char, Acharya S. Doesn't Timothy, have, Freak, doesn't Timothy Freak get in trouble for plagiarism? I'm pretty sure he does. Quite possibly. And yeah. then also, um, you get uh, the Jesus Puzzle by Earl Doherty. All of these, like in the right. same right. in the yeah. span of like a year. Yeah, like I, lo I actually did like Acharya S. I think she was, she oh, was, yeah, heart, she was in the right, her heart was in the right place. She was just doing, just get a little, going a little too, too far. I don't know. Whatever. She was all right. I have a soft spot. Yeah, yeah. I'll say that. Uh, you also actually have a feminist author, Barbara Creed, and she writes some encyclopedias, like uh, for specifically women-centered encyclopedias, and they get published. I think, if I remember correctly, one by Harper Collins, um, and argues that Jesus was a myth in those too. Yeah. Um, so uh, she's a very been a very pro, she was specifically very pro second wave feminist and I think she's still alive but she's got to be. Oh, by the way, Richard Carrier. Uh, here's a quote from Richard Carrier about Timothy Freak's Jesus mysteries. Re author and activist Richard Carrier stated that Jesus mysteries will disease a reader's mind with rampant unsourced falsehoods and completely miseducate. So even Richard That's Carrier. Weird. Even Richard Carrier is saying, nah, Timothy Freak. Nah, uh, yeah, well, that. Carrier said similar things about uh, Murdoch as well. So, yeah, he, hey, yeah, you're right. She did. He, he, he hated anyone that wasn't him. So, <laughs> the mythicist wars. Anyways, yeah, oh, yeah, that, that's another thing is also like one thing, one of my arguments for why I think that mythicists have never been able to form a, co a cohesive unit is because they can never agree with themselves, even on fundamental basics. Yeah. Oh, by the um, way, that, I think it's hilarious how the Jesus mysteries their their cover is that 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 Orpheus. Here, yeah, the, the for the for that forgery. Yeah. So, is it a forgery? I think it was just found late or something, right? Or is it a forgery? Uh, there's a there's a lot of debates. I've tended to side on the on the fake. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so, where are they? but anyways, uh, yeah. move. Yeah. So. Um, another thing to also note, though, uh, during the 1990s, Madeline Murray O'Hare and 
Rob and Robin and uh, Garth go missing. Um, it's all blurry because it's so small. But as yeah. you guys can see, there's Orpheus Bacchus on a cross in anchor. But uh, it's really if it if it does if it is a real thing, it's probably from the fifth century. Yeah. But um, it is fascinating. But yeah, it, I don't know. I just wanted to. I just wanted to show. Yeah, that, that's what Timothy Freak's mind is at. He's just looking for anything. Anything. Like that, he and by the way, um, and Ralph, also another thing that Freak and Gandhi really like is Joseph Campbell. Yeah, and oh, Ralph Ellis cites Timothy Freak in his book, and like that yeah, shows you right. the type of mindset is like you're not doing the work to find out the truth. You're doing the work to look for things to co to coincide with your already pre pre stated hypothesis. So basically, Timothy Freak's basically doing work like this. I think Jesus was a myth. Now I want to go around and find anything I can find to prove that he was to like make this fit. That's like it's like the backwards methodology. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I there's one more thing I forgot to mention. In 1993, we actually get uh our arguably the first major uh mythicist publication in academic academia um since basically um arthur Drouse's time and this is uh jean manias um from uh cre from christianity to gnosis and from gnosis to christianity or something like that um this is published in 1993 and uh contrary to Richard Carrier and everyone else who tries to claim that he was the first peer-reviewed published systematic account of a mythicist Christianity blah blah, blah. no um Jean Jean Mania did this in 1993 and it was published in the Brown Judaic study series hmm. and uh for notes that is an actual university series like this is from Brown. Um, not only that, the book was endorsed by Jacob Newsner. Um, and for those who don't know, he was one of the most well-known scholars of uh, ancient Judaism, and also and also like Talmudic and Midrashic Judaism, in living memory. Um, in fact, I think at one point he was holding the world record for the most publications with his name wow. on them. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, uh, yes, Doc, uh, Dr. Davis, this is, an act, this is an actual university press. Um, uh, the Brown Judaic Study Series, if I remember correctly, at the time was being published by Scholars Press, which was the same place that was publishing the works from um, the Society of Biblical Literature. Yeah. Um, and is now and it was directly associated with Brown University. Um, this that series was and now I believe is published by Brown University directly. Don't quote me on that though. Now what's in what is the what is what's the main um uh, the main theory is that Christianity originated as a Gnostic movement, actually. He argues that Gnosticism is the original form of Christianity. And I'm going to be honest, his theory of the origins of Christianity is probably my favorite from i like it I, i've always been thinking it's that. the I book is, diff, is a difficult read but he argues extensively that jesus didn't exist yeah that he argues for a whole new origin for christianity gives a whole model for it so he did all this before carrier did in a peer-reviewed academic series well this is what Carrier's i'm just not the first this is one of my criticism of carrier and i and this people might think this is like i'm being like too too unreasonable here but like if you got the truth if you have the undeniable facts on your side why not go to get published through oxford princeton why can't yeah. you do it? like why can't carrier go to those publishers and get his book out is there a reason why uh, did well, they blackmail you blacklist you I don't, i'm just saying like when, when litwa or airmen publish their books they go right to them the major leagues oxford and, princeton it, and why, I, why are you going it's to not hard to get it's not it's also not hard to get stuff published and you can have yeah. all sorts of radical views and let and have them get published um i have a, i have documented all sorts of mythicist material published um <clears throat> yeah you, you do it all the time 
That's what I'm saying. Uh, what, well, if, uh, but I, I, I mean, I've also found, a, aside from me, and I do not have any, are, I have no credentials in New Testament matter. literature. It doesn't matter. You're doing I, have, I have a BA in creative writing. <laughs> but, you're doing, but you're doing the work. You're doing the research. Yeah. That's what matters. Uh, it's here, not, that's the if you put in the work and you put in the effort, you can get it published. But um, do you want me to tell you why I think he's not doing it? Because when you say that Philo writes about a Jesus, that uh, angel, that's not going to fly at a real academic press. Sorry, just isn't. Uh, in fairness to Sheffield, also to Sheffield Phoenix Press, from what I have been told down the line is that there were some troubles going on. Behind I, believe the that. I believe it. Um, <clears throat> I don't know the specifics, and I have, I know I and others have attempted to email them about this. We've, anyways, go, but going back, uh, Jean Menia did this first in 1993. And then moving on into the early 2000s, you get, or actually in the 1990s, you also get the Journal of Higher Criticism starting up. And this is, at this point, it's actually act, like associated with an actual academic facility still. <clears throat> the And it's being edited by Robert Price, Daryl Dowdy, and then also has Jacob Neusner and others associated with it as well. Jacob Neusner is actually fairly friendly with a number of mythicists um people don't realize this but he was he seems to have been actually fairly uh at least knew and liked bob price quite a bit um the uh, this it, it continues like this into the 2000s the journal of higher criticism becomes a hotbed for all sorts of stuff um herman datering publishes his own his um dissertation on the Dutch radicals in the early 90s. And then he publishes an English summary in the Journal of Higher Criticism. This is the one that Bob Price is running right now? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yep. by the way, uh, this Journal of Higher Criticism is basically just a mm. blog with a cool name because he's given, yeah. out, he's given out PhDs to Ralph Ellis. You, you, yeah. First of all, journals don't give out PhDs to begin with. That's not a thing. So I just want to crush that real quick journal of high criticism <laughs> um <laughs> sorry to we, our, our price but i'm just being honest and you know i'm right <laughs> you know yeah, i you know i can't say right. much my first my first ever article was published in in look i think that, I, that's, but, that, was time, that was a good time for it though but yeah the, you know, oh, that shit has gone downhill ever since yeah the, so what end up so the journal of higher criticism becomes a hotbed for mythicist stuff um, uh, uh, George Albert Wells publishes in it. Earl Doherty publishes in it. Jay Raskin does. Um, it also becomes a hotbed for republishing older material, again, including from Nazi sympathizers. Of course. Are we are we surprised now after this two hours of that? <laughs> no, it, it, never be surprised by anything that happens in mythicism. It's it's wild. Um, and then also becomes where Richard Carrier starts publishing some of his early material as well. Um, wow. where, where else are you going to go? <laughs> yeah. And so this is basically where the neo-Dutch radical movement starts up. Daryl Dowdy start, uh, and Robert Price and Herman Datering start, up, start this up. And right now to my knowledge robert price is the only academic representative of that yeah movie. they all they all left after price started well daryl dowdy and herman datering both died right but i'm people saying the, the, recently in the last year or two people have been leaving because he's prices is from oh i just did a, i just did an interview with ralph ellis and i liked what he said about trump so i'm gonna give yeah. him a phd now and yeah like, that's so, literally what happened that's literally what happened yeah and so the Journal of Higher Criticism kind of just becomes a niche thing for the most part. Academics don't really... No, no one even thinks about that shit. Yeah, uh, like I'm the only person who cites anything out of there. Probably. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, other hotbed issues then start up because... So, Zeitgeist becomes a thing. There's a whole bunch of fighting that ends up happening with mythicists. Robert Price actually is one of the more, Robert Price is again, one of the more notable mythicists and he actually goes on tons of public debates 
all over yeah. the place. He oh, ends yeah. up in a public tussle with Gregory Boyd and Paul Rhodes Eddie. Bar, um, Bart Airman. Made Bart Airman too. Bart Airman. Um, Carrier but, has been some pretty hot, high level debates too with like uh, William Lane Craig and, you know, Carrier. William Lane Craig is probably his highest profile one. Yeah, for sure. Um, the what gets more interesting is also then you get the historical Jesus five views that's published uh, with uh, James K. Byrle B as editor. And I think also Paul Rhodes Eddie was the other editor um, and Robert Price has an art, has an essay in there and then responses from James DG Dunn, uh, Luke Timothy Johnson and a few others. Um, that volume is fairly interesting, worth a read. Um, the G the Jesus seminar collapses for the most part. And then there is an attempted revival, which is the Jesus project. And it's got Frank Zindler and Robert Price, Herman Datering, and a bunch of others. Basically it becomes a hotbed for mythicists again, which is really strange. And it becomes really publicly notable for that. And then it just fails to take off, and or or the after other one, a single volume, it collapses. It has two pillars holding it up: mythicism and Roman provenance. Yeah, because like that's another thing. He Price gave out a PhD to Valiant and Jacob Berman. <laughs> Jacob Berman laughed at it. Like I don't know why he gave this to me, but he gave it to me. And then yeah, he's just I don't know. I'm like I'm thinking to myself like. If you thought that that was a good idea, like well, you just water down everything that came before that, like I'm sorry, like no offense, but like you know that you know that's when yeah, you do it, you, you literally what you it literally said anything, yeah, it gets worse. Um, so yeah, the Jesus Project collapses, and only one volume co from the conference comes out as a result of that, um, and the volume is not good. The only issue, the only essays in there that I found real like decent and worth reading for from Dennis McDonald, uh, uh, Justin Meggett, and uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> it wasn't good. Um, the uh, also associated with this was Arthur Droge, who is a uh, New Testament or was a New Testament scholar. He's now retired, um, but he also, uh, he he's the one that, in, that published those comparisons between Jesus and Ned Ludd. I just want to say something to Benson. I've told this to about Robert Price, me privately, face to face, about the journal. So he, this is not like, I'm not just being mean behind his back. He knows I think this, that, like straight up. He knows this is not me being, dropping some shit behind his back. He knows I think this, so. Just want to let that let you know that, not I'm not being unfair at all, but yeah, yeah. So um, in the 2000s, there's not a whole lot that's happening with mythicism for the most part. It's not particularly high profile, and the only major rebuttals that are coming uh, it, its way are for the most part from apologists. And this is where the apologetics scene really catches on with mythicism, and it becomes a just a fight dog fight between those two. Um, because apologists saw it as an easy target to try and make their case against atheists. The problem being that myth that mythicists are usually more current on research than apologists are. Um, the apologists are to this day just still um, pretending that the criteria of authenticity are good. <laughs> Sorry, but they're not. They're they've been debunked for a while. There's a lot of volumes out now on why the criteria of authenticity don't actually work very well. But they like the criteria of authenticity because they can very easily abuse them into getting a gospel Jesus back. Um, at the same time, Robert Price uses the criteria of authenticity, specifically dissimilarity, um, and. Uh, a few uh, and a few others to essentially argue that none of the of the gospel content can be ascribed to historical uh, Jesus. So 
it's a, it's a case in point in just how the criteria of authenticity could be used for any purpose. Um, it's just watching how scholars could not agree on a singular way to consistently use them. Um, and mythicism, the mythicist apologetics dichotomy is where you can see the extremes of that. And uh, yeah, and apologists just haven't updated their views since then. They are consistently outdated on scholarship. They don't read anything new. And that's why I'm actually writing an article uh, and I just submitted it, but it's entitled um, How Apologists Failed the Christ Myth Debate. Hmm. Um, and it's very specifically stuff like this. They, they, they are so singularly focused on trying to have a maximally um, faith-based Jesus that gets them everything they want, that there's no way in the public sphere that they can create reasonable arguments against mythicism because they look like fools. If yeah. you are, if you are in a fight between a bit watching a debate between two people, one of whom is using various historical documents to argue that Jesus didn't exist, which is, and I should say this, arguing that a historical person didn't exist is common historical practice it is not some nonsense thing to doubt that jesus existed right this is not it's not absurd we doubt that david exists people doubt david existed moses existed also king arthur people people uh, have these these debates exist throughout yeah. history jesus Arist is just special because christians say he is aristotle wrote that uh orpheus didn't exist he didn't think orpheus, and people were mad at him for that but that was that was in his time that wasn't that was one of the debates did Orpheus exist? Yeah. And so you can't just be dogmatic about that. Um, but apologists are. Yeah. And they try to target mythicism because they think that mythicism is just an easy target and will build, boast their credibility. But when you're stuck between people who are arguing that Jesus didn't exist or, yeah, resurrections happen. And I can prove the resurrection happened. Here's my Bayesian analysis of how of why the resurrection is the most likely a, a scenario for the empty tomb. Um, who are you going to take more seriously? Yeah. Uh, and this is how it goes. And this is, I think, partially why mythicism became has had, rose up in popularity into the 1910s, and then you get. Uh, in 2012, Proving History from Richard Carrier, which is essentially his methodology section. It's a it's a tedious prologue to On the Historicity of Jesus. And then you get On the Historicity of Jesus, and it makes a little bit of a splash. People are all like, oh, the... Here big, he comes, the, the change. Big volume, the, the big volume comes, that's going to change everything. It changes yeah. everything. Yeah, and it's been 10 years now. Um. Actually, the one that was probably the biggest blow up, one of the biggest blow ups of mythicism in history was actually Thomas L. Brody. Uh, Father, Father Brody uh, is a uh, Catholic priest. He was in the Dominican order. Um, and he uh, had apparently come to the conclusion that Jesus never existed in the 1970s. And he did it completely independently of any knowledge of the Christ myth debate. Um, and it was just through literary analysis of the texts. He just didn't think that there was anything historical and that they were just creating these stories through like the Elijah Elisha narrative. Mm -hmm. um, I can't, you know, I don't he, blame people for thinking these things. No, I don't. The, the and, thing and, about me is I just, when I, when I get involved in criticizing it is when he, when people start to, make it seem like everyone knows this this is but they're they're hiding it from us type thing or yeah. scholars scholars are all in on this cabal of 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 keeping jesus historical when the facts show otherwise that's when i get it i don't i don't blame people for thinking jesus didn't exist i think it's i don't you know what i'm saying like i don't, I don't there's a lot to say about that there is yeah and so where i where I come in here is basically Thomas L. Brody's. I don't think Brody's ideas are ludicrous. And actually, I think no. that Brody has one of the more defensible mythicist positions Absolutely. Um, of all of them. Um, but 
uh, he ends up getting tired because he he can't. Essentially, he was told when he made wrote his original manuscripts that no one that no one would ever publish his book if he met kept the section in there talking about Jesus's historicity. Um, and so he just sat on it, and then he published his work elsewhere um, in separate pieces. Uh, so you get like birthing the New Testament and a bunch of other volumes, which are really interesting books. Um, and by the end of things, he's tired because no one seems to have caught on what he was trying to get at. So he writes his memoir um, in 2012, and it's published just after Bart Ehrman's book comes out. And he has a little criticism of Bart Ehrman's book, Did Jesus Exist? Um, and it's a very interesting, and I think a very, and I, I think it's an, a, an amazing volume. Uh, I think, I, I legitimately think people should read his, read that volume. Um, it's Beyond the Quest uh, for the Historical Jesus. Good title, too. Um, more. I like that title. It's, it's adding to the conversation that's been going on for centuries. Yeah. And it, it it's a and it even has a whole section in there specifically on how he reconciles there being no historical Jesus with his Christian faith because he's yeah. still a Christian. Yeah. Um, um, and in fact, Christian mythicists are things that have been, as I know before, with the rational Christianity of Eliza Sharples. Yeah. It's been a thing, like trying to renegotiate Christianity with mythicism has been a thing since the 1800s. Right. Right. Least. Right. And now, I've been. I've, are you there? And, so, and there's another one in oh. the Netherlands like this as well. That's interesting. Um, now I do want to now. This, so, but basically, I know there's a lot more to say about this, but this is like the current. What, what, we, what we're into now is the current psychosis. Yeah. But I, know I didn't you have, cover. I didn't cover the history of China, but the history of China is basically the same thing as the Soviet yeah. Union. It's well, I know you got to put more, and I don't want to make people lose out on their on their super chats, and I don't mean they'll stop you. And no, show. yeah. So just, I just, just want to, I just didn't want to do that because I know you got to leave at four, so we have a half an hour Let's do the super chat. Is that cool? Unless yeah. you want, unless there's anything, last thoughts you want to give. No, us. essentially that's basically where we're at. Mythicism spiked in the UK here not too recently, but it's on a decline again. It pop in popular opinion. Um, it spy. It also had a, a recent little hubbub in Australia. You have the work of Raphael uh, Letaster, which is also not made much of any difference. Um, most of all the academics who supported mythicism ha are dying off or are retired now. Um, like, so at this point, I think we're about to see a, a lull again. Wow. Interesting. This has been a great conversation so far, but I do want to get to these people have been dropping them like pretty, pretty good amount, which should, by the way, everyone, thank you for that. And everyone in the chat, just leave dropping comments. Thank you as well. I've been looking it's been pretty cool, everyone in the chat. So thank you for that. <laughs> Guys, Julius Windex, how you doing? Thank you for the super chat. Who was the first mythicist and when? Uh, as I noted, not sure. Um, they did. It was pretty much standard for apologists and theologians to respond to mythicists, but not say who they're responding to. Yeah. Um, the earliest ones are in the six are as early as the 1620s. Okay. Interesting. Wow. It, um, the the first. There is a hypothesis that one of the earliest ones may have right. been Herbert of Sherbury, oh. who wrote a volume on the, uh, which one of the earliest comparative religion volumes. Um, but this is, again, speculation right now. Either way, we're talking a thousand plus years after Christian. It's a big, yeah. big deal. Anyways, thank you for that super chat. Max the Confessor in the house. Thank you for that super chat. Appreciate it. You mentioned on History Valley the Soviet scholars. Did they publish under Pod Zanaman, Marxima? That was a crazy time. Stalin banned teaching formal logic and non-engineering maths classes. Um, I be I believe so. Actually, yes. Wow, that's interesting. That's yeah. Thank you for that question. A very interesting answer too. I didn't know that. Something to look forward. Something to look into. Thank you. For, thank you for that. Pedro with the super sticker. Oh, here we go again with my with my thing. It's okay. We're getting close to the end anyway, so we can just keep it like this. Uh, thank you for the super sticker, Pedro, and uh, I appreciate everyone in the chat. 
Let's see what else we got. Melody Joy is here. Thank you, Melody. What else do we got? Lots of comments. I'm scrolling through. I'm trying to make sure I don't miss any. Sometimes when I scroll too fast, I miss the super chat, so I try to go slower. Max the Confessor with another one. I think Hegel is a bad philosopher, but if you want a book on making him understandable, I recommend W.T. Stace's Philosophy of Hegel. It's a summary of his encyclopedia, and I understood it when I was 16. Wow. That's fascinating. Any comments on that? Um, you're doing better than me. Oh. I have a minor in philosophy. I don't know. I've tried reading Hegel in German, and I don't know what he's saying. Wow. And my brother tried reading him in Danish, and he doesn't know what he's saying. And my other brother tried it in French, and he doesn't either. So at least from where we can, where we stand, he doesn't make sense in four different languages. So if you found something that makes him make sense, that's amazing. <laughs> oh, by the way, people are wondering when am I going to get a new camera? I actually will be getting one very soon. I've been doing some really smart shopping because I'm paying a lot for it. I'm going, I'm going heavy on this one because hey, after all, this is what I do. Why not? You know, so I'm doing some. I'm not just going to jump and grab one. I'm, I'm, I have it down to two different cameras, but I'm going to talk to someone at a camera store, like one of those like stores that sell cameras. So that's what I'm doing, and it's coming soon. Thank you for that. And I don't know. It probably gets annoying to see that camera shut off every 45 minutes, but then, but yeah, I just want to let you guys know. Atheologica, go and subscribe to Derek. Actually, you know what? Don't. No, he's like, I hate literally everyone on the screen. Don't don't subscribe to Derek. Derek needs a better camera. Yeah, you know what? I have a better, <laughs> I have a better idea. I'm gonna do, do it like no, this. go subscribe to him. Yeah, I'm gonna do it like this. How about you don't subscribe to the channel that I'm about to show on the screen right now? So this channel that I'm that I'm not promoting, don't go subscribe. There's really bad content here. I mean, it's just all lol cows. So just uh yeah, don't do it, guys. And there's he's not from, a thing. To he's from Kentucky. You're gonna get like some kind of venereal disease. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this was a good one. I was watching that. So that there you go, guys. Don't subscribe. We all hate him. Thank you for that. Seriously though, love you, Derek. <laughs> yeah, love you, Derek. Uh, stupid whore energy. I love that name, by the way. Thank you for the two dollars. The feeling is mutual. That 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 was in uh in regards to this. <laughs> thank you for that <laughs> appreciate it chat gpt i don't know derek bennett is kind of hot oh thanks for the super super sticker chat gpt all right sparks are flying in the chat right now i like it i like it gina mcdonald thank you for the super chat do you think jesus was crucified by Pilate? oh god do 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 I make an enemy of myself public enemy of myself now? I don't know. It's up to you. <laughs> I think he was probably crucified in like the early 30s CE. Whether or not Pilate had anything to do with it, I'm going to leave up to the literary theorists. No, that's actually not a bad point. Um, like the earliest the earliest texts from Paul don't say anything about it, and Mark's text is very clearly utilizing Pilate as a literary device so i'm not gonna just I'm not gonna say what if and part of my reason for having skepticism on it is also because i don't think mark's account lines up with how we actually know pilot was as a person the dude was awful he was a tyrant yeah especially when you meet josephus he's not doing he's, he's murdering he's, he's murdering he, lots of people yeah he's he's a, he's a pretty uh, awful person um yeah. And he doesn't really care about respecting Jewish tradition or things like that. So yeah, it's very clearly that there's a lot going on here that's literary. So, oh, and by the way, just, just because I'm inclined, I, I am still somewhat inclined to say yes, but I'm also pretty skeptical of it. Oh, and I just want to say for people who are like, well, what about the tradition that Pilate let the Jews have of letting one prisoner go and killing the other? By the way, that's not a real thing. That's just an attack. No. That's just it's not a real tradition. It's a literary thing. It's, to made, make it's made up so that you can get a guy whose name is Barabbas, son of the father. Yeah, it's <laughs> basically what they're doing is they're uh, they're making Jesus into the Yom Kippur goat. That is, is, is your well, it's sin. literally it's literally Jesus has been abandoned by everyone. Yeah, 
And it goes through a series of ways of how he gets abandoned. He's abandoned by the apostles. He's abandoned by his, by the other followers. Um, like at the yeah. crucifixion, his mother, his family's not there, but there is a different Mary who ha happens to have sons with the same names as his brothers who is there. Yeah. There's no actual evidence of, uh, that tradition ever taking place in any text. No. So that's got to be I have to note that for someone who's like, "But what what do you mean he didn't he didn't follow traditions?" You know, he didn't. He just didn't do it. So there's so, that. That's where I fall. <laughs> yeah. Good answer. And I think my answer to that just real quick is I think he did. I think there I think that's one of the one things about his historical Jesus that we that we most likely happened. Not that we can know. That most likely that, that's my personal I mean, I think, I think he was crucified. Does that count? <laughs> yeah, I think he was crucified. Yeah. And I and I, I actually understand what you're getting at. Like we don't know if Pilate was actually there. But then again, Jerusalem's not that big. And if he was the archon or ruler or, or governor of Jerusalem, then yeah, he might have been there. So I'm well, assuming that Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. That's another thing. Yeah. You never, you don't know. We don't know if that, because they, they can be drawing off of uh, Zechariah's, his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. There you go. There, we don't know if it happened. It might, it might have happened somewhere else. Yeah. Good yeah. point. Actually. Anyways, any thoughts on founding fathers and their views by Samantha Desjardins? I, I take it the views on mythicism here. Um, my thoughts are that at least two, at least one of them's a mythicist. One of them knows of them, and also Abraham Lincoln read Volney as well. Fun fact. Wow. Oh, and I don't know. Sam Anthony might have came late, so I'll just show these off real quick. Thomas Jefferson. The day will come when the mystical generation of Jesus by the supreme being as his father in the womb of a virgin will be classed with the fable of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. That's nah. That sounds like a mythicist right there. Also, Thomas Paine, the Christian religion is a parody on the worship of the sun, in which they put a man called Christ in the place of the sun and pay him adoration. Originally played to the sun. Yeah. So yeah, I just wanted to. They're very Christian. Yeah. <laughs> the founding fathers are all devout Christians. Yeah. This nation course. was founded on Christian values, guys. Yeah, people still These say. Guys People still say that it's hilarious. It's so hilarious. There were a bunch of classical liberal deists. They, yeah, whatever. Anyways, Motorhead won with the twenty dollars super chat. Thank you for that. Really appreciate that. Awesome. Oh, yeah. I can't thank you enough. I don't. know. My words can't express how thankful I am. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Always good to see you here. What else we got? I think we have like two more. Maybe. Let me see. Hopefully, or maybe not. Oh, here we go. Max the Confessor with the 499. Jacob Perman got it. Jacob Perman got a PhD. Dang, I want a PhD for saying stuff online. <laughs> to be fair to Jacob, he was like, huh? What? Why am I getting this? Oh, okay. Like, you know, you can't blame him. It's, but yeah, th that did definitely water down that journal. Like, you can't just be giving out PhDs to random people that you like, that your friends are, you know. But thanks for that super chat. Cindy Lamachia, thank you for the 999. Do you think mythicism is at least has at least some possibility? Yeah. Like anything, any of the any things are uh, things are possible. And I'm willing to actually grant a lot more ground to mythicists than probably most people are. I tend to find that I agree with them on a lot more than I disagree on, with them on um in the long run. Um I don't think the gospels are um preserving any kind of historical traditions particularly i don't think they care to do that like they might be but divorcing those from the myth and fictionalization that's going on i don't think we can do that so i don't think it makes any sense to treat them as reliable historical texts um i don't think that we can very safely use the pauline epistles um like even on those bits where it's very clear that to me that he's talking about historical person, like in Romans one three, um, he's also taking this from scripture. Yeah, I think um, I this is these are not things. It, it is very clear that he's his view of Jesus is not informed on the on a person's life being historic transmitted to his 
um, it, it in like a historical fashion. It's being filtered a, almost exclusively through the cultists. And as a result, I don't think that we can really say much about Jesus. My, my biography of Jesus is like five bullet points long. Um, and that's it. So when it comes down to it, mythicists and I agree on far more. And I think that there is definitely some possibility, even some probability for mythicism on various different aspects. I have to agree. There's there's a lot of possibility, a lot of plausibility of mythicism, of course. I mean, there's when you talk, we're talking about a guy who we don't have a lot of physical evidence for. We don't have a lot of like, you know, he doesn't write anything down. We don't have his brother writing anything down. We don't have like a succession like for like Caesars, like Julius Caesar, then Augustus, then Tiberius. No, the, first, the first record we have of him is about 15 to 20 years after the events take place from a guy who's at best getting it secondhand. Right. And that's what I'm saying. So like, obviously there's room for this to be invented. There is. Um, I just lean towards that. The most likely scenario is that there was a guy. That's simply yeah. it. Like, I'm not saying that this is like a slam dunk. Of course we have his image. We have his photograph. We have a video of him. Like I'm not saying nothing, nothing like that, but I do want to do this. I've been noticing a lot of streamers do the one in the chat thing. So I want to do this real quick. One in the chat, if you think he existed, zero if you don't think he existed. I want to get a feel on, on what people think. What do you guys think? Drop a one in the chat if you think he existed, and a zero if you don't think he existed. Let's see what how people. About, how about a two if you're agnostic? Two if you're agnostic. Great, good idea. Two if you're agnostic. Let's go. There's some ones. Wow. Got some ones off the bat. Some zero. Oh, a big zero. Zero, 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 zero by Cameron Bolte. And uh, some ones. Sandals with the one. Max Confessor with the one. Just a dude with the one. Seven. I don't know what that means, but uh, we'll take it. There's a two. This is an agnostic one right there. Alexander with the one. Paul Schlater with the one. Adam Green with zero. Uh, Sandals with one. Let's see. Vegetative State with a zero. Interesting. My it's with the two. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, I'm I just wanted to get a feel for where everyone's at. Number one, there was a guy by Myth Vision Podcast. Awesome. Awesome. Vina Vina with a two. Thank you, everybody, for contributing to that. I'll just I think it's interesting. I think this is a fun topic. I'm actually debating someone tonight on Oz's channel. So go tonight if you want to see me debate. I'm taking the position that he existed. That my opponent's taking the position they didn't, but it's going to be a nice who's, civil. Who's one. your opponent? Um, it is the eight. Uh, what is the name of the channel again? Uh, Atheists. Hold on one second. I I can't. I don't know why I forgot this for some reason. Um, hold on. I'll get it because I want to make sure I get the name right, and not say it wrong. It is. Oh, for, his name's Damian Harriso, and it's from the channel. What is the channel called? Oh, the Tall Friendly Atheist Dad podcast. Hmm. Yes. So go and go and check out me on Oz's channel. Uh, it's called the Tang Network. In fact, after this is over, I'll put a link in the description for people who watch this later if they catch it like an hour or two from now. But um, yeah, we'll have some time. We'll, we're just gonna have fun and talk about the same thing we're talking about here. But um, yeah. Anything else you want to mention before we go? Um. I don't think so. It's just, mostly, I just, I'm just i going to say I find the history of mythicism infinitely more interesting than I find actually debating mythicism at this point. Um, and I think it's something that a lot of mythicists should really engage with more is their intellect, the intellectual history, where their ideas have come from, where their notions of where all these different notions come from. Like, it's really funny to me how much mythicists today a lot of them disparage and hate all the astro theologist branch yeah it is weird but You're almost right. all mythicists today intellectually inherit their ideas from that branch that's so you're so that, that's, that was the first major one and definitely the one that became the most popular and has had the mo the la most lasting impact um and as a result, like 
I think that it deserves a little bit more respect than the way it's been treat, treated, um, which is notable because this is even the way it was treated outside, uh, outside of the United States and stuff like even the Soviet Union. Yosef Krivlev re- described it as mental gymnastics and stuff like that. And it's just really interesting to me. Um, but no, I think that people should do a lot more history think about the history of this a lot more should write more on it um there also needs to be a lot more interrogation of where their views are coming from because a lot of these people are citing or getting books from people who are um ethically speaking dubious like again a lot of the most popular mythicist work that was being distributed in the 1980s, 90s, and early 2000s was by American atheists and headed by a guy who was pushing a quite, like, literally pushing an atheist master race. Wow, that's crazy. Um, it, it's Frank, uh, Frank Zindler again. Um, by the way, I made a mistake. I made a mistake on my, it's not on Oz's channel. It's on the channel called UDC. Ah. And so that's what I just want to make sure I correct that, correct the record on that. And that's where go just type in UDC and go and subscribe and I'll be there tonight. But yeah, go ahead. Continue. Yeah. So, no, that's what that's basically what I think my research right now is mostly uh, doing a lot of history on mythicism. I'm also now stretching out beyond mythicism. Uh, my current article is on Tacitus and actually more concerned with martyrdom traditions. Um, I also have uh, stuff in the works on why I don't think Paul was martyred historically. I think that's made up uh, by later fi- later martyrdom fictions and uh, going from there. So uh, also don't potentially s- jumping into John the Baptist stuff and also uh, other things that are no doubt going to put me on the fringe category before long. <laughs> Nice, nice. It's an, it's, you know, we all have our things that we believe that are go that go against the grain. Yeah, but it, yeah, every, about, everyone everyone has their fringe pet theory. Yeah, but it's about it's about a no. It's about recognizing that and saying, look, here I'm going to go against the grain. Here, this is what I'm, I'm going to speculate. This is what I think. Instead of being like, I'm right. All the scholars are lying to you. They have an agenda against me. Blah 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 blah. So, I don't know. Um, I just wanted to make sure that there's a big difference between knowing that you have an opinion that's, or not even just opinion, you have a uh, rational, uh, educated be- thoughts or beliefs on a certain topic that go against what the scholarship is saying. There's a difference between that and then being like, they're all a bunch of idiots, they're all a bunch of crypto Christians, and they secretly believe and they're they're hiding the truth from you because they know I'm right. Yeah. That's a big, there's a huge difference between doing that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, s- Interestingly enough, this is basically where mythicists and apologists actually converge a little bit because mythicists have been long doing this exact same thing. Everyone's lying. Everyone's making stuff up. No one can handle my theories. Yes, Richard, we got it. Uh, And then (laughs) others are and then others are and then on the apologist side, you have the exact same kind of rhetoric going on. They're just a whole bunch of secularists trying to destroy the Bible and God's word. They're lying about the evidence. They're just making it up, misconstruing and misinforming everyone, blah, 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 blah. It's the exact same thing. Good point. Um, the, the diff- and this is where I think there is at least some truth to the claim that mythicism has been so closely linked with anti-apologetic and anti-Christian concerns that in a lot of ways the rhetoric converges Absolutely. Which is not to say that mythicism is solely concerned with that. Again, mythicism has a long history. It is this is where we need to really look at a lot of nuance of its history. Um, it's been used as a tool of emancipation in feminist movements. It's been used as a tool of emancipation for Jewish people um, trying to reject claim anti-Semitic claims that they should be held accountable for the death of Christ and stuff. It's been used also. Uh, by Christians. Yeah. And I think that people just need to really look at the history of this and get a little bit more in touch with it. Absolutely. And it's, 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 it's crazy how wide ranging 
of people, of types of people who use these myths as arguments. It's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, you can it goes from Nazis to feminists to Christians themselves. It's all over. It's all it is. Over. It, it is yeah. every. It is a game for everyone. <laughs> Yeah. By the way, I, I just pinned to the top of the chat the debate for tonight. So if you want to go hit the bell and get ready. If you have nothing else going on and you want to just chill out tonight and watch a fun debate, I'll be there. And uh, also, last thing, your Twitter is in the description if they want to follow you. Yeah. So. Follow me on Twitter. I do really fun things like I help out uh, David Falk on his misogyny. Um and also went after Joel Edmund Anderson for a bunch of other dubious stuff that he's done in the past as well. Um, I don't, I, I don't take kindly to these people, these kinds of people very much. <laughs> I hear you. Well, this has been awesome. I knew this was going to be a good show because you, you have, I don't even know how you memorize all these names and dates and time periods. We're, this is like, this is his uh, you get every you get all that in there and then you just forget everything else that's how you do it i i have no space for anything else in this head i don't remember what i ate this morning um <laughs> it's all the, i his, forgot his, my i forgot my birthday this year wow <laughs> i'm not i'm it, it, it's fine every every you actually day. wake up and, <laughs> and, for, and then like did someone else say it to you uh i didn't remember it was my birthday until i saw uh saw some facebook comments saying happy birthday oh my God. <laughs> wow. um so that's where yeah you, you memorize enough uh enough crap uh and you just start forgetting everything else uh what's my social security number couldn't tell you <laughs> yeah well thanks for your time and we'll do this again soon for some for another, for another topic i'm sure we'll think of something good and uh that's for that that being said, you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The demiurge has no power over.